Good afternoon, colleagues. We're just having having a few tech items. Okay, so we are ready to go live. Thank you for joining our July 28th meeting. Um, uh, I would like to have uh, Mr. Persis, would you lead us in our Pledge of Allegiance for today, please? I'd be so happy to do that. Yes, I would. Here we go. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it serves one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Persis, for that. We greatly appreciate it. Um, I would like to welcome my guests at the dais. Uh, first, we want to thank all of you for joining us today uh, virtually. Three of us are here actually at STAC, and the other two of our colleagues are um, at their respective locale due to social distancing. But I have Mr. Carl Persis representing District 4, Mr. Ruben Colon representing District 5, Mr. Ted Doran, our school board attorney, Ms. Erin Lieben, our agency clerk, Ms. Jamie Haynes representing District 1, Ms. Linda Cuthbert, my vice chairman representing District 3, um, our superintendent, Dr. Carmen Bagabin, and I'm Ida Wright, chairman for this year representing District 2. Items for approval on this agenda are items 1.03, 4.02, 13.01, 16.01 through 16.05. We have public participation for items on the consent agenda at 5 p.m. for items of general interest pertaining to public education in Volusia County. A total of 15 minutes will be provided for public comments at that time. Time will be provided for public comments on any action item before a board vote is called on that item. Time will be provided at the end of the meeting for public comments for items of general interest pertaining to public education in Volusia County Schools. For uh, public comments during the virtual meeting, please dial area code 386-734-7190. Again, that number is area code 386-734-7190. The extension is 20236. Again, the extension is 20236. At this time, we uh, normally have district vision statements by board members, so I will open up the floor. Who would like to go first? Um, is there anything you would like to share? Go right ahead, Mr. Colon. I see you looking at me. You can't even see me from there. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, I want to thank everybody for um, reaching out. Um, as you can imagine, we've gotten hundreds of emails every day. And uh, I, I want to thank you for that because, you know, in, in making our decision, we do have to consider any and all perspectives as part of that. And so I want to thank everyone for that. I also want to thank uh, our district staff, Miss um, Wiles and uh, Aria and uh, Jose, who um, participated with uh, getting some information out. Uh, regarding uh, dual enrollment as well as ESC. So I want to thank you all for that. And to our teachers, once again, I realize that uh, although you are on vacation, you have not disconnected one bit. You are as engaged today as you were uh, the last time you were with your students in March. And so uh, I want you to know that um, I see it and, um, and really appreciate it because I know that you're really true care about our children and are looking forward to having them back in the classroom. Other than that, thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Colon. Uh, Ms. Haynes? I just also want to say thank you to everyone that has reached out to us and sent us emails um, to share your thoughts and ideas. I absolutely love every time I receive an email where someone already has come up with some solutions or suggestions and ideas. Those types of emails are very beneficial for us because sometimes you can think of something that we can't think So think of. So I wanna thank everyone for that. I also wanna give a shout out to all of our administrators that have now returned um, to campuses for those that were 11 month employees and are now back. 
I appreciate that you are back and um, starting to prepare your campuses for our students and teachers to return. I also want to a shout out to all of the district staff that has already also returned this week and a lot of them that are out there getting things ready for our students and teachers. So welcome back. Um, we uh, missed you this summer while we have all been here, but we do appreciate having you back. Thank you, Mrs. Wright. <laughs> Thank you. Mrs. Cuthbert? Okay, we'll come. I, I just got back on air. Right, we, we can't we can't really hear you, but we've got to come back to you, Mr. Persis. There. Yes, uh, uh, Chair Wright. Yes, I'll, I'll go ahead. Uh, hey, yeah. Mr. Cologne and Miss Haynes said it said it perfectly. Uh, I just want to say uh, I feel the exact same the exact same way. This, you know, it's always a challenge to get school started after the summer and do everything that you got to do just under normal circumstances. <laughs> this is anything but normal. So yes, uh, my thanks to everyone out there, and uh, we understand that there's a there's a great deal of concern. Uh, from parents and from teachers, as well as from students. Uh, it, it is so complicated and affects so many households in different ways. And just know that we are trying to come up with every way possible, every option that we can absolutely imagine to open up schools in the safest way that we can while still providing uh, a very effective education and engaging education for all of our students. So thank you again, as Ms. Haynes said, for the emails and particularly your suggestions. We love those two. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Persis. Ms. Cuthbert, were you able to reconnect? Um, I know she's having some te technical difficulties because it's storming down in the New Smyrna area. So we will come back to her but again, I, I want to ditto the same sentiments uh, that my colleagues, we have received some great recommendations. Thank you for that and some, some suggestions. Thank all of you for participating yesterday on the leadership kickoff. Um, as I stated yesterday, most of the people there have actually have not had a chance to disconnect. And so we're hoping that once we get over the hump that they will have a wonderful Thanksgiving and a, I mean Thanksgiving and a great Christmas. But I know most of you, like us, have not had an opportunity to disconnect just yet. Ms. Cuthbert, have you been able to rejoin us? She has not. Adrienne is on the phone with her trying to help her out. OK. Um, if we can just take about a five minutes, let's get her back, because I know we got some action items that we need. Uh, and I want to make sure she has an opportunity to vote. So we're going to take a quick five minute break so we can get Mrs. Cuthbert um, re re to rejoin us. Thank you. We had to stop for five minutes.
Okay. All right, I will do that. Thank you. Okay, bye. All right, I'm back. We can hear you. Yay. <laughs> we can oh, hear you. you. Yes, thank you. My <laughs> internet. Were we were trying to get a backup for you, <laughs> yes. which is. Well, I went over, I'm reconnected. So it knocked me off. There was a big clap of thunder and lightning. So I'm, I'm back on, right? So we're, okay, we're, we're on a five minute break to get you back on, so. <laughs> Well, Ad Adrian did a great job. I trekked across the house to see if the Wi-Fi was on. The Wi-Fi was fine. I checked our television. It said it was connected, came back here, and allowed me to get back on. Beautiful. See, before, I was listening to, I guess it was Col uh, Mr. Cologne or Mr. Um, Persis was talking, and all of a sudden they were underwater, and it kicked me off. It sounded and like you were underwater on. as well, so. Yeah, and I... Checked, I went out, came back in, it wouldn't let me in. It kept retry, retry. So it's okay now. It's my mag magnetic personality. <laughs> and humidity. Hum humility. Yes. humidity. Yes, there you go. That's it. <laughs> All right, sorry. That's a thunderstorm for you. Without living out in the boonies, too. <laughs> Okay, y'all can hear me. Um, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Loud, loud and clear. Just double check it. We loud. are so excited. We can hear you. <laughs> I'm so sorry to postpone this meeting. <laughs> Too bad we can't take it off the end of the meeting. <laughs> I know Miss Wright is on her way back. Okay. <sighs> so sorry. Okay, Mrs. Cuthbert, we're glad to see you. Thank you, thank you. So we're, we're back around to you. Is there anything that you would like to provide any comments before we move into our agenda? I just, we have been so busy. Usually July is the time that we can relax, get away from the district, refresh, get our energies, uh, you know, re refocused and replugged. And I have never been so busy as we have this month putting everything together and I just want to say thank you for all of those who have spent hours and hours trying to put so much together to make it look so flawless um, do we have a lot of work still to do and a lot of details to figure out yes we do and it's because we're we're doing this for the very first time so between parents and our community members our school staff a lot of teachers and as what I did hear what um, uh, Mrs. Haynes was saying about how important it is to get feedback from the community, from our teachers as well as parents. And that I think has kept us all together. And, in, and a lot of times when we have difficult times, we grow closer together. I'll never forget the first hurricane I was in a long time, well, long time ago. And we, all the neighbors went outside. I mean, we met neighbors we'd never met before. So I think we're all, we're stronger together. And it's, it's comforting to know that. So, so thanks to all. And thank you for the two day leadership conference. I'm sure that was, that was a good time. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Cuthbert. Moving on to item uh, 1.03, approval of the minutes from the June 24th June 23rd uh, school board session and July 7th, 2020 special virtual session. Um, is there a motion? Motion to approve the minutes as presented. Second. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Purses? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes. Ida Wright, yes. Thank you. Um, moving down to item 2.01, agenda changes. 
Dr. Bagabin, uh, have we have anyone to request any changes to the said agenda? No, Madam Chair, not at this time. Okay. Colleagues, would any of you like to make any changes to the current agenda? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Uh, we have item... Hold on, let me get to it. Uh, which is the strategic plan conversation way at the bottom. And for me, I, this is something that I wanted to be super duper excited about, something that, uh, you know, and so with all the topics that we have ahead, including budgetary conversations and, and just everything that's going on with our district, I truly don't believe that the strategic plan is a conversation uh, that is uh, essential at this time. I believe the uh, time frame was originally set forth uh, because of Dr. Fritz's agreement. And so now that we've extended that time, I think this may be more appropriate a little bit further down the road. Uh, once we get school started, it's my opinion that parents and our community really just wants to know about how we're gonna get back to school. So um, I would like to make a motion that we uh, move this to a later date. I don't know if I'll get support on that, but uh, that is how I feel. So I will put that motion out there. Do you have a, a proposed date, Mr. Colon? Uh, I was thinking in September, I believe uh, we by that time we would have uh, our superintendent here as well, who can also be a part of the conversation. And, I, and, and the other part that was very worrisome to me was that he would not be here to answer the questions that later on we may have. And so I think it's more appropriate than I, I just, I want this to be good news on a good day. And right now with all the budgetary conversation that we're gonna have, the mass conversation, just everything that we've got on our agenda, I don't think this is fitting for this time. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you. You didn't answer my question. So do you oh. have a date? <laughs> so are you looking at the 8th of September or the 22nd of September? Uh, I'm good with either one, whichever one the district feels will be better based on Dr. Fritz's return. I mean, we could okay. do September. I mean, I just want us to focus on getting school open. Right, but but I, I think as we have this conversation, having a proposed date, so right now it's September 8th. Um, um, I'm amicable to that, absolutely. Okay. Um, there's a motion on the floor that we remove our strategic plan from today's agenda and move it to September 8th. Is that appropriate, Mr. Colon? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Second. The motion was properly moved and second by Mr. Persis. Would anyone else like uh, to engage in the conversation? Yes, I would. Um, Go ahead, Mr. Mr. Persis. Yeah, Go ahead. thank you. Uh, and Mr. Colon, you're reading my mind. You're reading my mind. Yeah, I, I just think it's... Uh, <laughs> This agenda, I, I saw that on there and I went, oh no, you know, that it's just don't have the right mindset for that right now. There are so many other things that, uh, that, that people are concerned about. And I'm confident that our school year is, is going to start and there everybody's going to be working as hard as they possibly can. They have so many other things going on. Just, just all the training and everything. So, yeah, if we can push back the uh, the uh, uh, the discussion of the strategic plan, I'm all for it for that. And I'd really leave it up to Dr. Uh, Abalgobin uh, to suggest whatever date. I'm not, uh, uh, Ruben. I don't care if it's September 8 or September or something else or you know. Neither do I. Whatever works for the district Agreed. is good for me. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Haynes. I also want to say that I agree with um, moving it back. I, I appreciate all of the work that has gone into it and all of the individuals that have worked to get it ready to be presented. But I just think at this time, with what we are facing, we need to focus on um, the reopening plans and the options that we have out on the table and bring forth the strategic plan once we're up and going. And I don't have a preference on either the 8th or the 22nd of September. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Cuthbert, you're on mute. You're, you're on mute. Mrs. Cuthbert, you're on mute. Thank you. How's that? 
the I thank was you. On, I was not muted, and then I put myself on mute. That's what happened. <laughs> Technical genius tonight. Um, I would like to know what Dr. Balgaman has to say. Since she has been spearheading this, uh, what is her advice? Dr. Balgaman? So here's what I would say. I know that this was very important to our superintendent. It was one of the first tasks that's been given to him when he joined Volusia County, and it was very important to him, and he spearheaded this project upon inception. Um, we continued with it in his absence, and I will tell you that we are ready for presentation tonight, um, if you care to for us to have that presentation. But ultimately, I believe it's the decision of the board in which direction we would like to take. But either way, if you would like for us to present tonight, Madam Chair and board members, we are ready to do so. Um, a lot of the groundwork initiated when he was here and then, like I said, we've continued with the process in his absence. So we're ready either way. Um, but it's a your pleasure. Yes, okay. Ms. Cuthbert? Um, then that's fine. I did like the idea. Of, it would be nice if he were present. Um, since it's his project, he spearheaded it, um, it would be nice to have him at the tail end. At least he can um, check on it and um, change anything, twist it, make his comments, and then do an overall approval. Uh, since he is the superintendent and runs the school system, um, except when a good woman takes his place. Thank you. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, so it would be nice to have him present when we do present this. So That's thank true. you. Thank you, colleagues. So there's a motion on the floor, and I'm indifferent. I, I, I'm fine with moving it back. I just like to be kind of specific because we do have a date coming that we need to then have uh, conduct our evaluations, and then his evaluation will be discussed in October. So um, I just want to make sure we give ourselves enough time to do what we're supposed to do as well. Okay. And Madam Chair, if it were at the end of September, isn't that when we're supposed to set our budget? We're supposed to pass the budget and vote on it. So it'd probably be probably better at the beginning of September. Right. Right now we have it, uh, Ms. Laclone, the 8th, am I correct? Yeah. For the yes, 8th of September. Time. Yes, okay. Because the 22nd will be busy. Okay. All righty. So um, any other discussion? Okay. If not, we'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Cologne? Uh, yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes. And Ida Wright? Yes. Thank you for that. And so going back to the approval of the agenda, um, I'll entertain a motion to approve the agenda, the agenda with the necessary corrections. Madam Chair, I make a motion we approve the agenda as amended. Second. There, the motion has been properly moved and second. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. And Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes. Ida Wright, yes. Thank you. And we'll come back to um, public participation. Are there any removal of items from the consent agenda? Did anyone contact you, Dr. Bagelman? Colleagues, are there any items on the consent agenda you would like for us to remove from the consent agenda? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, there is an item about, um, which one is it? Which was the one? Uh, Clint, help me here, Clint. You know which one I'm talking about. Are you talking about the devices that I was going to remove from the agenda? I'm not in your head, so I don't know. Okay. But it was it was the one with the um, contract with Cisco for the ERP that I wanted to get some clarification on. The one with uh, goodness, where is it? Clint, help me here, Clint. Are you talking about 9.08? Not yeah, it's the Oracle Renewal. Cherry Oracle Road. Renewal, yes. License Renewal. Um, which which item is that 9.08, Mr. Griffin? 
Yeah, can can Aaron pull it up? No, that one's two ninety eight. It's nine point zero six is the one. I'm sorry. Yes, you're right, Jamie. Okay, point zero six. Okay, nine point zero six. Any other item, colleagues? Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. Yeah, I just would like to pull uh, just to have a little more clarification on. Uh, Leave us item 6.02, there's 6.01, 6.02. It's all about the CARES Act. Okay, so both 01 and 02, Mr. Uh, I, I think I'm, I'm really concerned. I think it's the one, I'm not sure which one it is. It's, it's, it's the one that has uh, the $15,306,000 application attached to it. So 6.02. Zero yeah, point zero two. two. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we have just, six, just for okay. a brief, brief comment. Not a problem. We have item six point zero two, item nine point zero six. Any other item, colleagues? If not, I, I would like to also pull the one item number nine point one zero up, so we can so we can explain to our audience what we're doing as it relates to uh, purchasing the devices for our students as we are moving forward to our one-to-one. -one. So currently, the following three items uh, have been recommended for to pull from our consent agenda for additional discussion. Item 6.02, item 9.06, and item 9.10. Any other items, colleagues? If not, I entertain a motion. Motion to approve consent agenda as amended. Mr. Mr. Colon, Ms. Colon, can you do a motion to just remove those three items and then we'll accept the consent agenda with the motion? Please, motion to remove those three items from the consent agenda. Item 6.02, 9.06, and 9.10. Is there a second? I'll second. second. The motion has been properly moved and second to remove items 6.02, 9.06, and 9.10. Any other discussion? Yes, Madam Chair. Yes. As these come back to us, I would like more of a clarification the, the, the amount of funds and the source it's coming from. For example, um, nine, one of them, it some of them have capital funds and have sent sales tax or blended fund sources. It would be nice to know how much money is coming from each fund. Okay. So we have more clarification. And when we get to item 5.01, we will discuss each of those items individually and then you can we can give instructions at that time. All right, thank you, Madam it's, Chair. You're very welcome. Are we ready to call the, go ahead, Ms. Haynes. The only thing is, um, 6.01 also has an entire technology piece in it because okay. that's technology. So if we're going to talk about technology so that the parents, you know, see what we're doing, um, maybe we should pull, which, you know, Mr. Persis said at the beginning, maybe we should pull 6.01 also. Don't have a problem with that. Do you mind amending your motion, please, Mr. Colon? Uh, it would be my pleasure. So I'd make a motion that we remove items. 6.01, 6.02, 9 and 9.10. From the consent agenda for discussion. And Mr. Persis, I had you second. Uh, does that remain second? Yes, yes. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Ms. Haynes. Thank you. Yeah. Any other items? Any other discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Colon? Yay. Ms. J Ms. Haynes? Yay. Mr. Persis? Yay. Ms. Cuthbert? Yes. And Ida? Yes. Thank you. So now um, I will entertain a motion to accept the consent agenda with the cur uh, items being removed. I make a motion that we accept the new agenda with the items that were removed. Second. 
The motion was properly moved and second. Any other discussion? Uh, Madam Chair, could you repeat those items one last time for me, please? The items that we will be moving for discussion are items 6.01, 6 6.02, 9.06, and 9.10 or 9.10. Okay, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Okay, not a problem. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes. And Ida Wright? Yes. Thank you. And the vote is unanimous. Moving down to items 5.01, discussion and approval of items removed from the consent agenda. So we will start with item 6.01. Uh, the CARE CTE infrastructure grant. And I believe you had a question about that, Ms. Haynes. I just wanted, um, can we? I just wanted um, to talk briefly about that because when you look at the, um, the budget narrative page, which says the CARES Act CTE infrastructure piece, um, we see that we also have technology being purchased with the CARES Act under this. Um, I don't know if Aaron can pull up that document so those at home that are following may be able to see it also. So Aaron, on 6.01, it's the document that says CARES Act CTE infrastructure. It's the third one, yes. And Mr. Griffin, would you like to um, interject or join this conversation, or you, Dr. Bagabin? Madam Chair, I have Dr. Barrio with us tonight. It's okay. CTE and Deb Muller. So I think both of them will be more appropriate. Thank you. Go ahead, Ms. Um, Haynes, with your question. And then we have Dr. Barrio and Ms. Mueller. Well, since there's been a lot of questions out there about, you know, why we're not one-to-one -one or what are we doing to um, become one-to-one -one and everything, I just feel we need to be transparent right now with funding that is being used that has the purchase of um, computers and laptops or iPads in it. And so this was the first piece tonight on the consent agenda that did show that we were putting money towards that piece. And so if maybe... Um, Mr. Griffin or Mr. Berrio could just give a brief, you know, how this fund source allows us to do this and what this equipment's going to be used for. Yeah, and, and thank you. And we also have Ms. Leticia Roman on the call, but I, um, these, um, this equipment is going to be utilized uh, to support uh, CTE courses. Uh, for example, if you look at um, uh, capitalized furniture and equipment, um, object 641, it's laser engravers that are specific for digital design course um, uh, and for student use so that they can apply the, the knowledge that they gain to, to real world situations. And then um, item 510 are hand tools that students can utilize uh, in the food science application, um, uh, culinary arts. Uh, so, so each of these are very specific to, uh, and uh, along with the computers, are very specific to CTE. Uh, with the uh, CTE courses that are that apply, they would be using them um, so that they can utilize the apps and the software that are available um, and needed for those courses. Yes, and I'll go, go ahead. I'd like to jump in a little bit too. So, this specifically. Um, CTE equipment. So we are going to reanalyze when we start to go down the one-to-one -one path um, to where do we need the computers now for all CTE programs or technology? Because if I'm a student and I'm traveling in high school with my own laptop assigned to me by the district now, I may be able to utilize, depending on that CTE course, that device for that class. Some classes need better equipment to facilitate the CTE programs, but we will be looking for the future on what programs will be able to be used by now that one-to-one -one device that the student carries around, or do they still need more powerful desktops 
for example, CAD, some type of gaming, CTE, things like that will not be able to be used with their laptop. And, and a lot of this equipment fits that category on the technology side. I have paid attention to it, but we are gonna get a little bit better granularization on not always for CTE having their own computers because sometimes that high school laptop that they already have can facilitate the program. Thank you. Colleagues, any questions? Any, oh, go ahead, Ms. Haynes. So thank you, Mr. Griffin, um, for explaining that. And I agree with you that I think we need to start looking at, well, if we're going to check out um, a laptop to a student, you know, let's make sure it can have all the capabilities that they need so that we're not having to buy additional um, laptops. So I appreciate the explanation that um, you and Mr. Berrio both provided this evening. I, really, the question was, let's just be transparent so people can see, you know, what when money comes in, what it can and can't be used for and how we are utilizing it. We've had a lot of questions about um, technology right now and where we're at as far as um, not being ready to be one-to-one. -one. So thank you, and thank you, Mrs. Wright. Thank you. Any other comments? Go ahead, Mr. Um, Mr. Mr. Griffith, uh, there's a line item on here where it's looking right at the bottom where it says, uh, wait a second, I gotta get that to move, uh, 77 times $2,000. Is that 77 laptops at $2,000 a piece? I, whoop, you scrolled too high. Yep, I see that. I think it's 2,000 laptops at 77. I'm not real sure what that is. Um, uh, Tisha, Tisha. Hi, this is Deb Muller. Hey, Deb. Could I speak to that quickly? I believe when we're replacing CTE laptops, those uh, computers have specific software as uh, Mr. Barrio, Mr. Griffin had mentioned. So they are uh, much higher end than what we would hand to a student or even use in our day-to-day -day classrooms. Um, and so that's why the cost is much higher on those. They have specialized software installed as well and greater ability to perform based on the programs that are mm -hmm. on them. Um, I also wanted to point out too that if you look on the right hand side, you can see that we're sharing this grant with our uh, our charter schools as well. So all about all but the um, I believe the last two items are related to charter school purchases. They are not our purchases. Thank you. Any other questions, colleagues? Madam Chair, why is this coming out of the CARES Act? Well, I can answer that because we have to provide, uh, charter schools are a part of our funding, so we have to provide them with their needs as well. So they too, based on their FTE and any of you who disagree or, you know, want to chime in, we have to provide them based on their FTE, their dollar amount. And so, uh, Letitia, I'm sure they sure, come up with how much each charter school would receive and that's I'm assuming the charter schools has decided that's how they want to allocate their funds okay so it's their choice how they want to spend that money out of the CARES Act yeah is that correct Miss oh, Miss Roman sorry. I'm here oh. I'm on I'm connected yes they they do have some parameters as well but they do decide how they want to spend those funds Okay. Also, this Thank is you. not our main CARES grant. This is not this is not the, the CARES, the big CARES grant. That's the other one we're going to discuss. There was money, I believe this money was came from the holdback from DOE. And this these are specific grants that they have um, put out for districts that have different purposes. So this is actually a separate grant altogether, but it is under the CARES Act. Okay. Thank you, Madam questions? Chair. You're welcome. Any other questions, colleagues? If not, we uh, we entertain a motion to uh, to accept item 6.01. Madam Chair, I make a motion that we accept consent agenda item 6.01. I second that motion. The motion has been properly uh, 
The motion has been made and properly a second. Any other questions? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes. And Ida Wright? Yes. And the motion is approved unanimously. Moving to item 6.01. Do we need to open that one for you? I mean, 6.02, uh, Mr. Persis, do you want us to open a certain item? Yes, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Yeah, uh, Aaron, if you could open up the the third one there, the the one on the bottom, I think that's it for 6.02. Yeah, keep, keep going down. Uh, or I guess you guys see everything. I just see a little bit. Yes, and if you could, uh, if I could just have Miss Miss Muller and uh, perhaps uh, uh, Mr. Griffith, uh, 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 when when people uh, see those dollar amounts, uh, I guess the first question is: uh, is is this money ad additional money coming into the district, or is this money? to reimburse us for monies that have already been spent? Well, Mr. Persis, this can actually be used back until um, March when the governor declared the emergency um, in the state. And so there are there is the possibility um, that we could have included <clears throat> things that we previously purchased, such as PPE and and other salary expenditures that we incurred during the emergency. Um, but what this is also uh, to sustain us and to help um, us implement necessary things that will help for the recovery of students, to help us get back into classrooms um, and to support them. Um, there also is money in there for private schools and charter schools, and I'd be happy to go through the different items. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Right. Uh, but can we just stick to the first one, uh, uh, Deb, for just a minute? So when it, when it lists all those uh, people there, nurses, clinic attendants, and so forth and so on, um, would, would and I realize the purpose of this money too is to help us open up schools uh, safely. Uh, is there um, is am, am I to infer from that that we're that we're going to be able to hire additional nurses and guidance counselors and school psychologists and so on, or is this just to help pay for the ones that we already have in place? Yes, with the uncertainty. Uh, surrounding the reopening of schools and the um, continued employment of all our staff. Um, and we recognize that nurses and clinic attendants um, are going to be uh, very critical in, um, in the, the health, mental and uh, well, physical well being of students, as well as guidance counselors, social workers, and school psychologists. We also have some Volusia online teachers added here. Um, the initial 13 that we um, advertised for, as well as a registrar, um, an additional guidance counselor for Volusia online, um, and a budget analyst to help administer this grant because it will um, this this grant will be uh, lar really large for just the current staff to manage um, and. So that, that is more to uh, help us support the current positions that we already have. Okay. Well, as well as additional positions. Yeah, okay. Well, well thank you for that. Uh, that, that helps. And then, okay, getting down to the second one there, the site licensing, can you just elaborate on yeah. how that money is gonna be spent? <laughs> Certainly. So, um, some of these are instructional licenses and some are actually to support our one-to-one -one and our all of our online instruction. Um, 
the Zoom is for teachers that uh, need to use that during the ICP. That was one of the things that teachers wanted to have available. Um, yeah. And iReady is uh, our assessment platform, but also um, I believe the additional uh, curriculum that goes with that, which um, will support students um, in their learning loss. And then um, Eduphoria, that is actually to convert our um, our test our test to the Canvas platform, or I'm sorry, I, I believe it's to another platform. Um, and and some somebody in instruction could probably speak more to those. Um, no before is actually a cyber um, a cyber program to help our our. Uh, employees so that so that they can be educated on, on cyber um, criminals as far as in our system and mm -hmm. um, the Splunk and the Wi-Fi and the firewall firewall those all are connected to to infrastructure and um, online safety for all of our employees the achieve 3000 is replacing Eduphoria, and so that's why we have to convert all of our um, our current uh, test, tested, testing platforms to achieve 3000 and learning A to Z is instructional software as well. Sure, and uh, thank you for that. And, and this is all uh, once again to help us uh, uh, open up uh, in, the way this, in the ways that we are uh, in, in the fall. Yes, exactly. And, and to, to support that, the loss of um, learning that occurred during the sure. spring. Well, sure. in the summer. Okay, uh, we could skip that next one, transportation and hot hot spots Wi-Fi. Uh, could you uh, could someone ask explain that? Are we adding Wi-Fi uh, in places where we do not have it? Or ex yeah, I can jump in there and, and yeah, help out. thank you. So I want to go back to a couple of things on on the site licensing as well. Sure. So, sure. so no before is going to be a IT security user awareness program that we're going to roll out because we're all really digital now. Uh, we're going to have laptops going home with students. Teachers have laptops that they're using in ways they never have. We're doing things like this that we haven't ever had before. And No Before is a, a security platform, software platform that we're going to roll minimum out. We're working with professional learning and HR to roll out uh, a set of courses and then you go through this security set of courses and then you have like question and answers at the end of it to prove that you paid attention. And it's a really good user-based uh, sec IT security awareness program. And I think it's super important not to leave something like that behind as we go into this digital age, more and more being pushed by the pandemic. But this is really where we wanna be as a district anyway. So nice. why not do it in an educational way and really empower the users? Yeah, so, that's just great. That's, that's just what, great. Yeah, Can that's you great. talk about the hotspots too? Yep, the hotspots. Um, this is the hotspots that we've bought for for student checkout for some of these areas or for reasons um, that they just don't have internet at their household. So, for example, if they um, they select Volusia Live and they'll be for however many weeks or months doing the Volusia Live program, but they live in maybe a Pearson area that they don't have very many uh, options for internet or what they do is just not gonna cut it. Um, we have a couple of different choices, T-Mobile, Verizon, that we can kind of, depending on where they're at, we can check those out by need and then the student would have that internet access with the hotspot along with possibly checking out a laptop. Good, that, that's, that's awesome. So uh, does, this, does this cost the student um, to get on to the hotspot or? No, these will be paid for by the district. Okay, all right, that's great news. Uh, can you skip over to iPad leasing? Is that part of our uh, what you've been talking about uh, about every four years to 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 replace things? So this I, the iPad leasing is actually. Um, you know, we loaned out all of our iPads that were supplied by Title I. Yes. And they actually lease these um, iPads. Number one, we have to uh, replace and repair any 
um, devices that aren't returned or that are broken um, from our general fund, as well as as we go into this one-to-one, -one, um, if we did not uh, provide all of the devices to all of our schools, if we were letting Title I, for instance, buy the iPads only for Title I schools and we were, as a district out of general fund, were only providing them for non-Title I schools, that would be a supplanting issue. And so by us um, paying this last lease payment, we will, we will um, take over the function of the iPad uh, device program. So Title I will no longer, they will go out of the business of having those iPads and Got everything it. will be supplied by the district. Got it, thank you uh, for that. And then just uh, the last question I had uh, was on the laptops. I think that's the next item. Uh, $2 million, I believe it is. Yeah, so looking at all of the iPad um, iPads that we are going to need um, to secure that, um, we have the $9 million that is in the uh, technology half cent um, every year, but also with uh, the amount of technology that we are going to need to buy, we put some money in the CARES Act so that we could make sure we have enough to, um, to, have, to secure all those laptops with the funding because not only will the, the half cent money be paying for laptops for students, but we also have teacher and other staff laptops and we have other items with, of infrastructure, our E-rate program for infrastructure, all of those are also supported by that nine million and a half cent. So this is supplemental to help us do this next, this fiscal year. And, and this grant does carry over. So um, it, it, if we have money left um, after we, you know, because I'll, obviously most of this is, um, these are estimates, um, we have to bid everything and so on. Plus the private schools and the charter schools, we have to manage what they're um, using their money for. And so we can um, file subsequent budget amendments to repurpose the money if we have leftover funds. You have any other questions, Mr. Persis, just in case one of your colleagues want to jump in? Mr. Persis? Are you on mute? Ms. Haynes, Mr. Cologne, any questions you would like to ask on this item? Actually, yes, she mentioned private schools and charter schools. And so this is a $15 million grant. So my question is, have we had any interest from any of the private schools uh, in the area? If so, who um, to access this funding? Or is there, a, is there a cutoff date? What's that looking like? Yes, these, um, and, and Ms. Roman could talk to you more about the privates and charters, but basically, uh, based on their FTE uh, to the district total FTE, we have to uh, offer them the funding. And so we have to individually contact all of the private schools and advise them and work with them, as well as the charter schools. And so this is a combination of all of those schools that are eligible that said that they would like um, to participate in the grant. So uh, Ms. Roman, did any of the private schools did they just decide not to? Because I only noticed we have some charter schools here. The yeah, private schools are right above that. I'm sorry? The private schools are right above the line for charters. Okay, let's see. Aaron, maybe if you could scroll, scroll up just a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, no, I'm sorry, down, scroll back. down. <laughs> I'm left-handed. <laughs> I see. So, which school requested the nine hundred thousand? If I, if I may, we we had a total of twenty-eight private schools that opted to join in the CARES ESSA grant process, and their uh, equitable portion equated to nine thousand. 
$981,520. Okay, and so how are we going to, I know that, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know there's a lot of regulation in how uh, anything that's used with federal grants uh, has to be monitored. How are we, how do we intend as a district and the local education authority to monitor these uh, uses in the private and charter schools? Or am I off base? You you are not off base. You're asking a very good question. There is um, the monies are allocated to the private schools and they determine how they want to use the money. But the district maintains control of everything that is purchased. So these are processes that we are going to have to um, implement with conducting internal audits and ensuring that everything that is purchased is being used according to the scope of work that was approved. And we, our department will be doing that. Okay, yeah, it seems like quite the task. Um, can, and, and I don't know if anybody else wants to see, but I'm interested to see which were the private schools that applied and are participating in this. I know we have it as one line item, but it'd be nice to see who, who exactly, at least for transparency. Would you like for us to send that to you, Mr. Colon? We yes, please. A, we have the list. Great, thank you. We have a list. I can get that out to all of the members. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, Ms. Haynes, Ms. Cuthbert? Yes, Madam Chair, thank you very much. Um, I know, I think some of the confusion is when this is put before us on the consent agenda, this is just a cover sheet. And I'm sure there are hundreds of sheets to support this that breaks it all down into details to see how much, um, which school gets how much money and all the interest, uh, interested parties. Like for example, where it says transportation, summer recovery program, I'm sure there's what summer recovery program is that? And is that um, just for Volusia County Schools? I mean, that's still 45,000. So was that the summer program that started July 6th? Yes, that, that was the uh, summer recovery grant that we had at targeted schools. Um, that had a uh, requirement for district support as well. Um, and that was the transportation piece for that program. Okay, thank you very much. So there is a lot of paperwork behind all that that has to be managed, correct? And these are just all the totals. Oh, the totals. Yes, this is just the totals and yeah, every, uh, every line item has multiple, for the most part, multiple contracts um, anything over 50,000 uh, as a contract will still come to the board for approval or already has come. Um, and, you know, we have all of the details and we will account for them. And that's one of the reasons why we included a budget analyst in here so that um, we can make sure that everything is accounted for properly, as you mentioned, uh, the federal guidelines. And especially when, you know, we're working with 28 private schools in the charter schools mm -hmm. that that's a lot of management yes and maybe mr penley can answer this question what kind of responsibility do we have um we oversee all of this we have to write all the paperwork up we have to present it it has to be presented to us it has to be approved um and then it has to be received by us and then just handed over to them and then we have to do an internal audit to make sure it's been done correctly. At what point, what um, legal responsibility do we have or liability do we have for the dispersal of all of this? Because that's that's an awful lot of responsibility that has, and time and um, effort by employees of Volusia County Schools to take care of this for our private and charter school partners. Madam Chair, if I may, um, I think that Ms. Cuthbert's question could be answered by simply uh, that's what the 5% holdback for charter schools and the funding is intended to cover the administrative cost of that. And other than saying that you have to treat those schools equitably as you would any other school, um, I understand the concern, but, but from the legal standpoint, it's, that's what the 5% is there for. 
Now, does that cover the private schools as well, sir? Well, there's not a, a funding component for private schools. So you have to, have to use your uh, proportionate share money uh, for the private schools, but there isn't a necessarily a holdback for that. So no, okay. one wouldn't, wouldn't cover We will also, I'm sorry. We will okay. also be audited um, by our external auditors as well as by um, the auditor general. Next year will be our auditor, um, will be our ex AG audit. And um, this will, these grants will be something that they will be uh, laser focused on, I can assure you. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Otherwise, Mr. Colon brought up my other concerns from before. So thank you. Thank you, Ms. Haynes. Any questions? Yes. Um, Mrs. Muller, I'd like to go back to the top part with the salaries and benefits piece. This is actually not a re reoccurring um, grant. I do realize that you stated that if it's not all expended in the time period right now, that you can roll a proportionate amount forward to then expend. Um, but am I correct that this is not going to be a reoccurring pot of money? That's, that's correct, yes. Okay, so then that's where my concern comes with item number one, salaries and benefits, that we are designating um, basically just a little bit more than half of this grant into the salaries and benefits piece that is not reoccurring. And so I, I just wanna be clear, are we using the money to pay for individuals that we already employ? Or are we adding individuals to our rosters and we're now picking up their salaries? Um, and, and so the answer is both. Um, but I think what, you know, what the concern goes back to is the unknown and to help us um, continue with uh, reopening schools in the three different plans that the board has approved. There is much uncertainty surrounding, um, surrounding what will happen as far as numbers of students um, as well as uh, you know, the loss of revenue possibly from the virtual students. Um, and I do have some more information. I have part of this in my budget presentation to discuss with you as well. Um, but, you know, we've had talks of mid-year cuts. We don't know um, if the legislature, I know that right now they've said they will not reconvene, they don't have plans to reconvene, but we don't know if they will. And I think it was something you know that was brought up at the last board meeting that we want to make our we want to keep our staff um, intact and we have all of these unknowns and that this is um, this will help us and we know that it's a one you know it's one time funding but we don't anticipate that the effects of COVID will go on for more than a year although as I said this grant um, because of the I believe the enormity of it and whether there may be some future reallocations of funds that aren't used that it doesn't expire until I believe um, August of 22. Um, so uh, you're right that it is one-time funding, um, but for now there's so many uncertainties and we are waiting for um, the approval for this grant to come back from, from DOE. But um, you know our, our rationale for this is that these are important staff to continue to make sure we have the ability to fund regardless, regardless of our FEFP funding um, because these are going to be such important positions um, to get our students back on track both physically, mentally, and, and their safe well-being in schools. And I do understand that. I just... Um... So if we are hiring additional nurses and clinic attendants, guidance counselors, social workers, school psychologists, I'm not so much worried about um, the Volusia Online teachers because we have teachers that I'm assuming, you know, will transfer into that. Mm -hmm. And we're hiring an additional registrar and budget analyst. When this 8.7 million that we're setting aside for salaries is gone, 
what are we doing with those individuals? Are we then having to build them into our budget, which means we're then taking, we're robbing Peter to pay Paul then, because at that point they come back into general funds or are the, are the individuals be, that are being hired in these positions? And as I said, minus the teacher piece, because that to me is a transfer piece. Are they being told that this is ultimately really a one year position that because it is grant funded still from the federal government under the CARES Act and that there is no commitment at the end of that year? No, I'm sorry that um, I was not clear on that. These are not new positions except for the ones that I spoke of, which there's a guidance counselor for Volusia Online. There are 13 Volusia Online teachers, um, a registrar, and then the budget analyst for the, to administer the grant. But no, these are other positions that are permanent positions that we fund out of general funds. This would, um, this would just save us money for this year by funding them through the CARES Act and ensure that we have the continuity of these positions. But yes, they would, they, it would just reduce the general fund budget um, for the majority of these positions, the nurses, the clinic attendants, um, and the social workers and school psychologists. Those are not new positions that we're adding. Okay, so let me just re-clarify then because we've had some mixed messages here. So the $8.7 million that we are taking out of this CARES Act, we are looking at just taking current nurses, clinic attendants, guidance counselors, social workers, and school psychologists that were being paid out of general funds and we're moving a proportionate amount of them over to for one year to pay them out of these funds and then they will move back to general funds. But we are using these funds to add 13 Volusia Online teachers and a guidance counselor there, a registrar, and a budget analyst. So let's start with the budget analyst for a moment. So when we add this budget analyst, which is not a position we currently have funded, that individual that takes this position, it will be shared with them that, that, that this is a one-year um, position Yes. Based on funding. Correct? Absolutely. That's how it will be advertised, grant funded. Grant funded for one year. All right. Yeah. Okay. Because I just needed to clarify that because um, what I knew about this was this is not reoccurring funds. And I, I don't want to get us into a position where we hire a lot of people and then when these funds dry up, we're scrambling to figure out how to continue their employment and everything. And I believe in being transparent with people when we're hiring them, that they know that they're on a one year position if it is grant funded. So thank you for that. Yes. Um, all right, looking at the transportation piece, which I know um, previously Mrs. Cuthbert touched on that. Are we actually stating that just for the month of July, the programs that started on July 6th and they are ending this Thursday, that the transportation cost for that was $45,000? Yes, that's the estimate that we were given um, by transportation, which um, includes the, um, which includes fuel, it includes um, the cost per mile for the buses, I believe, as well as the driver, and I'm not sure if they had um, attendance on them as well. I believe it was nine, nine schools. Okay, so my question there is, we've been offering summer programs every summer for the month of July. And we've been transporting large numbers of students. We've been transporting them anywhere, um, from anywhere to 11 to 12 elementary sites. We've also been transporting them to the 10 high school sites every summer. And so, what happened to the money that was originally already set aside or budgeted for for summer programs because summer programs did not happen this year at any of our high school sites and they happened at less elementary sites with a lot less students being transported i don't have um i don't have the uh, actual budget for the normal summer programs in front of me but i'd happy to be happy to review that with you. I know we do get some transportation aid for that. 
Um, I don't know if Mr. Aiken could speak to that. Um, you know, if he has those details, I know that, you know, he's more familiar with the transportation piece than myself, but um, we did, if you remember correctly, one of the things that we did was have a virtual summer school in June, which normally we would not have budgeted. Um, we would not have had the budget for that. So um, that usually comes out of our SAI. And so we use the money um, that we had remaining um, from other programs to pay for the summer school uh, in June. And then we have to budget for next year, either for June or it would be carryover for the next year's summer program. Um, but like I said, I don't have all of the breakdown of those costs, but I'd be happy to um, get those for you and review that with you. Okay, thank you, and I would appreciate that. Moving on to the hot spot um, line item that Mr. Persis um, first drew attention to, and Mr. Griffin stated, for example, that we would be using hot spots out in Pearson. So even as we've been sitting here this evening, which shows that we have a lot of people listening, we've received emails from um, Pearson from people that actually not only work at, in Pearson, but they live in Pearson. And this is one thing that I've been saying all along. They've tried hotspots out there. We have educators that live in that area that have tried hotspots and they've purchased a, diff a variety of different mobile hotspots um, from the different carriers and they don't work in that area. So I wanna be clear tonight. I don't want to, everybody to say, oh look, because we've had a lot of emails about this and so this is not Jamie Haynes saying this, this is actually instructors that live in Pearson that teach at Pearson Elementary or Taylor Middle High. And they will tell you because it is so remote and there are not internet services there, they have all in, at some point in time purchased hotspots and tried to use them. But what it really takes is a very large satellite dish, dish put in your yard, hooked up to your house and then you may still have to work in the closet to get a good connection. And those are the truthful stories that's been told to me. So they're listening. I appreciate that they're listening. They're sending us email, but they're saying, thank you guys, but hotspots don't work. So I, I just wanna be clear on that because um, I don't want us to leave this meeting and everybody say, wait, you bought hotspots. So this should now allow all of our rural areas or remote areas to be able to connect. That's not necessarily the case. And I want to just be clear on that part since teachers are emailing in. Um, Mr. Griffin, you may not know this, but under the technology category where we are placing $2 million there and it just says laptops, do we have any idea of the number of laptops that will be coming out of this grant? For example, are we purchasing a more reasonably priced one um, or is this going to be one of the higher end priced ones that we saw earlier with CTE? Yes. Yes, ma'am. And you're absolutely correct for clarifying that not every location in Pearson will work with hotspots. We definitely treat every case with a case-by-case -case basis to try different ones. Sometimes we get lucky, sometimes there's no hope. So thank you for clarifying that. On the laptops, um, I believe, and, and Deb, correct me if I'm wrong, this money is going to supplement the big order that we will talk about on one of these next consent items for the 5.1 million that we're going to um, procure 33,000 laptops. I believe this is a supplement to help us procure that amount. Deb, am I yes, that, that's correct. Okay, so if I understand correctly, what we're doing is $2 million of this pot of money is going to help offset the purchase, which we are gonna talk about, um, of the 33,000 laptops that you're looking at purchasing. Yes. Okay. So that's why there's not a dollar amount, or I mean an amount of laptops next to that. All right. Um, I appreciate already what Mr. Cologne asked about the private and charter schools. And um, I, along with, I believe my colleagues will look forward to seeing the list of the 28 private schools that um, elected to get part of this funding. So thank you. And Mrs. Wright, at this time, I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Colleagues, any more conversation about 6.02? Go ahead, Mr. Colon. Uh, Mr. Griffith, have we looked at a possible, you know, I, I've said it all along, we need to be prepared for 
uh, the closing of schools, should we have to go that route again? Have we looked at anything like a portable cell tower or maybe getting with Sprint to see what we can do for those communities? I can only think of two, uh, Pearson and Osteen, that uh, are very challenged. And so, oh, Sam Sula, sorry. Where? Oak Hill. And so, I, sorry, I don't know those areas well. And so um, have we looked at maybe even the potential because, you know, the the use of, of that first line item for salary and benefits, yeah, that's great, but it, it's not really what this is intended for, in my opinion, though it will help us buffer a little bit of the losses, which we'll talk about later. However, I would rather us look into if we had to close down, what could Sprint Maybe they'll bring out a truck. I mean, they're not I, usually at NASCAR events. They bring out this big sprint truck out there and, and they provide Wi-Fi for everybody in the world uh, that is there. And so could we look at a possibility of a tower or something like that that we're able to lease should we have to shut down again? Uh, because, I mean, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when at this point. And... Um, just something that we should be ready for and and then you know like you said you can file amendments to this but i think that's something we should have in our back pocket if possible for yeah. those communities so mr clone yes we have i've been talking to a lot of these providers and i'm going to give them a little bit of tough love right here if they're listening um they have been in the business of making money through this pandemic right they are not offering very many programs for um, for for them to better serve the community as much as they are still in the money making business. And what I mean by that is I don't see and I mean I was on an email chat yesterday with Spectrum. I don't see the programs being offered thus far. They may do it the closer we get to school start, but I do not see the programs being offered. Uh, like we had Spectrum offer programs in the spring where they gave 90 days or you know 120 days for free for some of these families that that needed them. But what I can say that we're doing that's in our power is I have made sure that we have parking lot Wi-Fi in all of our middle and high schools. So in in the worst case scenario, and we we also have 30 something buses that have the Wi-Fi in them that you know. I specifically am not a big fan of because you have to man the bus, somebody has to drive the bus, the bus has to be running, so forth and so on. But I think that if worst case scenario, push came to shove and we go down to a lockdown situation, we can offer our parking lots to upload assignments and download assignments because there is Wi-Fi on our school campuses. So I know there's a lot of districts that are facilitating the buses with the Wi-Fi. To me, why wouldn't we just use our own campus network that we already have in place sitting there and, and you can park in the parking lot just like you would have to drive up to a bus. But I am pushing back with these local companies, you know, the Sprints, the Verizons, um, the Spectrums, the AT&Ts, and, and some legal uh, folks, legal firms are actually engaged in those, those same conversations that I've been in. Um, but they are offering service where there is service and for some reason, the, the build out is going to take years and maybe like a Pearson area to be able to build out the spectrum and the AT&T fiber under the ground. Um, but the hot spots, although for the most part, some of these locations, they do not work. We have bought some Verizon hot spots because some Verizon, the, some places, no other hot spot works. We've seen the Verizon hot spot have some very good success. So. You know, it's all going to be a case by case, and if very push comes to shove, we can offer our parking lots for our middle and high schools where we, we are uh, making Wi-Fi available in those outside areas to where the students would have an option in that regard. Couldn't, couldn't we repeat the signal? I mean, I know that's getting fancy, but if you had a whole entire, I mean, and again, this is worst case scenario, but if you had a community, couldn't you get a repeater? So many, maybe businesses would allow us to add a repeater and, and we can, I mean, we don't have to talk about this today, but it's just something I think we should look at. Yeah, you have some 
some guidelines that you got to kind of fall into the FCC guidelines and things like that with signal being past your property. Gotcha. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Go ahead, Ms. Haynes. I apologize. Mr. Griffin, I thank you for getting on there and adding um, additional conversation about those hot spots and about possibly using the parking lots. Um, and I do appreciate that, but then we also have to rely on our students having a way, and in some of our most rural areas, they're quite a distance away from a school to get um, to a parking lot. I also wanted to state uh, that I heard from parents actually in the spring when they were trying to reach out to Spectrum to get the special deal and they were not allowed to have the special deal because at some point in the past they had been a Spectrum customer and then they had ended that due to the financial burden and Spectrum then would not allow them to come back and get the cheaper rate. So, you know, I appreciate you reaching out and talking to those companies, but as you said, they're in the money-making business and they, even though they touted the $9.99 a month, they did not allow every family to have that opportunity if at any point in their past history they had been a customer with them. And so that was a little deceiving, not on our part, but on the part of what they did. And so thank you for um, you know, clarifying that and letting everybody know what's happening out there. And I appreciate the work that you have done to try to make this work for our students and teachers. Okay, thank you. Yeah, any other comments, colleagues? Hearing none, um, if we want to, if we are satisfied with all we've heard, I'll entertain a motion to approve item 6.02. I move we approve item 6.02. Second. The motion has been properly moved and second. Any other discussion? I just want to say, Madam Chair, I want to thank everyone for uh, allowing me to uh, pull the item. I had no idea it was going to generate the amount of conversation, but I'm not surprised because uh, uh, we have great school board members and they are on it. So uh, thank you all very, very much. Thank you. I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon. Yay. Mr. Jamie Haynes. Yay. Mr. Carl Persis. Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert. Yes. Nida Wright. Yay. Thank you, colleagues. We'll move down to item 9.06, renew, renewal of uh, the RFP. Go ahead, Mr. Colon. And so uh, in meetings past, I've always said, I don't want to give Cherry Roads another penny. And uh, I reached out to Mr. Griffith because uh, this was a lot of money. And um, can you explain, uh, Mr. Griffith, exactly what this item is? And also, if you can give us an update of our relationship with Cherry Roads, that would be greatly appreciated. And before we do that, Mr. Colon, uh, can I just interject quickly? Absolutely. Because I really want them to do a presentation because I want to know when we are going live. Is it anything, I, we, we just cannot hear anything different from what we've been told. And so do we really want him to answer this now? or do we want to have a presentation? There's a quick answer to this, I think. Okay. He, so does, do... he does have a quick answer to it, okay. I think, right, Clint? I mean, we spoke. <laughs> <laughs> his answer in his head is really quick, and I know it. Please right. do not okay. disappoint Mr. Go right ahead. Colon, okay? Quick. Okay. <laughs> Pressure's on, Clint. I've got two answers, one quick and one short. I'll use the quick one. So I'll speak first on what this is, right? I want to clear it up for all the board members. And, and the community that's listening. So this is not any new service that we're procuring through Cherry Road. This is simply using Cherry Road as a pass-through to renew our Oracle license. We have to renew that regardless of who it is, right? We, we have the option at a future date to go through Oracle Direct, but with our current contract and the way it sits, that states that we will use Cherry Road to facilitate the yearly renewal license of the Oracle product. So that's all this is at this time. So um, right now we go through Cherry Road to renew that and that's what this line item is on the board agenda. So to talk a little bit about where we are with the project and, and, and the go live, we are currently on track. Um, we, we do have challenges like any project, 
Uh, our project manager, Kamal, is really, really well, doing well. He, he, he's like two people in one. Uh, we cannot be more pleased with him and what the work he's doing. Um, we, we can have a, a board presentation on this at a future board date, and I do uh, really think that's a good idea. Um, I would have already actually done that if we didn't have the pandemic kind of in our lap and all these board meetings kind of being hijacked by that. Um, I, I am due to give you guys an update at the end of this week, actually, like I have every month. Um, but at the board's pleasure, I would be happy to uh, bring him in and we can do a detailed plan of where we're at and, and, and where we're looking to be for the go line. And Madam Chair, the part that he said earlier to me and I, want, I thought was important for everyone to hear, the last time they came before us with certain milestones and holding the payment based on the milestones and how they were reached. And so he shared that we have kept them at their word and we've kept the money from them until they've delivered. And so uh, this is kind of two pronged, you know, and so I wanted to make sure we were clear what this money was for and also that uh, we were right on task. So other than that, I have no other questions on this item. Thank you. And, and colleagues, I normally wait to go last, but I, I can't, I really do need to go at this point. Uh, Mr. Griffin, yes, we will have a presentation because I would like to meet and the board to hear directly from um, our liaison or our consultant who's actually navigating this process. Uh, I like to see the milestones, where we are, where we need to go and to make certain. My thing is I'm like Mr. Colon, you, you can't come to me in December and say we can't go live. That, that just will not sit well with us. Regardless if I'm sitting on the board or not, I would have to come in this audience and scream to the top of my voice <laughs> if that does not happen. But go ahead, Ms. Haynes, I'll turn it over to you. So Mr. Griffin, I do appreciate the explanation, but my question is this, is this a yearly renewal fee that we are faced with every year and is this a locked in price or does the price change? It is a yearly renewal, that is correct. And the price kind of is what it is. Oracle's gonna get most, if not all of this money. And again, Sherry Road is the partner that we have basically procured on a contract. I believe this is year three of year five and we are basically using them. And I think at the time that the decision was made by the district, obviously I'm speculating because it was prior to me, it was probably met because Cherry Road was who we used for this. So it's an all type, you know, wrapped in all type of projects. So the renewals were through them, the work was through them, the support was through them. Oracle is one of those companies like Microsoft to where you can go direct. Um, a lot of companies like Cisco, you cannot, but I, I think that it is worth looking in future years um, to possibly look at going direct, but the money is really getting paid to Oracle regardless of if you go direct or if you go to Cherry Road. This isn't, whatever this spend here isn't all, or the majority isn't going to Cherry Road. Very minimally, if anything, will be going to Cherry Road. It, it mostly is a license to, re, to Oracle to be renewed. And yes, it's every 12 months. Okay, and you said this is year three of the five-year contract, you thought. So we'll be making this amount this year, and then for two more years, we have this same responsibility to pay to Cherry Road for it to then go to Oracle, and then it would be at that time that we could look at changing the way this is working. As the contract states, that is correct, but we could possibly have some conversations before now and when we renew again to see if there's any flexibility in that. Okay, thank you and thank you, Mrs. Wright. Thank you, Ms. Haynes. Uh, Mr. Ms. Per Ms. Persis, Mr. Persis or Ms. Cuthbert? Um, do you mind if I go first? Go ahead. <laughs> I'd just like a request before the end of the year when you give your presentation, um, I'd prob probably later, I would like to know how much this district spends on licenses and services for our computers, whether it's Adobe, Oracle, Focus, um, School City, because I think our public does not understand how different budgets are now than they were five years ago not, let alone 10 years ago, how much of our funding is going right out the door for technology services? And that's, you know, most people think you buy the, 
you know, the computers, but it's the broadband, it's the infrastructure, it's the uh, licensing, it's the, even to log on to a computer, we have to purchase um, what, I don't even know the terminology, a license just to secure logons. So it would be nice to know, I, and I'm sure that's a monumental project, and it's not absolutely emergency or necessary right now, but it certainly would be an interesting figure um, to know how much our district has to spend on technology, not only just equipment, but infrastructure itself and the programs that we have to support. So thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. Mr. Persis? Uh, excellent question, Ms. Uh, Cuthbert. No, I do not have any further questions. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Mr. Colon, are you satisfied? Okay. Uh, any other discussion? If not, uh, entertain a motion to accept, uh, to approve items 9.06. Madam Chair, I make a move. Uh, a motion that we approve 9.06. I second it. The motion has been properly moved by Mrs. Cuthbert, second by Mr. Persis. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Mr. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes. And Ida Wright? Yay. Thank you, and the vote is unanimous. Moving down to 9.10, devices. Uh, I'm gonna turn this over to you, uh, Dr. Bagelman, and then Clint, or the two of you can tag team. Go right ahead. I just, I just wanted to ask a question quickly, Madam Chair and board members. I know you would like a presentation for this. Can you give me almost like a little bit of a time frame so I can get this on the um, as let's an agenda at, item? Uh, let, let's tentatively put it towards the end of the month. Um, let's see what our agenda looked like, but if not, the end of the month in September. Okay, so sometime in September. Maybe yeah. not the 8th, but... The or meeting. the end of, depending on what we have on the agenda for August 25th mm -hmm. agenda. Okay. And so if, if that is too compact, then we'll look at um, the week, at, I mean, the, the last meeting in September. Thank you, ma'am. All right, thank you. All right, the man of the hour, Mr. Griffin. Yes, ma'am. So the district has so many challenges, and I think you know, we're seeing some bigger districts and some other districts that are a little more mature in the device program that Volusia School District is. So they've gave, this has gave them a little bit more flexibility on how they've handled last year's ICP, how they're handling the reopening, and what their future outlook, you know, looks for education in a technology perspective. And, and We've had many conversations that the district does not have technology to, to do some of these things or to go completely remote or to teach online completely virtual for many different reasons. Technology being one, um, you know, training and the ability of teaching is a little bit different in that environment, that being another. Both of those things require the proper technology in the students and, and the teacher's hands. And last, last board meeting we talked a little bit about starting to procure teacher devices to start that. This is the other half of that. This is um, what it is going to take for our district to get to a one-to-one -one program. And you're going to see a 5.1 million dollar price tag is what we're looking at being approved tonight. And what that's going to get us is the 33,000 devices to get to one-to-one -to -one within the next 12 months. So this time next year we should be a one-to-one -one district if this gets approved. So why $5.1 million? And that seems awful cheap for 33,000 devices, right? Yeah. That is. So the way we've done this, so we can afford it to do it in a streamlined lightning speed fashion is we've worked with many partners and we have not chose one yet. I think we're, we still have a committee meeting at the beginning of next week to kind of go over that and, and try to give us the input we need to to choose the right uh, third-party partner to partner with us. What we've done is we've asked for a device as a service spread over four years. It's a program. So basically what that means is there's services tied to this, right? It's not just 5.1 million, we own a device and we're done. We have to do everything ourselves. There's 
many different services wrapped into this and it's a four-year program so what that means is we pay this amount every year for four years for these 33,000 devices what that gives us is a partner in a program and a device in a student's hand so there's many different services wrapped in that and at a future time we can go over that once we actually get the partner that we're going to use because every partner has a little bit different flavor of service and we're kind of weighing out those right now but basically the gist of it is is this will get us to be a one-to-one -one district these devices that we're procurement will be issued to all of secondary students between now and the end of the year which is our power user group which right now if we said go learn remote that would be the students that would be able to do it without a parent basically sitting there with them to be able to do that right I call them the power user group of the K-12 so with all of the inventory that we now have that we've just freed up in the middle and high schools because we just gave them all new inventory we will look to see what is within that four-year age group and that's in really good shape and we will then populate the elementary three through five with those devices making three through five a now one-to-one -one ratio student to device the three through five will be a laptop population as they prepare to go into that middle school grade level where they're going to be the power user group and probably start taking devices home every day like it's a textbook what are we doing through pre-k pre through two that is the tablet power user group that is where we're going to use ipads because the studies the pilots all the other one-to-one -one districts have found that if you give those age group laptops they're not very familiar with them they really don't know how to use them they're not really getting the applications that are meant for their age group used because those are tablet type application so ipads are the industry proven device for those age groups pre-k through two and that's what we're going to do we're going to add to our leasing program that title one is already built off of very great done really well with it we're probably one of the most managed iPad districts probably there is because of that title one program and how skilled those folks are in that program with those title one devices and the iPad devices so that's the outlook that's the vision that's the goal and again it's going to be several months before we even see any of these devices and, and other districts are begging for them for four to six months and still haven't got them so that's why I say this is a 12-month program to get these in, get them in the schools, matriculate the devices down to the elementaries, and by this time next year, before next year, we will be a one-to-one -one district, and that is the vision and plan. I'd be happy to ask any questions. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. Um, I'll open this up. Colleagues who would like to start, any questions? Uh, yes, go right Madam Chair. Go, go right ahead, Mrs. Cuthbert. Uh, thank you very much. Um, we have a group of uh, techs or USAs. What will happen to them as we don't have our own devices anymore and lease more of them? We, they're going to be very busy is what they'll be doing. So uh -huh. they will not be really infiltrating the troubleshooting of the hardware. That will be handled by our partner. But what they're going to have to do, you've got many more users using a device now so they are going to be spending a lot of their time troubleshooting the user issues or the user trouble tickets. They're going to be a very, very busy 15. Most districts that are one-to-one, -one, or even if they're not one-to-one, -one, have one of those USAs per school. We will be looking at that in the future to see how we can more mature that program for support, but mm -hmm. they are going to be busier than they ever have been because now instead of having, you know, 30 or 40 students or, or 100 or 200 devices shared in classrooms you're going to have seven eight hundred of those devices in students hands at one school so they're going to be very busy troubleshooting the daily usage right not fixing the hardware so mm -hmm. their focus is going to shift a little bit and they're still going to be overwhelmed because of the, min the many influx of devices within students hands now is going to multiply many times but they will be very busy and they will be their job will be a little bit different, but it'll be a lot better and more focused. Okay, thank you for that, because um, I'm concerned about their positions. Um, and also, 
if we bring a partner in and they're going to be doing what the USA's have done and they are our employee, correct? We're their employer. Um, hopefully it will be a good partnership and they'll be not have to look be looked after. I just don't want that partner to turn into what ABM has turned into. Do you know what I mean? It's I want to make sure they're efficient and just as good as what our USAs do right now, and they can serve our teachers when they when they have a, dif a difficult position. Um, so I I noticed I was on a campus when some computers were being brought in, uh, returned in June. And I thought it was interesting, uh, the, the person in charge of checking in some of those computers uh, that were ours was trying to locate a PC or maybe it was an iPad, but it was in the canal. So there was a, are there tracking systems? Can we put a track on these computers to see where they are? Because these laptops, and iPads are certainly much more expensive than textbooks, and it's hard to get textbooks back. So is there, how do we keep track of them and they just don't disappear? Great question. So the iPads have the built-in find my, locate my device. So those- Okay, that's what it was, all right. Yeah. So the iPads have that built-in functionality. Unfortunately, laptops, if you wanna buy products that do that, it's built into the hardware and it's very expensive and everywhere I've studied the return on investment with that is not worth the cost. CompuTrace is a big example of that. But we are going to have software, um, we're looking at a few different ones to be able to do something like that but not necessarily track it like a find my device or locate my device like the iPads do. It's all about at the end of the day is it, is it cost effective? Is it, is it a good ROI? And some things would be really great to drive a Cadillac version of something, but if you just need a Honda Accord to get there, it's it's probably a lot more you know fiscal financially responsible to go with the Honda Accord, and 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 that's the balance, right? Um, I'm really hoping as we roll this program out, we we have the students that are going to be taking these home. They're going to be the secondary students, right? That they feel attached and take some ownership in this device being assigned to them and have the pride and ownership. And I believe if we roll it out properly and communicate properly, I've seen that in other districts. I've seen it not rolled out properly in other districts that they don't have that and they have a big, you know, lost rate or, or you know, stolen rate. But if you roll it out and you message it right and you give that proper form to the parents and you really embrace the student ownership of that device and say this is your baby take care of it for 12 you know their whole school year you know this is yours this is like a textbook because if you really look at the textbook lost rate it, it's really not high it's a really low lost rate or damage rate it happens but it's really if it's treated like that I really believe and I've seen that it can work out well you're gonna have loss you're gonna have breakages that's why we have this partner to help us out with that. But I believe if rolled out correctly, the students will be proud of it. They're gonna be excited to have a brand new device. You know, they're gonna be excited to have a device. A lot of these students don't have technology, never have it at the house. They're gonna get that opportunity. And I really think at the age group that they're gonna be taking them home, they will, they'll have some sense of pride and ownership. Okay, in our Volusia Online Learning, our, do our students have to use their own computers? or do we issue them one? Dr. Peterson has a different way she does that. There is some checkout availability for qualified students, and I don't wanna you know, answer incorrectly on how that qualify is, but I am steadily having to give her a lot of devices weekly as, as her enrollment explodes. So she, she does have a way to qualify students to check out devices as well. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate your answers, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're welcome. But just to piggyback on that, Ms. Cuthbert, I, I believe any student um, in the district, regardless if they're Volusia Live, Volusia Online, if they qualify, we have to provide them with the technology. Um, any other questions? Go right ahead, Ms. Haynes. Thank you, Mr. Griffin. So 
I just want to clarify, we're looking at with this $5.1 million, which will be a reoccurring fee for four years, because we're going to go with some type of a company that is going to provide us with not only the technology, but the service. And the plan is, is that like, basically every four years, you need to do a refresh on laptops anyways, because of just the changes in the processing speed and things such as that. So 33,000 will cover six through 12, based on our current enrollment, correct? Correct, giving us a 2% contingency for hot swaps as we repair. Okay, so 2% contingency. What is the number of laptops needed for third through fifth currently, do you know? I do not have that information off the top of my hand. I do have reports, I just don't have them handy now. I can get you that information. Okay, and then do you, which probably means you can't answer this next part about the number of iPads needed for pre-K through second. I believe the number of iPads, I can give you the cost of the number of iPads. If we bought all of them needed for pre-K through two and do not utilize any of the other inventory, and I believe that is a $1.9 million per year price point. And is that, and so I know, is that a $1.9 million to outright own them or that would be the reoccurring for a four year cycle for that? That would be the same as the Title I, the way they procure with their leasing through Apple. Okay, so that's the leasing. And then, and so we're, so quick question. The current Title I iPad inventory is at this point scattered across all of the Title I schools, which could be elementary, middle, or high. Since we're going to be going with the iPads moving down to pre-K through second, are we looking at removing all of the iPads from the middle and high Title I schools to push down to the elementary? Or are we going to continue to leave some iPads on schools for specialized projects or courses that use them and use some of the applications? I believe we're going to look, I would say we'll probably leave some iPads in secondary not to be assigned to students, but as you said, maybe there'll be some programs, there could be some CTE programs, could be a number of things to where they need those devices for labs and we will look and be open to keeping that technology there. Okay, because I just, that had been a question that had been asked earlier as people were starting to hear about this because there are some teachers that you know, may only use like a set of four or five, but they use specific apps on those for project-based learning or things like they're doing. So I just wanted to ask if, you know, what we were looking at, if it was gonna be an all or nothing, or, you know, that yes, they could still be used. Um, to piggyback off of what Mrs. Cuthbert asked earlier, Mrs. Cuthbert, probably what you did see that day when you were out of school is yes, um, iPads like your iPhone have like a find my iPad or find my iPhone. But actually here in Volusia County, we use a system called Jamf. And um, we were fortunate a couple years ago to invest in this. And so every iPad in the district, um, the serial number and the identifying um, asset tag is loaded into the Jamf system. And at any point in time, if a teacher has handed them out during a uh, class period and all of a sudden one is missing, they just have to call in and it's put into what we call lost and stolen mode. And it's a very interesting piece. And I think people need to know about this, especially all the parents and students that are listening. Um, once that iPad is um, placed into lost and stolen mode, it actually locks down a message appears on the home screen and an alarm goes off. And at that point in time, the coordinates for where that iPad is at are sent straight back into the system and we can identify at that moment where the iPad is sitting. We can know what home that it's sitting in or if somebody has tucked it behind a filing cabinet to later um, obtain it, to take it home. So I, um, I've seen it in action. I've actually, um, in my former job role, locked those down and immediately had a parent calling me asking if the police were on the way to their home because the alarm was going off. And so that is a very nice feature. And so for the most part, 
it keeps our iPad safe and secure. I will say at one point we had some stolen prior to having that system, but we loaded the stolen ones into the system when we got it, and we located one in Hawaii that had been sold on um, the open market, um, you know, where somebody had sold it over the internet. So um, we stand a good chance of keeping track of those iPads, and I so kids, those of you that are still out there and you may have an iPad from summer, be sure and turn it in or we'll be locking it down and we will be visiting your home to pick it up. But uh, thank you, Mr. Griffin. And I'd look forward to seeing those numbers of what we're gonna purchase for the other grade levels. Yeah, and I have those numbers. I've got a really good team that's sending me a bunch of stuff. So currently um, third through fifth is 12,845 students. So we, we, we'll have plenty to give to the three through five from, from taking out of secondary. I think um, the goal is to have enough to surplus the old within four years, take the cream of the crop, so to speak, give that to three through five and have a really good contingency for three through five as well. And I also wanna add for all the new devices and we may actually do this to our own too, is we're gonna etch the lid, right? Property of Volusia County Schools, one-to-one -one program, whatever we come up with a verbiage, if lost, call this number. So when those devices, they might not have the tracking, but if they get pawned, they're gonna get, their, the pawn shop will know that it's our device and it, and it really is effective at Orange County to do that etching of the lid because it deters theft. It, it, it lets people know that I'm not gonna be able to sell this device you know, to somebody else. And if it ever did get pawned, the pawn shop knows immediately in the areas to contact us that it's our property. And once that program grows and starts to get known, those those community members know that this is one of our devices. And so um, by any chance did they send you the number of iPads you would need for pre-K through second? You had the dollar amount. I didn't know if they sent yeah, you over the number. Pre-K through second, um, it's 14,000, three through five, uh, 28,000, P through five, so it's about 14,000 and 14,000 probably divided equally. So 28,000 total probably for elementary. And okay. Pretty equally. And so one thing about the etching, um, I agree that that would be a great piece to add to the laptop since they cannot be tracked. Um, I'd like to just, because we used to etch all of the um, iPads and then what we learned is when it was time to cycle them out and sell them to someone, we lost money on them from the etching. So I would encourage you to possibly not etch the iPads now that we have a system where we can locate them. Yeah, not the iPads, the devices, and we have verified that the laptop, they do not decrease the value because how we're procuring them as a device as a service, it's kind of a built-in bundle. I absolutely agree with Apple, it will deface and Apple will probably, you know, nobody wants an etched, you know, iPad. So I, I, I totally agree, Mrs. Mason. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Persis or Mr. Colon, either of you? So uh, the, the only thing I wanna say is that it sounds, Mr. Griffith, like we're gonna need a IT academy as we start to bring all of these devices. And so at either Deltona High or uh, Pine Ridge, we already we already know that Cliff has got mainland on lockdown and he's <laughs> taking care of that side of the world where they have students who serve, um, you know, Cl Cliff's got this down. And so we just need something like that at Pine Ridge or Deltona High. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. I, I agree with you, Mr. Cologne, believe it or not. I do agree. Go ahead, I Ms. Haynes. I want one at Taylor because it's its own unique world up there opportunities what more could we ask for because that's a lot of computers to look after I, I, I agree I, I, I agree colleagues uh, but uh, again I, I think thank you mr. Uh, Griffin um, mr. Griffin at one time was probably receiving a call from me every day we were checking every school every crack everywhere to find out how many devices we actually had on hand um, and in one of the conversations do we have enough to even allow just our high school ninth through 12th. And he said, at this time, we do not, but we will, Miss Wright, really soon. So thank you for working on this um, because this is something 
as, as I stated before, this was a, supposed to be a year long project for 2021. COVID just brought it to life to make us move forward quicker. Um, but now everybody needs them immediately. So it is still delaying us somewhat. But thank you so much for working on that, Mr. Griffin. And I just wanted you to share that with our public so they understood that we, we understand the concerns, um, we, we're listening, but this, unfortunately, we, we just can't get them any quicker. But thank you so much. Um, now I will entertain a motion to approve uh, item 9.01, 9.10. Is there a motion? Motion to approve. Second. The motion was properly moved by Mr. Cologne, second by Mrs. Haynes. Any other discussion? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Now that we have a thorough discussion, I mean, it's very, very thorough discussion on the computers and a lot of the funding is coming from the HAP Senate. I think we need to go to the Oversight Committee and discuss the technology piece. Um, and just so they're aware of what the demands from the district are um, and the being forced because of COVID, I think we need to reconvene and talk to them and discuss what's going on and, and either get their support or explain it. Um, but I think we need to, to do that as well. We need to go see the oversight committee. Okay, and I agree with you. I did meet with the oversight committee as it relates to technology. Um, I'm not sure if everything was discussed in detail, but that is a good recommendation and we will address that during Deb's presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Or not? Okay, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yes. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Ms. Cuthbert? You're frozen, Mrs. Cuthbert. <laughs> she is. You're on mute, Ms. Cuthbert. Yes. Thank you. And I, yes. Uh, yes. Um, uh, no, you're a little frozen, so I, that's oh, okay. You're okay. a little delayed. Can you and hear I write, me now? Yes, I can hear you now. Okay. And Thank I'm not you. Verizon. Okay, thanks. Uh, and the, and the, mo the motion passed unanimously. Um, colleagues, it is 532. We're going to take a 15 minute break, come back and do public participation and then move forward with our agenda. Thank you.
We may have to tell you bring some of those PPE to us. Thank you, colleagues. Are we all back and are we ready to go? All righty. So we will move on. Thank you for the great conversation on our consent agenda items. And so we'll move on to public participation um, of general interest. Mrs. Schultz, do we have anyone for general, uh, just for general co comments? Yes, we do. Our first caller is Miss Christine Patterson. Okay. Good afternoon, Miss Patterson. It, it's still allowing her into the meeting, taking a second. Okay. Sorry. Okay, not a problem. Okay, she should be in. Good afternoon, Miss Peterson. Ms. Peterson? Oh, Ms. Patterson? Push star six, please. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Yes, ma'am. Can you please state your Great. full name? And you have three sure. minutes uh, to present to the board. Okay. My name is Christine Patterson. Um, I'm a parent. I listened to your words at the last board meeting through the perspective of a parent, and I heard how there's like lack of data on family access to tech or devices. There's a survey that will come out. Um, there's not enough school devices to go one-to-one, -one, and I heard how families in the county don't have internet access. I listened to stories of teachers bridging the gaps, going so far to meet in students' driveways. Well, that's appreciated. It's not their responsibility to bridge gaps. If teachers can find solutions, so can we, and I feel like right now we're family, we're failing families. I worry about all families. I worry about what will happen when an already overburdened and underfunded population comes back to campus because we have to. And when we eventually close again, we send them back to a community in need with even more need. With quarantine, sickness, death, trauma, the inevitable closing due to COVID will be worse than our first closing was, and it will be worse for everyone, but particularly for those with less. We need a plan for those families. When you plan for the margins, everyone gets what they need. How was a question that came up last week, and the answer was we can't, and can't never could. This week, the how discussion is continuing, which is better than can't. The discussion today illustrates how much clarity is still needed on safety issues, tech, accessibility, supports, and on staff. There's much ground to cover with very little time. There are more questions than answers, and in order to give families support and protect them, all barriers need to be identified as well as attempts to overcome them documented so we can find alternative solutions before they return. I'm willing to be a partner in education and help find those solutions. The fact is right now, Volusia's plan are giving some parents a false choice. They return because they have to. That isn't a true option for all. If we provide options, those options should be available for everyone. Can't isn't an option. I believe the nature of our conversations need to change. If we must go back, how will we protect our most vulnerable? If we can't answer that question, then we are not ready to return to campus. Last week, I spoke to you all about Volusia Online option needing improvement with instructional design to clarify it was Volusia Live that doesn't use e-learning instructional design or effective remote learning principles. Volusia Live is not an effective learning model. On a positive note, Volusia Online and the communication about this option is the most comforting. Thank you to Mr. Colon, the st staff and principal of VOL for your hard work to provide students who can attend a great experience. I wish all parents had this option. I appreciate the difficult position the state of Florida has put you all in. You have my support in doing the right thing by sending in a waiver to petition the state for online start, flexible options, um, to include resources to help re uh, required <clears throat> to carry out those options. We can't send our children back home to a more disadvantageous position. You have a legal and ethical obligation to edu uh, educate and protect all students. I really appreciate all of you. Um, thank you so much for listening. Thank you. 
Next caller, Mrs. Schultz. Next on the line is Miss Ann Hamilton. Miss Hamilton? You can push Hi, star. My name is Ann Hamilton. Oh, Go right I'm ahead, Miss Hamilton. Go right ahead. Hi. Um, my name is Ann Hamilton. I moved here last year because you guys had one of the best school districts. Um, we specifically chose to move here out of Miami Dade County. Um, I am a mother of four children that are now my youngest is going into kindergarten here. My mom is a teacher in Miami Dade County, and let me tell you, you guys are doing a really good job compared to there. However, there are a lot of concerns. As a survivor, my, I am I am a survivor, and um, it has gotten easier over the years to speak publicly and share my experience. Um, but forgive me, I'm a little emotional still because I think of all the children that are going to be affected by not having a brick and mortar option. If that if it comes to that, like we were in quarantine, that just broke my heart. Um, I'm all for options. It just breaks my heart that there's a lot of children that don't have parents that are going to put their best interests at heart. And I'd like to know what we're going to do as a county to protect these kids. Do we have enough resources? Are there enough truancy? Um, I mean, they're already overloaded, the caseworkers. It just... It really concerns me. I'm. I had I had more prepared to say. I I. I listened to you talk about the opportunities that everyone will have, and the Wi-Fi and and the school district and the bus parking lot. Those are all great options, but these are options for parents that are going to put their children first. We also have kids that don't have that, and and then school is a safe haven for them. I was homeschooled. My stepfather took me out of school because he saw that I spoke with the guidance counselor. I had a meeting to tell them I was being abused at home. That was my safe place. And then he found that letter and took me out of school. I was homeschooled all of my high school years, and not one person from the county or the school district followed up. My abuse got worse when I was at home. And I want to make sure that that doesn't happen. I mean, it's going to happen anyways, but what are we going to do to help? How can we help that not happen? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hamilton. Our next caller is Casey Brown. Good afternoon, Ms. Brown. Push star six. Ms. Brown. Hello, can you hear me? I can. If you could state your complete name, please, ma'am. And you have Casey three Brown. minutes. Thank you. I'm Casey Brown. I live at 455 Dayberry Lakes Boulevard, Daytona Beach, Florida. My children, who are also student athletes, will be in 10th and 12th grade at Seabreeze High School this year. I fully support them report returning to brick and mortar classes, and this is my why. They are in a mix of AP and honors classes as well as hands-on classes such as agriculture, your allied health academy at Seabreeze, and construction. <clears throat> While I understand that the online learning options being presented for this coming year will far exceed what they did in the last quarter of the previous school year, the last quarter was utterly useless for them, and they essentially learned nothing since March 20. Uh, sadly, they will even tell you this. Um, Excuse me, moving on. Um, I have a senior that um, that needs additional SAT or SAT for Bright Future, and the learning loss from Q to Q4 will be difficult to overcome at this point. They need brick and mortar, they need hands-on learning, and they need their sports. They need their friends and teachers that want to be there. Not everyone is afraid, and all teachers, students, and families deserve a choice. Many of us have been working through this entire pandemic, including my own son. Some People are fortunate to work from home, others are not. Many of our high school students work at restaurants, grocery stores, and retail that have been open since Florida has reopened. We all want these people working at grocery stores and restaurants, not to mention our nurses and doctors seeing their patients. My plea to the teachers who don't feel comfortable in the new normal of your career, please find another route. 
we all have a new normal to face and we don't want you there if you don't want to be there. There are many others that do, so please allow them to do so. As far as athletics go, fortunately, their travel programs have been back to action. We have traveled to Georgia, Alabama, and Louisiana for baseball this summer, and my daughter's doing all-star cheer four days a week and club volleyball on the weekend, and yet she can barely condition with her high school volleyball team. Travel sports will continue to fill a gap that schools will push aside. However, it's disappointing that FHSAA or Volusia County seem concerned with the delay in sports. For many student athletes, athletics are their path to the high school degree as well as a college education. This is a priority for many high school students. Ensuring our students are well-educated and well-rounded is at the very heart of many of the global issues we are facing. I plea with our school board to do what you should do, move forward, opening brick and mortar, and give all parents and teachers options. I know many of the voices over the past few meetings have been for elementary and middle school children, but high school is very different and critical to ensuring our students are prepared for the world ahead. Please consider this population, their mixed education needs, their extracurricular activities, and their future. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Next caller. Next, we have Ms. Elizabeth Albert. That's me. Give me a second. I got to reset my clock. Good evening. All right. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, Dr. Balgobin, and members of the audience. So tonight I am going to absolutely take a little bit of a different approach. So uh, I would like to thank you for the conversation that you had about consent agenda item 6.02. As I sat here and listened to that conversation and looked at the items that were posted on the agenda, I was uh, very concerned about what I heard and what I'm seeing here um, forever in the history of Volusia County Schools, we have been told at the bargaining table that we are not allowed to use non-reoccurring non funding sources um, for salaries. Yet I'm seeing that, and there was a discussion about this that I'm very thankful for uh, this evening. Um, so I just am, I'm just so, so very excited, uh, looking forward to the work that we need to do later um, in this year when it comes uh, to the bargaining table, knowing that that is now a shift uh, that we are going to be able to have those discussions about non-reoccurring money going towards salary. So that's great. I do have a question or two, though, about a few things on there that I just want to put out into the atmosphere. That transportation cost of $45,000 for the summer re recovery program, that seems like those uh, costs would have come under the GEARS money. Um, so I'm wondering if the GEARS money was fully utilized or if there's any of that GEARS money left over. Because um, it just seems to me that funds like the GEARS money and the CARES Act, those are um, those that funding is to provide support during COVID um, and not for paying for items that were already in the pipeline, like the conversion from Edgeforia to Canvas or for cybersecurity software. So interesting. And that $45,000 in transportation, we had nine schools that were participating in that summer program. That's $11,250 per week. To, to transport to transport to nine schools that's that's very perplexing to me and finally uh, what I would like to say is that um, still uh, thinking about Volusia Live still hoping that the district will um, find a way to dedicate an individual teacher to providing that teams and zoom instruction in the um, in the classes at absolutely for elementary um, and secondary if we aren't available to dedicate an individual instructor to serving students through Teams and Zoom. The hope is that we can dedicate and set aside a specific uh, uh, class period for that because all you know what we know is that serving um, in two capacities simultaneously doesn't really work well. We know that we are filling gaps from the fourth quarter of the last school year while at the same time being tasked with teaching new content in a new grade level. So please, uh, I encourage you to consider uh, to, to continue to think about Volusia Live as an option and truly offer the parents, students, and educational professionals in Volusia County three clearly defined and separate options as we look towards going back to school in the coming year, of course, uh, when reconvening brick and mortar, when the number of positive cases have been reduced. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next caller. Our last caller is Ms. Jody Henkel. 
Good afternoon, Ms. Hinkle. Can you push star six? And you have three minutes. Ms. Hinkle, push star six. Hello? Hi, Mrs. Hinkle. State your full name and Hi. you have three minutes. Thank you. Um, my name is Jody Hinkle and I live at uh, 809 Carroll Ave in New Smyrna Beach. I applaud the effort of the school board and the community leaders in their diligent effort to create the most effective plan for children to return to a live classroom setting. There is clear evidence of the value of face-to-face -face learning opportunities the importance of refining social skills, and the ability to provide safe space for children of working parents. My concern relates to the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic has not been contained in the United States with efforts based on social distancing, hand hygiene, surface disinfection, and face masks. Today we have access to EPA validated and hospital proven air disinfection equipment that is currently in use in hospital surgical suites and pharmacy compound rooms, where there can be no risk of airborne transmission of infection. Fortunately, with the generous federal funding available to our county school district, we have the ability to add these air disinfection units to the plan and eliminate airborne virus particulates at the disinfection rate of 400 cubic feet per minute. Those who are positive positive for COVID-19 could be asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic and do not know they are sick. It is understood that once COVID-19 is contracted, a person sheds virus particulates for up to five days prior to experiencing symptoms. By adding air disinfection to the current plan, more students can enjoy and benefit from the live classroom setting. It will also address the needs of students with unique health care concerns and special education needs, as well as those with underlying medical conditions. It will also protect the health of teachers, ensuring their ability to continually lead their classrooms and achieve the performance goals that have been established. It will protect the families of these children as they return home each night and ensure their parents can continue to work and help our entire economy recover. It will even protect the cleaning staff who, will, who may be faced with terminally cleaning an infected classroom. I respectfully request the Volusia County School Board consider adding air disinfection equipment to the public and private school systems and would be eager to assist in any way I can. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ms. Hinkle. That ends our public participation at this time. We will move on to item 11.01, .01, superintendent's announcements. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, only one announcement tonight, Madam Chair. Our next regular school board meeting will be August 4th at 10 a.m. in the morning. Um, at that school board meeting, I would like to share that we will have an ABM presentation uh, prepared for the board and the public along with an update of our next steps regarding our reopening plan. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Bagabin. Moving down to items 13.01, administrative appointments. Yes, ma'am. Um, Madam Chair, board, I have nine recommendations for appointments tonight. Um, first, I, I am recommending Dr. Sharon Lavalle as principal, uh, principal of Silver Sand Middle School. She's currently the principal of McKinney's Elementary School. Dr. Lavalli's effective date would be July 29th. Is that it? Yes, ma'am. Oh, okay. Uh, colleagues, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion? Madam Chair. I know yes. that we, um, uh, I guess, uh, approve the appointment of Sharon Lavalley, Dr. Lavalley, to be principal at uh, Silver Sands Middle School. You, thank you. The motion is made by Mrs. Cuthbert. Is there a second? Second. second. And second by uh, Ms. Haynes. 
Any discussion? Go ahead, Mr. Colon. And so uh, I know that uh, she was at uh, Heritage and then went to uh, McGinnis and is now going to Silver Sands. Uh, and uh, all along, you know, she's wanted to be closer to home. And so I am grateful for the time that she drove all the way to McGinnis every day. I know she loves those children and she's going to love the children at Silver Sands uh, just as much. Uh, so I am excited about this move because it is good for her, and uh, and it will be good for, great for that school as well. So, congratulations. Thank you. Any other comments? Hearing none, we'll call for the vote. Mr. Persis, I don't see him. Um, I did well. I did. I did have a comment. Uh, Madam Chair, I didn't know he saw my hand or not. Uh, I, I just want to say uh, how, how happy I am for uh, for Sharon. Uh, she did a great job at Mc, McGinnis Elementary School, and I know she has a lot of mixed mixed feelings about this. But this will be good for her, and it'll be good for Silver Sands too, as Mr. Colon said. So thank you, Madam Chair. And if you're asking me for my vote now, my vote is yes. <laughs> no, I haven't did that yet, but it's coming. Oh, oh, oh okay. I'm, I was trying to get like a little uh, a two for one in there. But, you know. That's okay. Uh, Ms. Cuthbert or Ms. Haynes? No? Okay. If not, we'll call for the vote. Mr. Uh, Ruben Colon? Yay. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Carl Persis? Yay. Linda Cuthbert? Oh, yes. Thank you. And Ida Wright, yay. And welcome to Silver Sands. We look forward to... Uh, I look forward to meeting you. Thank you, Superintendent Bagabin. My second, ma'am, is I'm recommending Mr. Paul Shruska as principal of McKinney's Elementary School. He's currently a principal interim at McKinney's Elementary. Mr. Shruska's effective date would be the same, July 29th. Okay. You've heard the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion? Move I make approval. a motion. Go ahead, Ms. Ms. <laughs> Ms. Haynes. I make the motion for Mr. Paul Streska to be the principal at McGinnis Elementary. And Mr. Persis, are you, did you second? Is that what yes. I heard? Yes, you okay. did. Thank you, second by Mr. Persis. Any conversation, any discussion? Go right ahead, Ms. Haynes. So I've had the um, fortunate experience to um, see Mr. Struska in action from the time he first arrived in Volusia County when he was at Volusia Pines Elementary first as an assistant principal and then he moved on over to Palm Terrace and he even um, did a short stint and helped us out at Blue Lake when one of the other assistant principals was out this past year and then he went on over to Sugar Mill. I um, have always been very impressed with him. I really like his flexibility. I like his hands-on approach. And so I am thrilled to see that um, we are giving him this opportunity to go to McGinnis Elementary and take on that um, school, which I think he will fall in love with because it's a great school with a lot of wonderful students and great parent support. Those parents really value education and I think that um, he will love it there. And um, so I am happy to um, make the motion for him to be the principal at McGinnis. Thank you. Uh, any other comments? Uh, Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I, had, I, I didn't meet uh, uh, Mr. Shresko when he first came into the district, but I did meet him when he was the AP at uh, Palm Terrace. And I was, uh, I was very impressed with him there. He had a lot of energy. Uh, he was engaged with the uh, teachers and he seemed to know all of the students. I uh, kind of lost uh, uh, touch with him when he went over to Blue, Blue Lake, but kind of re-engaged again when he was at Sugar Mill. Uh, I know that they, uh, they appreciated his service at, at Sugar Mill. I think he connects very, very well with the, uh, with the students and their families. So McGinnis L Elementary sounds like a perfect place for you and I know they'll be happy that you're there. Best wishes. Thank you. Any other comments? Hearing none, we'll call for the vote. 
Mr. Ruben Colon. Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes. Yay. Mr. Carl Persis. Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert. Yes, and congratulations. Yes, and Ida Wright. Yes, and uh, he is. He's, he's a great person to work with. Thank you. Moving on, Superintendent uh, Bagelman. Thank you, ma'am. I am recommending uh, Melissa Shula as assistant principal of Ormond Beach Middle School. Ms. Shula is currently a teacher on assignment at Ormond Beach Middle School. Her effective start date would be the same July 29th. Thank you. You've heard a superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. The motion was made by Mr. Carl Persis, seconded by Mr. Ruben Colon. Any discussion? Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Go right ahead. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I am so excited about this. And uh, uh, as you know, I was the uh, principal at Ormond Beach Middle School for seven years. Uh, while I was there, uh, Melissa was uh, teaching there. She was teaching there before I, I came. She was a just outstanding math, mathematics teacher. She uh, taught the uh, eighth grade. She taught algebra. She taught all of the higher level courses. Uh, she was a true inspiration uh, uh, for all of, all of the teachers there uh, but she was a leader in the in the in the math part in the math department uh, she just has all the right stuff and uh, I don't know when it was maybe three or four years in she talked to me a little bit about pursuing a leadership degree uh, uh, of course I was saying yes 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 go for it and uh, so glad that she did uh, she has been let's see after I left o OBMS uh, Matt Krajewski our our dear friend uh, uh, promoted her I believe to a teacher on assignment and from and from there uh, she has held that position and then uh, now Miss uh, Miss Tootin is there and uh, I, I, I just know what a valuable asset uh, she will be, strong curricula, strong, strong uh, uh, dealing with students and, and w with their parents. So uh, I'm, I'm, I know I'm going on and on, but I have known this and I have wanted this for a long, long time and I'm so happy for it. Thank you, Madam Chair. You're very welcome. Anyone, uh, anyone else? Any other comments? Hearing none, we'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay! <laughs> Ms. Linda <laughs> Cuthbert? Yes. <laughs> and Ida Wright, yes. Thank you, and the vote is unanimous. Thank you, colleagues. Superintendent Bagelman? Thank you, ma'am. Um, my fourth for the night. <laughs> I'm recommending Amber McAndrew as assistant principal of Sugar Mill Elementary School. Ms. McAndrew is currently a project manager for SIG4 at Holly Hale K-8 School. Her effective date would be the same, July 29th. Thank you, Superintendent Bagelman. Uh, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. The motion has been properly moved by Mr. Persis, second by Mrs. Haynes. Any other discussion? <clears throat> Yes, Madam Chair, if I may. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, uh, Amber is uh, at Holly Hill School, and uh, since that's one of the schools in my district, I, I do tend to hang out there every uh, once in a while, and I always see her uh, doing all all kinds of things. But um, what I'm always in, in, impressed with is. Uh, when you see those folks who are TOAs or assistant principals, when you see them on the move, you know, when, when you see them just doing three things at the same time, uh, being with students, being with teachers, being with their principal, moving, moving, uh, moving. When I see people moving, working, thinking, uh, those are the kind of people that impress me. And uh, Amber has been uh, one of those kinds of people. Uh, she, I've also, as Mr. Cologne uh, uh, can uh, uh, can attest, 
Uh, Amber's been very involved with the Volusia County Council uh, PTAs, and I have been impressed with the fact that in addition to all of her school duties, that uh, she would uh, take on that, uh, that, that, uh, that additional responsibility in the time that goes, in, that goes into it. So I think these are the kind of people that we're uh, looking for, uh, endless energy and, and just wanna do whatever they can to make their school and this school district better. Thank you. And that's what we're definitely looking forward to. Any other comments, colleagues? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Uh, yes, and congratulations. Yes, <laughs> and I write yes. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, Superintendent Bagabin? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, fifth. I'm recommending Susan Kelleher as assistant principal of ESE at Deltona High. She's currently a teacher on assignment at University High School. Ms. Kelleher's effective date will be the same, July 29th. Thank you, Superintendent Bagabin. You've heard the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion to accept? I, I'd like to make a motion that Susan Kelleher be made the ESE assistant principal at Deltona High. And I will gladly second that. The motion was made by Mrs. Haynes, second by Mr. Colon. Any discussion? Yes, Madam Chair. Go um, right ahead. Thank you. I have had the opportunity to know Susan for many years. Um, and what's really unique about her is she's taught at the different levels. She's worked at the elementary level as well as the secondary level, and she she is a great reading teacher on top of everything else, but what I really like about her is she has a spirit about her of kindness, and she's always willing to learn something new, but she's always there to help someone. And, you know, that's the kind of spirit that we need in our schools is we need someone that is there and they want to help someone else. They want to help them grow and develop, and she's got that kind of spirit. And so I am excited to see that she is going to Deltona High um, as an assistant principal, but I am at the same time heartbroken because I would have liked to have kept her in my district. So um, I'm giving her up, Mr. Colon, but I'd be happy if she comes back at some point in time. So I just had to put you on warning, but she's, she's I mean, she's spent a lot of time in your district, um, but she um, she's a dynamite person. So you've lucked out. But thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you. Any other comments, colleagues? And so I will welcome her to Deltona. Once you arrive at D5, you never go back. So welcome. Thank you. Okay, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon. Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes. Yay. Mr. Carl Persis. Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert. Yay, go Wolves. And Ida Wright, yay. <laughs> Thank you, and the vote is unanimous. <laughs> Superintendent Bagelman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm recommending uh, Greg Iorio as assistant principal of ESC for Deltona Middle School. He is currently a teacher on assignment at Hinson Middle School, and his effective date would be July 29th. Thank you. You heard the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion? So moved. I second. The motion has been properly moved and second. Moved by Mr. Colon, second by Mrs. Cuthbert. Any other discussion? Welcome to Deltona Middle. Best kept secret. <laughs> <laughs> Any other comments, Kelly? <laughs> He's arriving in time to help with help with the construction project. Yeah. We well, need to get him a, we need to get him a helmet. He needs a hard hat. <laughs> a hard hat, sorry. <laughs> I'm sure there are extras there. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure. I am sure. Thank you. So I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon. Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes. Yay. Mr. Carl Persis. Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert. Yes. And Ida Wright. Yay. Thank you so much, colleagues. Superintendent uh, Bagabin. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm recommending next Ms. Chelsea Sinkowski as Assistant Principal of Orange City Elementary. 
Ms. Sipkowski is currently a teacher in assignment at Timbercrest Elementary. Her effective date would be also July 29th. Thank you. Um, you've heard the superintendent's recommendations. Is there a motion? So move that Ms. Chelsea Sipkowski returns to Orange City this time as the assistant principal. Begrudgingly second, but I'm happy for her, but I would get to lose her at Timbercrest. Okay. She's coming home. If you look, she was at Orange City as a teacher for many years and then an she, academic coach. She's going to miss Mr. Tidmarsh. Yes, she is. Everybody would miss Mr. Tidmarsh. <laughs> well, thank you, Kylie. So the motion was made by Ms. Hayes, second by Mr. Colon. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes, and congratulations. And Ida Wright, yay. Thank you, and the vote was unanimous. Thank you, colleagues. Superintendent Bagelman? <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. We're almost there. Um, my eighth recommendation for this evening is Ms. Linda Negro as assistant principal of Discovery Elementary School. Her, uh, she's currently a teacher on assignment at Deltona Middle School. Her effective date would be July 29th. Okay. Colleague, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll second that one. Thank you. Thank you. Motion was made by Mr. Ruben Colon, second by Ms. Linda Cuthbert. Any discussion? It is an honor to keep her in D5. All righty. Mm -hmm. Any other comments, colleagues? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Uh, Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes, and congratulations. And Ida Wright? Yay. Thank you, and the vote is unanimous. Uh, Superintendent Bagelman? Your yes, last appointment. Yes, ma'am, our last. I'm recommending Tammy Haberman as coordinator for ELA. Ms. Haberman is currently the assistant principal at Lang Langstree Charter School in Duval County. Her effective date would be July 29th. Uh, you've heard the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. The motion has been made by Mr. Cologne, second by Mr. Persis. Is there any discussion? Um, I think the charter school's in North Carolina. Um, let me look. She has a, yeah, she has a long history in, in Duval County, but I think the charter school's in North Carolina. Yes, yeah, can I share quickly? She was in North Carolina, you're absolutely right. Currently, assistant principal at Langtree Charter School, yes. Thank you. I just wanted to be on the record. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other discussion? I just want to welcome her to Volusia County. Okay. Yeah. And as a, and as a team player in the, the English department, it's a it's a tough um, section to be in. It it covers everything, everything, uh, reading, writing, even mathematics, grammar. I mean, uh, testing, um, all the Cambridge AP. I mean, I ready all the reading programs, so it's quite a task. So thank you for coming to Volusia County. We will certainly use you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yes. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes, thank you. And, and congratulations. I uh, yes. Thank you, colleagues. Uh, Superintendent Bagelman, is that it? Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll move down to item 14.01, presentation for the tentative Volusia County School Budget 2020-2021. Madam Chair as and board members, as you're all aware, this is the time of the year for our presentation for operating budget for the fiscal year of 2020-2021. Um, I had the opportunity of meeting this very early this morning with Ms. Muller and her team, and I'd like to thank them for all the hard work that went behind the scenes in putting this presentation together and being ready for us tonight. 
So I would ask, I would ask that Ms. Muller join us at this time for the presentation. Yes, uh, good evening, Madam Chair. Uh, I will share my presentation with you. Okay, can everybody see it all right? There, there it is, thank you. Okay, perfect, thank you. Good evening, Madam Chair, board members, and Dr. Balgobin. I appreciate um, that you uh, acknowledge the staff. I know this has been an especially tough year and um, with COVID, of course, with every, as with everyone else, but retirements as well as our ERP. So um, this is the tentative budget and more so than ever, COVID has taught us the importance of adapting to change and being flexible. Tonight, as I present the tentative budget, I want to everyone to remember that this budget will look much different in final form due to the board's ability and desire to adapt to the changes requested by parents and required by the pandemic we are all navigating in addition to the timing of year-end adjustments as we continue to transition to our fully our transition fully to our new ERP system. The uh, tax increase over the rolled back rate, the rolled back rate of 5.717 mills is the property tax levy that will, after the value of new construction is deducted, produce the same amount of revenue as the previous year. The proposed rate of 5.907 mills is 3.33% higher than the rolled back rate. Therefore, this is advertised as an ad valorem tax increase. And the reason uh, why we generate more in fiscal year 21 is because our taxable values have increased um, and generate more revenue. For the millage levy comparison, you can see that uh, we have the required local effort and um, we're showing you several years of that. For fiscal year 20, it was 3.819 and it's for fiscal year 21, as of the second calculation, it's 3.651. Uh, our this is set by the legislature by our prior period funding adjustment. It has to be levied uh, to offset the unrealized required local effort re resulting from tax roll decreases uh, that took place after the certified tax roll. That's 0 0.008 mills. And then we have our discretionary operating millage, which is set by the board, and this is the maximum allowed by law at 0 0.748 mills. Our capital outlay, which funds our capital projects, is 1.5 mills, and we have no debt service millage for a total of 5.907 mills. The property assessor determines the average assessed property value every year. And for fiscal year 21, the property tax calculation based on 5.907 mills, the assessed property value is $159,513. The homestead exemption uh, is $25,000. Subtracting that results in a taxable value of $134,513. The fiscal year 21 millage levy of 5.907 applied would result in a tax due of $794.57. Looking at our budget calendar, on July 1st, the property appraiser certified the tax roll on July 17th, DOE certified the RLE, which is the required local effort tax rate, and released the second FEFP calculation to districts. Uh, July 25th, uh, which was this past Saturday, our trim notice, our truth and millage was published in the local newspaper. And today, of course, is our public hearing and the adoption of tentative millage rates and tentative district budget. The next will be to certify the tentative millage rate uh, by notifying the property appraiser. And then the deadline of August 24th, will the property appraiser will mail out the proposed tax notices 
on September 8th, we will have a public hearing and adoption of final budget. Then September 11th, we submit our district summary budget online and supporting documents to DOE. And then on September 25th, we certify the final millage rate, notify the property appraiser, tax collector, and the Department of Revenue. <clears throat> on September 8th, of course, we will bring back to you the final budget um, and we'll be following all of our other statutory requirements related to the trim. This is a two-year fund comparison of budget to budget. And again, we have different uh, funds that we present for our total budget. Uh, in 2019-20, we had a total budget of $991.4 $990, million dollars presenting tonight for the tentative, we have a total budget of $943.8 million. Uh, just looking quickly through the changes, the general operating budget is increasing by $3 million. Capital projects uh, are decreasing from $327.1 million to 26 And this is mostly because of the $100 million bond last year that and the three schools uh, being currently built or just finished were included in that budget. The debt, the special revenue is 87.2 million to a decrease of 82.3. Debt service 28.9, increasing to 47.8. And again, that is also related, that increase to the $100 million bond for capital projects that we are now repaying debt service for. And then our internal service funds, which are our uh, liability and insurance funds, an increase from 12.4 million to 13.3 million. Looking at the district's su uh, summary budget as compared to the total, um, you can see that the uh, capital project in the green here, that uh, percentage to the total decrease again because of those projects, uh, those school projects that were included in the 1920 uh, budget. And we also have the increase um, in debt service in this blue here from three to 5% as a total overall. And then that shifts the uh, general fund from 54% from to 57%. Um, part of uh, the general fund shift um, is gains in ad valorem revenue um, state sources and transfers from capital projects as well as grants and local. Um, we are also offsetting that by federal revenue and the use of fund balance. Looking at general funds specifically, this is our general operating revenue uh, summary. And as you can see, our federal revenue that was in our fiscal year 20 adopted budget uh, was 3045000 uh, We did not realize all of the grants that were included in that budget um, that came from federal. Those were specifically um, the, the uh, 21st century grants, which we had applied for, which we did not receive for five schools. Um, our tentative fiscal year 21 budget is $1.245 million. You can see in our FEFP revenue, we, uh, our adopted budget was 212 million and we only received 202 million. Um, so we realized the loss there as well as our, our new budget based on the second calc is 215 million. Looking down here to the ad valorem tax line, you can see um, that our budget adopted was 181 million and we collected 182 million and our ad valorem levy for fiscal year 21 is uh, $188,647,938. And moving forward, this is what uh, the FEFP second calculation looks like. This is the number of programs that we uh, receive aid on. So basically we take the FTE number of students times the program weights.
to give us the weighted FTE per student. Our base funding comes from this base student allocation in the DCD, which I will talk about in a little bit. And then we have all of these other different categories of assistance. Um, one thing I did want to point out that this year we have um, the teacher salary, uh, the teacher salary allocation, and um, we also have uh, the elimination of the school recognition and lottery that was vetoed by the governor. Uh, because there were no school grades issued for this past school year, uh, he vetoed that money. So we will not be receiving that. And the teacher salary increase allocation is 10.4 million. This money is shared with charter schools as well. And a comparison that I really want to um, drive home is how Volusia continues to be underfunded as compared to the state average. Um, this is comparing the fourth calculation uh, from 2019-20 to the second calculation for this fiscal year. Um, on our, uh, we have an increase in revenue of $13 million, just over $13 million, uh, which is a 2.85% change. If you look down here at the total statewide, uh, that change was just a little bit less than what we're receiving at 2.83% increase. But when you look over here to our actual FTE, so that's the, num the amount of money per student that Volusia receives. Ours is $7,510.54, which is an increase of $160.16 per student. However, looking at the statewide average, the statewide average is $276.07 more than what Volusia is receiving on the second count. The statewide average is 7,786.61. And we'll talk a little bit about um, the reasons why. So the statewide base student allocation, which uh, as I mentioned, is what drives our base funding. And you can see from 2010-11 where um, the recession was continuing to have an effect and we hit the low point at 2011-12. Um, in 2007-8, this red dotted line was where we were pre-recession at 4,163.47. So we have increased slowly past that line, but if you factor in 24% inflation during that time, we should be at 5,162.70 per student. That is a difference of $843 per student. The base, the BSA increase for next year is only $40 per student. This is the reason why we cannot continue, continue to meet our expenditures when inflation is factored in and we're, and we are having to keep up with all of our uh, uncontrollable costs such as FRS and health insurance and uh, fuel and utilities and, and make salaries a priority for our employees. In addition, of course, we always talk about the DCD, but it truly is uh, something that affects Volusia and affects Volusia the most out of any county in the state. Over uh, the, the years since 2004, when they uh, brought this formula in, Volusia down here on the bottom right has lost $170.7 million, more, like I said, is more than anyone else in the state. Um, one thing that I want to point out, of course, is that some of these uh, benefactors of the DCD, Broward, $564 million have gone to them, as well as uh, Miami-Dade, um, $530 million, Palm Beach, $535 million. And so not only uh, is the legislature stopping there, but they're also go going further this year in uh, continuing to hurt us in the DCD. What I just want to point out quickly is these different, um, these Red Star counties that uh, are seeing a decrease in their DCD for from fiscal year 20 to fiscal year 21. So normally what happens is if your DC, DCD decreases, then uh, you lose some of your money. Um, so what they, the legislature decided to do um, not only to take this $9.9 million from Volusia County um, based on our increasing DCD, 
we actually lost less, but what they did was add some legislation into uh, our funding compression allocation and gave some of that money to those counties with the red stars that had a decrease in DCD and they didn't want them uh, to lose money. So they held them harmless by adding language to the, the uh, statute. So funding compression allocation was put in the FEFP a couple of years ago. And what that was meant to do was any district that was below the statewide average, as I had pointed out to you before, um, they would get 25% of the difference from the prior year added back. And that was the funding compression allocation. That um, statewide $68 million was allocated for this year. And it only totaled um, about $45 million. So the legislature set a hold harmless uh, DCD index factor and they gave back these other counties in red, they gave them more money from that $68 million. When they calculated their hold harmless, it was more than the $68 million. So they prorated everybody across the state, whether it was a, the funding compression or the DCD. So here you can see that although Miami-Dade was supposed to get 19 million, they got 14 million. But you can see that all these districts that are funded below the statewide average, instead of getting their true amount of uh, funding compression allocation actually lost money this year because of that. So how much money did we lose? We should have received 4.6 million instead they took 1.383 million away from us so that we're left with a uh, funding, a compression funding allocation of $3.2 million. Very disappointing that we continue to see the effects of the DCD. Looking now at our budget, uh, our tax levy, our certified tax roll, as I mentioned that we get, um, from the tax assessor is $44,590,031,500. And the good news there is that our, our uh, tax taxable values continue to increase in Volusia County, which does generate more uh, revenue. Based on our 5.907 uh, non-discretionary RLE, it would generate $156 million with that prior period funding uh, adjustment of, of the $342,000. Um, we would collect $156,628,728. Um, what I would like to point out here is we always receive more revenue generally from our tax um, levy than what we budget because we are only allowed by statute to budget 96% of the money that's generated. So as I pointed out in the revenue uh, from budget to actual for this prior year, we collected about a million more and generally we collect 96.3 um, to 96.4 million dollars extra, but we cannot budget for that. So it is always additional revenue. And as I mentioned here, the, uh, the legislature sets our millage rate. That's this column right here. As you can see, they have not allowed us um, to keep up with the, the uh, growth on our tax roll. As our tax roll grows, levying the same amount of millage would give us more money. However, the legislature has continued to cut that millage so that in 1011, it was at 5.698 mills. It's now down to 3.651. So counties and cities can set their own millage rates. Um, we are not able to in school districts. So the, the millage rate is set or the required local effort that we collect is set by the legislature. And they are only allowing the growth on new uh, construction but um, they are not allowing it on our, our current values that are increasing. So unfortunately, that generates less revenue for us um, than we would if we could set our own tax rate and keep it the same. That is why we have to uh, advertise a tax increase though, because the amount of the uh, growth in the levy is increasing the amount of money we collect. Mm -hmm. 
looking at our general uh, operating appropriation summary. So this is the general fund budget broken down um, in the different categories. And you can see the instruction and instructional support um, and that's approximately a $14 million increase and 10.4 million uh, came into the budget because of the teacher salary enhancement allocation. So that is included uh, in this increase. Um, other significant increases include the FRS rate that I had mentioned to you before. That's an additional cost to uh, districts and that was set by the legislature as well. Uh, so that increase is about $4.7 million. Other, um, we also increased our, uh, our uh, health insurance benefit uh, contribution for this year by $10 per month per employee. And we have included 2.2% salary increases for those, um, the other units not related to the teacher's salaries. Um, in particular, you can see that in the district administration, there is a reduction of about $3.7 million. It's primarily related to information technology. We had 1.5 million reduction in non-salary related to service contracts on computers and other non-salary reductions. Um, this budget does not right now include PO, PO rollover, so purchase orders that were uh, generated last year that we have not received um, or have not been paid, so they will roll over into this budget. Um, so that may increase the budget at final somewhat. Transportation is um, also down and primarily, primarily that's due to the deletion of vacant bus driver positions. Uh, we did have a decrease in the number of routes that we needed, so those were decreased. Um, also in uh, operation of plant, um, you see a, a small decrease and that has to do with um, the solid waste services that um, Schoolway Cafe will be assisting, um, contributing to those costs next year. Our maintenance of plant uh, went up by 2.4 million and most of that is the carryover from fiscal year 20 of unspent funds. However, we may be able to adjust that uh, at year end once we, be, we finish analyzing all of the uh, purchase, purchase orders. But there were some uh, biennial and trial, triennial expenditures that had to be added to the budget for inspections, um, as well as a request to increase um, maintenance budget, the non-salary piece, which was offset somewhat by a reduction in positions. And this is looking at uh, the appropriations by function and you can see as should be instruction and instructional support is our largest um, function of our budget at 74%. Operation and maintenance uh, of plant at 11%. School administration at 7%. District administration at 4%. People transportation at three and community and debt service at 1%. Looking at our unassigned fund balance and our financial condition ratio. So you can see that we our uh, ratios and our unassigned fund balance have uh, fluctuated fairly significantly. Um, if you look at the, uh, the unassigned here back in fiscal year 11, this was when um, the era monies were, uh, were given to us that those were similar to what we're seeing with the CARES Act. Those were federal dollars that were uh, infused into states um, to support um, school districts during the recession. So it was, it was at 12% and you can see it went down to 3.4% in fiscal year 15. Um, we did make some, some um, adjustments with uh, our health care costs that we capped those and um, also uh, had increase in employee contributions for that. Um, but as you can see, we're struggling once again. Um, we know that we had the uh, Family Empowerment Scholarship 
which we lost $3.3 million um, on the third calc because uh, that program was much larger than anyone had anticipated. It was the first year. And so as a result of that, and as a result of a decrease in Medicaid revenue, we're seeing um, that, you know, we did have, we do have a lower unassigned balance. Now, um, we may see that increase a little bit at year end, but um, the board's policy states that it must be maintained at 3% with a goal of 5%. And then our, fin our financial condition ratio, which is our unassigned and our assigned. So assigned balances um, are allocated for specific purposes. All of this money is one-time revenue. Um, once it's spent, it's gone. Uh, it is saved for things like we're experiencing now, such as COVID. Um, you know, when we're looking at PPE and all of the, the expenditures, we're projecting over $3.3 million. Um, for the cost of that, um, those can be used, but once it's gone, it's gone. And you can see that our financial condition ratio did increase to 11.11%. That was also when we had the health insurance um, refund, the pro share, and then we um, that was used up in salary negotiations, and you can see that that's decreased. Um, from 10.65 to 9.44%. Looking at actual numbers, as I mentioned, um, there are still some adjustments to be made, but at 630.19, we had 15.8 million assigned state and local. Um, we assigned $8.1 million to our fiscal year 2019-20 budget, and we had 26.2 million assigned you can see here we have not adjusted this um, this uh, balance in assigned state and local. It will be adjusted at final. Um, right now, when we uh, look, when we reconcile the revenue needed to the expenditures, we need to assign $11.3 million from our fund balance, which would reduce our unassigned by um, down to 17 million for a total of 44 million, and that's the 3.65 percent unassigned to revenue. Um, now, I I want to talk about this a little bit in my concerns when we move in, in our next in my next slide, um, but just to keep in mind those numbers there. So, what are those concerns? We've talked about many of those tonight. And I'm glad that um, the board had asked for additional details because um, those are some of the items that I wanted to address with you. Um, one of the items that uh, I know that you're very aware of is the reallocation of teaching units according to parent instructional setting selection. So uh, the deadline is tomorrow for parents to select uh, what setting they want for their student. But we also know that this may be fluid and um, there's so much unknown at this point in time, but it's making it difficult for us, as you saw with the CARES Act money where we, we added Volusia Online Learning Teachers because that was growing. And if we didn't take it out of the CARES Act, we would be taking it out of our general fund, which would reduce um, our fund balance or we have to make cuts somewhere else. The other thing that um, I wanted to bring uh, up to you to, um, is a concern is our Volusia online revenue loss. So we are budgeting on the second calc, but that is assuming that the majority of our students will be in brick and mortar schools because that's how we're, how we're funded normally. Um, we have very few um, in previous years uh, Volusia online students that are there full time. And I'll talk about that as well. The other thing is the approval of the CARES Act for the final budget. So there were some items that are currently budgeted in general fund that will be pulled out of there based on um, an approval from the state, but we, we don't have that yet. And we knew that it wouldn't be available at tentative budget, and that's one of the reasons why it will look different. We also have PP, PPE expenditures and FEMA reimbursement. Um, we're, I'm still very concerned about that. We're um, having to meet with FEMA. We have heard um, through some other districts that they may consider some of this PPE 
as um, uh, an increased cost of operating, that it's not actually uh, FEMA aidable. So that is um, quite uh, worrisome. Um, I do know that, you know, we've heard talk by um, the federal government and um, about more additional aid for schools that are opening brick and mortar. More, mortar. Um, and so we have to anticipate, you know, what that may look like as well. And we may know something by final budget on that. Um, I, I think one of the things that I have heard is about the air um, quality in schools and that um, the federal government would like to um, allocate some money for that. So we don't know, of course, what will that will look like if it is passed and when it would occur, um, because we obviously start school earlier than uh, some, some uh, states in the country. The other thing, as I pointed out, is the continued use of unassigned fund balance to balance our budget. And I know that we wanted to come to you with a balanced budget. And you know, if there are places that you still want um, to cut, we will have to go back and try to do that for um, our final budget. The other thing that we have um, been hearing at the state level from people that are very familiar with um, the, the goings on in Tallahassee is whether there will be an FEFP mid-year cut. Now, we have, of course, been told that for the third calc, which um, is based on our survey in October, that we will receive all of that money. However, um, we've also heard that if the state looks at its revenues after the elections in November, they may decide to come back and adjust the budget based on what that revenue looks like. I saw today that uh, there's been about 2.1 uh, million in losses, or 2.1 billion, I'm sorry, in lost revenue, but that right now they're looking at $4, million, $4 billion that they have um, in their rainy day fund, so to speak, in their reserves. So that's a really big unknown at this point because they're not guaranteeing that they're not gonna come back and do this. They're gonna give us our projected funding for October, um, which would come to us in January. Um, that's when we would know whether, um, you know, what's gonna go happen after that. Um, so that's something to, that we definitely have to be concerned about. And going back to the virtual education funding, so looking at, and, and I, I did this you know, last week, and I know that we've grown since then, but right now, if we were to calculate uh, revenue on 5,500 full-time Volusia Online students, um, those same students under seat time, if they were in brick and mortar or Volusia Live, would earn about seven, $7,410 each. Um, that's a total of almost $41 million. So under virtual education, the allocation for our second calc was $5,448, which is a difference of almost $2,000, about $2,000 per student. So the revenue for that piece would be $30 million. That's a difference of $10.8 million. And what's different about the, the uh, virtual student is we do not receive the virtual allocation. Number one, we don't receive it in our third calc. Um, those students are not funded until June in the fourth calc. And why aren't they funded until the fourth calc? They're not funded because if they don't complete their courses and get credit for them, we do not receive any funding. So we would receive zero, whereas if the student was in seat time all year long, we would receive 7,400. Instead, if these courses aren't completed, we receive nothing, we receive zero. And we will not know that until June. Now, I know Dr. Balgobin had discussed um, this at previous board meetings and that we are strongly recommending that students who start with Volusia Online Learning, they finish the semester and really that revol revolves around the student and the importance of their education. So the number, number one, it's beneficial for students to complete the courses because otherwise they will not earn credit if they don't complete. 
Number two, it's beneficial for the district because as I said, we will not receive funding if they do not complete the courses. If, if a student did not complete one course that they were registered for, we would receive zero for that student. And we would not know that until June. But also, you know, number three for students, if they don't finish the semester in online and then they come back to school or they're going in and out, it interrupts the continuity of their instruction. So that is why the district is strongly encouraging these students if they start in virtual to at least finish the semester. And there are a number of reasons. So, you know, I, I just want to be very clear on that, that that's something that will be unknown. And I had this slide in here to address the CARES Act, which um, is the ESSER fund. And I know we talked about the CTE grant and we had the GEAR summer recovery. Um, we brought up the transportation for that. Um, the gears, the reason why the gear um, did not include that transportation is because it was an unallowable expenditure under the gear summer recovery act. We could not um, charge it to that and we had an allocation up to a certain amount, but that was an unallowable expenditure. So that's why it was in the cares act. It would have either had to be in there or paid for by general fund. Um, and the CTE program, again, that is money that are, that are um, specifically allocated by DOE release. And then we have a certain amount of time to turn around and they're for specific purposes and they have certain assurances. Um, so as we talked about earlier, the CARES ESSER is $15.3 million. There's the private school allocation of almost a million and then the charter school allocation of almost $500,000. Our district allocation of 13.3, plus as we said, we have indirect revenue that assists with the grant allocation or the grant administration because it is a huge grant and we have to it, administer it. And just looking um, through what these expenditures are that are including the, in that 13.3 million, Again, maintain critical staff, um, in, purchase instructional software licenses, which are over and above what the district would have done um, had we not had uh, the COVID learning loss as well as this additional money from the CARES Act, uh, provide professional development to teachers, um, also the summer recovery transportation, a second grade reading camp, um, additional tutoring for students once they return to school to help offset that learning loss and additional staff to support Volusia Online. Capital expenditures, we talked about the student devices, the, the hotspots for students online learning, technology infrastructure upgrades, system monitoring software and cybersecurity software. And that is the presentation. I'd be happy to look um, to answer any questions. And you also have the general fund budget booklet, which I mean the budget booklet, which goes into more detail if there's anything specific that you would like to address there. Thank you, uh, Deb. Anything you want to say, Dr. Bagelman, before I open it up to uh, my colleagues? No, Ms. Wright, not at this time. I met with Deb this morning and we looked at the budget in detail. So a lot of the information that's been presented to us tonight, we reviewed it, or we reviewed it earlier this morning. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, though. So I'll start with uh, Carl. Do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Matt. <clears throat> Excuse me. Th thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Deb. Excellent presentation. As always, a uh, lot of moving parts to it. Prep, guess more moving parts this year than <laughs> other years. But uh, yeah, uh, all right. So I don't want to say some of the obvious things, but uh, let me ask you. Uh, let me ask you a question, and maybe this involves somebody else to answer it. Uh, uh, it's always challenging to staff our schools when the students are coming back and then we always make that nine day adjustment and sometimes 20 day and 30 day 
as uh, as more or fewer students come in at at each at each school, then we transfer teachers and and we do that. And and that's always that's that's always difficult um, for mm -hmm. us. Uh, this year, it will obviously be even more more challenging. And um, I was going to ask Kelly, maybe, or somebody that might know, uh, in regards to our survey uh, that we're sending out uh, to the parents and to the teachers, can can someone give us any idea of, uh, of either the number or what percentage of the parents have already indicated what they want to do? I, I could provide that answer for you, Mr. Persis. As of yesterday, um, we received our survey results that came back from about 20,000 families, which is approximately one third of our families in the county. And as of yesterday, the indication was 53% uh, showed a preference for brick and mortar, the traditional setting, and close to 30% the Volusia Live, and about 18% was VOL. Volusia Online, and that's as of yesterday. But we do have, I wanna make a, a clarification, we have extended the date for our survey to Thursday, 12 p.m. for our families. Okay, great, uh, thank you for that. And what about uh, from the teachers? Are they on the same deadline or what? what is the... Uh, I, I have Mr. Answers. West here, we did send it out and Mr. West actually sending another message out to the teachers today. Mr. West, you care to respond, is it the same date or do we have an extended date? Um, we actually have till tomorrow, um, I'm sorry, till Thursday to have our okay. teachers respond. Currently we have, and I, I'm sorry Mr. Persis and Ms. Cuthbert that um, we actually gave out our HR corner and to the uh, board members that are here, I'll make sure you get that electronically, but um, the results that we have, have as of yesterday um, was that we had 20, uh, 2,268 teachers respond. Uh, that's about half of our teachers. Um, of those, um, 1,977 have indicated a uh, return to work, and that could either be um, the brick and mortar or the, uh, the Volusia Live. Um, and we have had um, about 100 that are requesting a leave of absence. Um, and we have eight that are looking to retire and 21 that are looking to resign. And we have about 157 that are, are undecided at this time. So the majority of the teachers are, are looking to return to work. Um, so um, we also have our support uh, folks as well. And of, of those, we have uh, 839 that have responded. 700 have, are looking to return to work. Um, it looks like about 30 are gonna request a leave of absence. Uh, six are looking to retire and six are looking to potentially resign. Um, of our schoolway cafe and transportation, okay, we've had, um, it's, it's combined, we had, well, we had 345 take the schoolway cafe and 126 take the transportation survey. Of those 345, 324 are looking to return to work in Schoolway Cafe. And in transportation, 116 of the 126 are looking to return. So um, those are just kind of tentative numbers that we have right now. We're hoping that by Thursday, we'll have um, a, a better response, of course, of, of the majority. Well, we already have the majority of our employees, but even more of our employees, and, and we are, um, sending out individual notes to our substitutes as well. Um, those are a little harder because they don't necessarily go to the website and take the survey. So we're actually gonna be sending out letters to our, our substitutes to uh, find out where we are on that as well. Uh, thank you, Mr. West. Uh, that's, yes, that's great information. Can you tell me, uh, those, those teachers who will uh, uh, have, have signed up, I guess, to uh, teach uh, through the Volusia virtual, are, were those teachers included in the numbers you were giving me? Are those? Uh, I don't know if they've actually, we don't, we haven't, I didn't have the information to track it down to the individual teachers to know 
some of them, and, and I, will, I will say this to you, that um, we have um, a number of allocations that were just allocated recently and posted today um, for um, Volusia online learning. Um, we had actually 79 that we have put up just today in both elementary and secondary. So that's probably going to affect a number of folks um, and could potentially affect um, a lot of our schools. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, Dr. Balgobin and, and Mr. West, uh, one of the things that uh, we have kind of brushed on a few weeks back, but, uh, but now we're getting closer uh, to the actual start of school, and, and that is this, this notion that the teachers who don't feel like it's safe to return to school or the teachers who are at a high risk category or perhaps live in a high risk household, um, would, would the people in that category be given any uh, preference uh, to be able to teach uh, from their homes, either Volusia Virtual or Volusia Live? So at this time, um, what we're doing is our Volusia online learning. Mm -hmm. um, we are advertising those to internal candidates only. So what we're doing is giving a preference, obviously, to our teachers that are currently in our school system um, with the hopes that anybody who um, does not feel comfortable returning to, uh, to the brick and mortar will have that option to, to look at that Volusia online learning. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that everybody will, but that we, we are looking internally first before we look externally. We're, we're basically having that as only an internal um, transfer at this point. And the other thing that we're doing is um, we're in response to our Volusia Live, um, we're, we're actually working with our principals, and our principals are working with assistant superintendents and have been working on the last two days at our Leadership Institute mm -hmm. to clarify what is going to, that's actually going to look like. Um, yeah. Our teachers are going to, are going to return to, to school. Um, they're they're going to return to school on, on during pre-planning, and what we're going to try to do is make sure that... Um, Obviously, we're, we're following all of our CDC guidelines, but that training that's going to be, um, you know, online um, is going to hopefully um, be available to to all of our teachers in that regards. Yeah. Uh, so, do you see it, uh, Mr. West, uh, just like normal school? Uh, the the school year starts in any given uh, class, any given school, the number of students don't show up, let's say, that we thought. Um, and uh, so would then, would we be like transferring those teachers to other schools where perhaps more students uh, showed up or some other path is, 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 is that still the plan, how we would operate? Well, we'll have to take a look at that, obviously, when the numbers are coming in and the students are coming in. But we do have a process in place for just like at the start of any school year, we look at the, our, our number of students and we have a process that we follow um, that, that has um, been negotiated with our union and is in the contract of any kind of a, a unit adjust, adjustments that are made. Uh, we'll make sure that we follow those. Yeah, I was, I was, I, and I'm, and, and the reason why uh, I'm, I'm kind of just going on with this a little bit is because when, when we talk of budget, uh, uh, you know, so, so much of it is in involving our, our personnel. And uh, so where, where we have our personnel, um, um, how many uh, that we need to have, um, uh, you know, those are all critically important uh, for each of those teachers, as 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 well as for the principals and for the uh, parents. And I, I think what I heard you say, Mr. West, was uh, 
that we would just need to be flexible with this as flexible as we are with the parents who are perhaps changing their mind about whether they want their student to be at at home or at the schoolhouse am i am i hearing that correctly can i yes can yes. i interject so just a couple of things i'd like to clarify and share with you a process that we're putting in place you've mentioned the 12 day recalc you know and the whole purpose of the 12 day recalc is to look at your numbers and make those adjustments as necessary yeah so moving forward because we have a very fluid model we have discussed today with the team that we will probably do have to do one way, way before the 12th day recalc, right? Huh. We would have to relook at those numbers again and see if there are any necessary adjustments that will need to be made. But let me share with you some the, the discussion that we had today. On uh, a Thursday, we're getting the survey results at uh, 12 o'clock. And we have set up a workshop with the team. So Mr. West will be involved in that workshop. I would have Deb Muller in that workshop. We will have the assistant superintendents for each division in that workshop. We will have uh, Mr. Griffin in that workshop. So we'll have the entire pretty much cabinet team and they're all there for a specific reason. As we start looking through the numbers, we'll see what the numbers are for the traditional setting by school, by grade level, right? Because then that will determine teachers. And then we would look at the second option, which would be the traditional, I mean, the Volusia Life model. And I do want to clarify that part of that model is that the teacher is collaborating with his or her peers at the traditional setting for PLCs. The same lesson is taking place, and that's part of our funding, too, to guarantee that funding, that yeah. we would need a full funding for, for that model, for that option, I mean. And then Susie Peterson will also be part in that workshop because then we would also look at the Volusia online numbers that are coming in. We made a very deliberate effort today to ensure that um, the communication is clear and succinct when it comes to these 79 positions that we're gonna be advertising, that we will be looking in-house first and foremost just for the reason that you have outlined, Mr. Persis. Um, and then we have scheduled at, at least two checkpoints before we get to that 12-day recap where we would look at those numbers for necessary adjustments as needed and principals at that point in time from those uh, particular schools whether it's the elementary division middle or high will be involved in that process as we make those adjustments so it's going to be fluid it's going to be ongoing and but we will have those interim checkpoints to see what adjustments will need to be made but the numbers will determine um, the number of teachers and you know what they will be teaching and so forth and skill set obviously yeah yeah mm -hmm. uh, so many so many challenges uh, for for you the district staff uh, for everyone well let me throw this out to you uh, dr. Balgobin and and see if 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 this could be a possibility let's say um, let's say third grade classroom there's three third grade teachers uh, each of them has something like 12 students show up physically in the in the classroom uh, and there's another six that they're teaching each of them at their home I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm just wondering at at some point would we want to look at the collective numbers at a grade level and again it varies from school depending how large that particular school is but there may be a time when it would be advantageous for the student as well as the teacher uh, to say you know what um, I'm gonna take the all these brick and mortar kids or let's divide these brick and mortar kids and let's lump all these live students just to one teacher rather than have four or five with one, four or five with another, and four and three, rather than just make it such, such, a, such a few students with each yeah, teacher yeah. to maybe, and, may, and, and again, I'm not saying that this, uh, that one way's right and one way's wrong, but I think if the numbers dictate it at your given school that there may be ways for principals um, with your okay, of, of course, to say, okay, now that we have some firm numbers, maybe get with your teachers and say, 
you know, what what do you all want to do here? And then I, I think it it could be uh, explained to the to the parents, uh, you know, why if we want to make any kind of changes like that. I hope I'm being clear. I'm trying you, to. You are very clear. Yes, sir. And part of the adjustment, when we look at the adjustments and we lo look at how we're going to be adjusting those numbers based on needs, that's exactly what it is. We'll be looking at the numbers, how many teachers we have, how can we possibly have some dedicated classes, right, for Volusia Live. And okay. then for if, if there's not a possibility for one class to be dedicated, there will be conversation between yeah. that teacher, you know, and, and the principal. It will be a collaborative effort. But yeah. right now there are so right. many variables that are on the table that as yeah. until we get those numbers, we I will know. not be able to look at step two, three, and four. Yeah, I know. Everything spec speculative as this at this point. Uh, Madam Chair, I'm, I'm going to uh, stop there. Uh, I really don't have any uh, questions about the budget. Uh, we can't do anything about our uh, about our revenue. Uh, and uh, if I start talking about the budget, then I just get ugly talking about people in Tallahassee. So I'm not going to do that. And uh, I'm just going to pass it on to you. Thank, Thank you, Madam you. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Persis. Ms. Uh, Cuthbert. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, it is very um, discouraging to see how much money we are losing from year to year to year, especially when our economy was supposed to have been doing so well in this state um, with um, the sales tax revenue. I don't understand, I, I really don't understand why over such a period of since 2004, um, the state has chosen to, um, I guess, pick certain school districts to lose money. I mean, a continual drain on our resources so that there is a disparity, not just between, you know, within our district, there's a disparity of neighborhoods, but now there's a disparity in our state of districts, of school districts, because some school districts are able to meet the needs of their students very easily, and others aren't. And um, we've had some very good finance directors in this county who have pinched the penny and squeezed the lemon to dry. Um, and it's, it's very, very sad. So Ms. Muller, thank you. It seems like everything ends up on your desk, you and your team and your staff. Um, I wish I could present you Disney World. I wish we had a steady, a steady stream of sale tax revenue within ourselves. It would be nice if we could raise a little bit um, and just have have some a little extra revenue. We can't really charge anybody for anything. Um, our extended day and before the bell are usually not profitable. Um, we use it to purchase materials and staff and we we anything we make we put right back into our product so it's it behooves everyone to be very careful in the primary and in the november election it's extremely important that we vote people in who are pro public education charters and traditional schools are pro um, education we do not deny any other group their fair funds as what Miss Melody Johnson used to say, just don't take it from us. Just give everybody what they're supposed to have. The state can give other districts more money. Just don't take it from us to give it to them. So I see where we have been hit in a lot of different ways. Um, we're not, Miss Muller, is it possible you could tell us how much money the, from the lottery we're going to be receiving this year? just so the public knows? Well, that's the money we will not be receiving this year. Um, <laughs> because of the fact that uh, there were no school grades, so they took away the school recognition and the lottery funds that we normally would receive. And I, so remember, yeah, I remember telling my students 10, 12 years ago that we only got $3 million and they were appalled that it wasn't more. And I think before they took it away, it was gonna be around $62,000. Well, 
So we have lost, we get no lottery funds. I just want people to understand that school districts are not getting lottery funds this year. So right. last year, we this past year, we got $60,720. The school recognition was 1.6 million. So we've lost that entirely. Yeah. So then that's all added money that schools used for um, programs and for staff bonuses and everybody got it. Uh, a lot of times, uh, and the A plus, you know, if you're an A school, so it's, it's very difficult to take sometimes when our ability to raise money is taken away from us and the money that's owed to us is taken away. Our ability to, um, I guess, even vote to ask the taxpayer, it, it's taken away. And it's, and it's very difficult to swallow. It's, it's very sad, but um, I just want to make sure the, the, um, the public understands the bind we're in this year. And I think with this pandemic, it really shows, like what Mrs. Um, Wright has said, show me where to get the money, the one-to-one -one that she asked us last week. Okay, so you want to close, where do we get the computers? Because we don't have it. Because mm -hmm. now we don't have the money to have purchased that. And it's, um, I guess it's taken this a lot for us to realize it's not just what we have, because we as educators try to look at what we do have, but then we always have to look at what we don't have. So we have to have very creative, innovative ways to find it, what Mr. Griffin has told us, what you have told us, um, and then the way we have to arrange our instruction this year. It's very disheartening. Um, but we do it because we love the classroom, because our kids deserve a first-class education, no matter what age they are, what race, social, economic, physical, or mental ability they have. Uh, we accept them all, our doors are open. Um, in normal circumstances, they're always open. Um, I just, I'm really sad. It's very sad that it, it's reduced. And to see the, re, the uh, required local effort to be so low, it's very difficult, mm -hmm. very, very difficult. Um, can I ask a question of, of Mr. Uh, Ms. Balgobin? I, I'm afraid I might forget it in my dotage. If, if parents have trouble assessing the survey and uh, maybe teachers can't get into that, what happens to them if they don't fill out the survey? Because that is a potential loss of revenue. So, I'm echoing. <laughs> Are you there, Ms. Cutberg? Yes. What yes, we're going to do tomorrow, Ms. Cutberg, is that we're going to assess and see where we are in terms of the numbers that we've received and in terms of our sur survey. We're going to go ahead and send out another um, um, messaging um, message out to all of our parents um, and our teachers regarding the survey and letting them know also that if they have any questions regarding the survey for, which, for why they have not responded, a number for them to call. Did, did she, did Ms. Cutberg free? She's frozen. Um, is there anything, um, how do we know? Did you hear what I said, Ms. Cutberg? Uh, no. Okay. I'm you sorry, were, I didn't you, hear it, no. You froze for a little bit, so I'll repeat oh, what okay. I, uh, one of the discussions also we had today, because we know that so far we have about 30% of our uh, of our parents who have responded to the survey as of today, and our teachers, I have to double check, with over 50%. So tomorrow we're doing a reminder. We're doing a reminder. Okay. We're going to be sending out a message in addition to something in writing, but also we're going to provide a number. So for, for instance, you know, as they receive that message, if they have a question regarding the survey for why they have not responded so far, they'll have the ability to call into that number so we can answer their questions. Okay. And then once we get the final results on Thursday, we'll look at this discrepancy gap between how many employees we have and how many uh, students mm -hmm. we have, you know, that have been previously enrolled. And based on that discrepancy gap, if we have to do another um, outreach, we'll do that outreach. 
So tomorrow, a reminder, okay. and then on Thursday, oh. look at the discre discrepancy gap between the numbers and um, current employees by categories and also students. Okay, thank you very much, ma'am. Thank You're you, very Madam welcome. Chair. You're very welcome. Thank you, Mr. Colon. So I wanted, Ms. Muller, if we can go back to the slide of the tax increase. And so can you explain uh, and lay folks uh, whether or not we are voting to increase the taxes or how does that come about? Because I know that sometimes that's lost in the translation and a lot of folks don't understand that we don't really get to decide how much our local effort will be. It's way at the beginning. Yeah, sorry. I almost wished I had stopped you right there. <laughs> but you but you but you were on a roll, so I didn't wanna Yeah, it's way back. Yeah, it's from the very beginning. Legally we have to present this right up front, so that's why it is up there. Yep, there you go. It was the very first okay. slide. Look at that. Okay, so say this in English so that everybody understands because the way that the uh, news journal will advertise this tomorrow is that the school board has raised your taxes. Well, and legally, that is how we have to advertise it, right? Correct. Yes, because so we, if we collected, because our taxable values increased, right, from last year to this year, if we levied a tax that would produce the same amount of revenue last year as this year, then that amount would be 5.717 mills. So if we levied 5.717 mills, we would generate as much last year as we could this year because the taxable values have increased. But our proposed rate, which as we talked about, the RLE is set by the legislature. And if I go, just to use this illustration here. So this 3.651 is set by the state, by the legislature. This prior period, the prior period adjustment millage is required. Um, and that's, that's dictated by the state. So real quick, so we don't get to decide what we want to tax our real estate act. Is that correct? That is decided on by the state. That is absolutely correct. The legislature sets those uh, millage rates, except for, and let me just go back to this one. So except for the discretionary operating millage, which is the 0.748, um, but that is factored into the revenue that we get, okay? So it's the maximum you can, you can collect. I don't know if any boards across the state even uh, collect less but it's factored into the revenue that you get from the FEFP. The capital outlay millage at 1.5 mil, so that goes directly to for our building programs. And that is the maximum that we can collect by statute. So we cannot collect any more than that. Um, prior to the recession, we were allowed to collect two mils. Then they reduced it to 1.75 mils, and then they reduced it even further to 1.5. So during the recession, we were collecting 1.5 mils on a lot less in value. So that directly relates to what we have to build in, in capital as well for all of our facilities. So yes, we, this, is, this is actually not something that we can control unless the board were to say, let's not collect 0.748 mils in general fund and let's not collect uh, 1.5 capital outlay mills, which would, which would be disadvantageous to our district. So therefore we have to advertise this as a tax increase. So, so then my quick, go back to the next slide. So what I see here is that as the property values start to go up, the state decreases what we can tax at a local level. Yes, that is what has been happening. So even though real estate goes through the roof, we are, the, the legislature keeps dropping that. And so uh, we're kind of in the same place. So even though real estate is back up again, that doesn't mean that we're back up. Is that what I'm understanding? 
That's correct. We are, we are, they are adjusting the required local effort um, only so that we can collect on the new construction. Okay, so they are allowing us to collect on the full value of the new construction, but not on the current properties. Okay, so right. here, is, here is the list of the millage rates, and then here is the tax roll increase. So in 1011, we were decreasing 12.61%, and then we've been increasing this much every year, 8.86, 8.04, 8.26, but yet they're decreasing the millage so that we can't collect the full value of these properties. Only Very construction. Very good. That that is that is what I uh, wanted to ensure that folks understand. And so, um, our hands are tied in a lot of ways. Um, and 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 I usually don't like to focus on what we don't have because the reality is that this is in the legislature and uh, this is out of our control. Um, so. For last year, have we closed the books and do we know how we ended up, how much of the reserves we ended up having? Has, have we gotten that number just yet? No, that, um, that part of it was what I was um, discussing when I talked about these numbers here. Um, I mean, they're, they're somewhat close, but we do have to adjust. We have to clean up all of these projects um, that we have assigned balances in and um, we know that we have encumbrances, which encumbrances are our purchase orders that were still open at the end of the fiscal year. Um, we're still working on those um, because of tr um, changing to our new system. Uh, we're working through all of that. Um, so right now, our best projection is that our unassigned balance will be 17 million, which is a loss of uh, almost $10 million from this year. Gotcha. And so, you know, one of the things that we can do as board members is advocate, you know, I, I foresee a bailout for K-12 schools. You know, we, you know, the parents are given the choice. The governor uh, keeps saying that we've got to give parents a choice, and I'm all about giving parents the choice. But these decisions and don't come without... Um, a, f a fiscal impact and so you know for myself personally while this is extremely important I am more so looking for families to be able to pick what they want and get their students educated you know um, this hole is going to be so big at the end of the day for the whole country the whole K all education you know mm -hmm. the hole is going to be so big that you know, we can only pray that somebody down there, somebody up there, not down there, will do the right thing. Um, because again, all this, you know, all this FEMA and, and all these things that are all, you know, retro paid, or, you know, it, you've mm -hmm. got to put the money out that you can't say to the vendor, you know, th thank you for selling us, sending us 700,000 masks, we'll pay you when we get paid by FEMA, because that just doesn't work. Um, and furthermore, they'll find all the reasons why not to pay us. But anyways, so that that's what I wanted to make sure we clarified. I think that there are lots of moving targets with this budget. Uh, it's like trying to nail Jello to a wall, and uh, we won't really know uh, where we are until we are there. Uh, we can take best estimates. Um, one qu one question, and you know what, I'll leave it alone. I was going to ask about. Uh, but that has nothing to do with the budget. I know we went on that last time. So very good. I'm done. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Ms. Haynes. Thank you. So, Ms. Muller, there's a few things that I'd like to talk about. So on the slide that you're on right now, our policy, if I heard you correctly, states that we cannot take the um, the unassigned fund balance below um, 3%, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. So we're looking at right now that once you um, actually get through the rest of the purchase orders and the purchases that were made to truly close out the school year, you know, that closed on June 30th, 
you are looking at only having 17, approximately 17 million left in unassigned, which would be 3.65%, mm -hmm. correct? That's correct. Um, again, going back to a couple of the moving pieces though, this 15.8 million assigned, that will change. Uh, um, it's generally you know, in the same ballpark because there are certain funds that um, are assigned to specific, uh, specific uh, items um, for specific programs. Um, also, we don't know until um, with our assigned budget. Now, when we get when we get money from the CARES Act, we may be able to uh, reduce what we need um, if we can move some of the, the salaries from general fund into the CARES Act, but we don't know that at this point in time. So you, you are absolutely right, though, that um, our fund balance has de decreased substantially um, just in the past year. Yes, $10 million is substantial. I thought I heard you correctly, but I, I want to be sure. You mentioned um, where we're at currently for the loss of um, sales tax revenue. Did I hear um, $900 billion statewide? Uh, I I read that they were they had lost cumulatively about 2.1 billion I believe that was, oh. and their reserves are at 4 billion. Okay, so all right, so 2.1 billion dollars is the loss of sales tax from the time we walked out in spring break because I know that's when they started tracking the loss mm -hmm. up through say, you know this past week or something. All right. I think it's only through uh, June, if I'm correct. Okay, so they've not released July's loss yet at this time. Right. Okay, looking um, forward, if you could go to slide 26, the one about the virtual education funding, which that's our Volusia online learning. All right, and Dr. Balgobin may have to answer this part of the question. Dr. Balgobin, I know that um, Mrs. Muller generated this on the assumption that there would be 5,500 students enrolled in Volusia Online. I believe I heard we're at 7,000 already. I, I believe the last numbers are around 7,000. Okay, so with we were already looking at a loss of $10.8 million for students moving from um, traditional, the brick and mortar, over to Volusia Online and that was with 5,500 students going. We now are already at 7,000 students, so we are now facing a larger loss here. But I wanna make sure, because I know a lot of parents are listening and I appreciate that they are listening and taking such involvement in what is going on here. Like, it, it's strange that it brought about a pandemic to get everybody on board, but it's a great thing. So, if I heard you correctly, we are not paid the um, per pupil allocation fee for students that enroll in Volusia Online until June. That's that correct. Okay, and we're only paid in June that $5,447.73 per student if when we reach June, they have completed and earned a credit and or grade for the courses that they took with Volusia Online Learning. Yeah, that is absolutely correct. Okay, so if a student signs up or a parent has already signed up right now for Volusia Online Learning to put their child in there full time, we've asked them to make a commitment for the first semester. But even if they go in and they go through the first semester, we will still not receive the funding for them until June. Um, I'm, I'm honestly, um, I'm not completely clear on how that will work because it said that they will keep us whole for our, our third calc, but I believe that they may deduct anything during the fourth calc in June for those non-completers. So there's normally when they go through and count, 
in the October survey, they would mark those students that are virtual, they would mark those as zero for our FTE. Um, I'm, I, I, we're still trying to work through that and we may get more information tomorrow from DOE on how that will work, but um, they could deduct all of that funding, which we won't know. So some students obviously will complete semest one semester courses um, and so they may take two um, courses that would equal a full semester or a full year, right? And so we would know those numbers, whether they completed, mm -hmm. but we still won't know about the funding fully until June. So we can lose that amount of funding on the fourth calc in June. Okay. And I just have a few more questions about this, if you'll bear with me. So seventh grader parent signs up their seventh grader they make the commitment that they'll stay through the first semester the students taking a full load of courses mm -hmm. they have to have pass or have a grade in every one of those courses they can't like not do one course is that what i also heard earlier um so are we talking about uh full year courses or or one semester courses? One semester courses. Okay, so if a one semester course, if they completed that and get credit for it, and then they came to brick and mortar, mm -hmm. right, that's what you're asking, yes. then we would get funded for that course. But if they had full year courses, um, then we would get funded for half of a year. If they then come back to brick and mortar, I believe we would get funded for that half of a year's worth of credit and we would get seat time when they return. Okay. Okay, so their second half of the year would be funded for seat time based on them being in brick and mortar or on Volusia Live. All right, the, and the reason why I'm asking this is because I need parents to, as they're making their choices, and I know a lot of them already have because 7,000 plus mm -hmm. have already signed up for this, I need them to understand that if their child, just because they sign up for Volusia Online Learning, if their child does not complete the courses that they've signed up for and earn a grade or the credit, then we hit June and we get zero dollars for that child, even if they sat there for the year, correct? Yes. All right. Zero. Which then which then means instead of just a loss of ten million, we which was based on the 5,500, we would be looking at even a greater loss because they were there, we paid for their curriculum, we paid for a teacher to instruct them, but if they don't finish, there's no money. That's exactly correct, yes. All right, so that is, a, that is I knew that we got a reduced amount and I knew that it was around $2,000 less per student, but the fact that if they don't complete it, we get zero is a little disheartening because I am concerned about putting that responsibility on students where they may not have any parental support or follow-up to make sure that they're fin finishing their courses. Yes. All right, then looking um, ahead in this, um, We don't know, as you said, what's gonna happen when they do the next calculation, but I did think about this and I thought about, for example, Florida Virtual right now, because for every student that has signed up for Florida Virtual, whether they're going the standard Florida Virtual or the Florida Virtual Flex, or they've signed up for K-12, or they've walked out the door to homeschool, move on to private or charter, for every one of those kids, we're actually losing the money. And someone said, well, no, it's going to be okay, Jamie, we're keeping the money. But then I put myself into the place of Florida Virtual right now. If last year across the state, and I don't know the exact numbers, I'm just giving you a number. If Florida Virtual enrolled and had, say, 200,000 kids in Florida Virtual last year, well, if they're at 400,000 this year, I mm -hmm. can't see that they would say to the governor, it's okay, you can continue to just fund us for 200,000 mm -hmm. and we'll cover the additional cost, you know, even though we've doubled our enrollment. So right. I am concerned that what we're going to start hearing 
because even our own Volusia Online has, mm -hmm. you know, gone up by how much, that those groups are going to start saying, thank you very much for the beginning of the year allocation you gave us. However, we don't have enough funds now because we have raised our enrollment by a quarter, a third, mm -hmm. a half, or even more. And with a loss in sales tax revenue, where's the money coming from? So I think everybody needs to stop and think about that. Um, I don't think we can just sit here and assume that we're all going to be okay because mm -hmm. virtual is even funded at a lesser rate. I had a question, and Dr. Balgobin, this may be for you. When um, Mr. West was going over like the survey data and then you were talking about the survey data and taking a look at it tomorrow and following up, as you're collecting that survey data, has anyone yet looked to see how the numbers are coming in from the different schools? Because it's my understanding that as a parent goes in, they're, they're identifying their child with their alpha code, they're putting in their first and last name, and then they're selecting their school as well as selecting then here is what we're doing. So, you know, if I was a student at University High, I'm now not coming to University High, I'm going to Florida, um, or I'm going to Volusia Online Learning, or I was at Blue Lake, and I'm going to do this. Have we looked at the schools yet? Yes, okay. ma'am. Yes, okay. yes, we have. Um, so we started looking at the schools today, and I think that Mr. West or someone has a copy of the, the, the spreadsheet. Um, but pretty much looking per school, the number of students or parents who have chosen for their students to opt into either Volusia Live or VOL, Volusia Online. So we've got that list of, so that we can see how each school will be impacted so we can make more a more informed decision as we do adjustments with numbers. Yeah, but we do have a spreadsheet outlined by schools. Okay, and so, so this survey went out in English and in Spanish? Yes, ma'am. All right, so Mr. West, if you don't mind, um, and it could be tomorrow, I would like to know um, specifically for um, Pearson Elementary and Taylor Middle High, what the numbers are looking like that are coming back in, because I do have a concern that those parents maybe have not even received nor have access to the surveys um, in order to complete them based upon what we've already talked about, them not having internet services. Mm -hmm. Well, if you know, you're sending out an email message or whatever, they're not necessarily getting that or having access to fill out those surveys. So um, I already did speak with one of my principals up there and she had a great idea and I think she may be following through with it, but I am concerned about not collecting data from that area um, because they may not be getting the messages because I think that happens at times. I think a lot of things are sent home. And I'm glad you brought that, to, you're mentioning that, because I did hear that, again, from Ms. Cuthbert over the weekend. And um, Kelly Schultz went ahead and sent out a messenger, like, you know, a voice. Mm -hmm. um, and then we're doing another one again today. But that's why we are also breaking down that data by school so we can determine where the discrepancy lies and what we need to do between, you know, tomorrow and what, once we get all of the numbers in. So we... I want you to know that there is communication that's been sent out besides, you know, email or written in written format. Okay. Like calls have been made, robocalls. Okay. And and once again, we're hoping there's technology and they're getting it. Agreed. I just, agreed. I just want to make sure that we're getting an accurate accounting for um, that area because there are some challenges there. Then. Mrs. Mm -hmm. Cuthbert earlier talked about um, extended day and before the bell and how the funds that come in for those programs, um, you know, because parents need that additional time, they're coming in for those programs. And she talked about there not being, you know, that every penny coming in is spent. I'm not 100% sure about before the bell because that was new last year and Ms. Muller may be able to tell us, but I know in the past with the extended day funds, um, especially at the elementary level where kids were staying. In the past, we had, that actually made money. Um, it wasn't necessarily all spent. And so I would like at some point, and it may not be till later in the year, I'd like to know a little bit more about, 
you know, what we're doing financially with uh, before the bell programs and the extended day programs, how much money those programs are generating versus what the programs are actually costing us to run. And in the event that, you know, we are just breaking even, then how are, how's the additional funding being spent? Um, because it's something that I've had a question about for a while. I, I think sometimes principals, it's their discretion and that's fine, but I'd just like to know, you know, where we're at with that funding. Because that is the one group that when we entered into the springtime and everyone stayed at home, our extended day group leaders and everything um, were let go. That is the group that they no longer received a paycheck. And so I just have some questions about that and need to understand. And with that being said, just because we're talking money, um, you know, what are our plans right now? Are we looking at having before the bell at our traditional middle, you know, when we go back to traditional for middle schools and are we looking at having extended day at our elementaries as we open back up? Because I've had some parents reach out and ask me, mm -hmm. these are parents that are intending for their children to return to tr a traditional setting and they're wanting to know, you know, are those programs still going to exist even at this time? Because that's something they have to figure out, you know, if they work till five or six, um, or if they have to go into work before middle school starts, they're just needing to make sure and find out, are we gonna offer those things? I can answer that question now for you. Um, EDEP will continue. That has been communicated to our families. So some, we have some families that, that are still uncertain. I think we need to be very clear on our, our website, and I know Kelly is listening to me right now, about EDP EP and that communication that is still available. And as a matter of fact, on this, uh, this weekend too, I did receive from the coordinator, um, the, the support specialist for EDEP, the registration update, they were looking at the registration update, mm -hmm. which were 2,863, which was an increase from one day to the next of 1,575. 5,575. An increase oh. of 1,575 oh. in just one day. And I received this update Friday, 4.38 p.m. So as of this past Friday, 2,863 students are going to stay in extended day programs. Registration, yes, Registration, yes. okay. And right. we have one more week to go. So by the end of uh, this week, I should get another update and I'll be happy to provide you with those numbers. Okay, so for any parents that are out there listening right now, in the event that they didn't receive the message or a robocall or whatever, and they are, their intent is to return their children to the traditional brick and mortar setting on August 31st, they have through next Friday. Friday. They have through next Friday, which would be, let me pull up my calendar. through Friday, August the 7th, to make sure their children are registered in order for them to have a spot in the extended day after school program at their um, zoned or assigned school. We may wanna get a message out on that because I, I am concerned that some of them may not know that. Send another message out, I just text the team. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, and I and I appreciate that, and I just I wanted to ask because Mrs. Cuthbert had brought up the extended day piece, and I had some questions on that um, that had come in from different families. All right, um, Mrs. Muller, I want to thank you um, for everything that you did tonight and walking through and um, giving a clear explanation to of what happens with the uh, per pupil funding um, based on if they're in traditional setting or virtual um, setting. So for the parents that are choosing Volusia Live, they would then still earn, um, or we would earn the seat time allocation. So yeah. parents, as you're making your choices, um, please keep those things in mind because our goal is to try to keep um, everyone employed yeah. as we did in the spring. So thank you. Thank you, uh, Ms. Haynes. And um, actually the two questions I had, uh, Mr. Cologne Act, so I don't want to belabor uh, this because some of the other things that we've discussed really, we, we want to stay with the budget and I want to make sure if we got people calling about the budget, we can address that. 
So for me, I, I don't have any more questions. Colleagues, do you all have any more comments or questions for Ms. Yes. Uh, Mueller? It's yes. about the budget, correct? Yes. Okay, go ahead. Yes, I'm, I'm pretty sure um, the, there's another booklet that's attached to this uh, on the tentative budget with capital projects and everything in it. Are we addressing that tonight? Um, that is part of our tentative budget. Um, if you remember correctly, um, we had met and discussed the capital budget and um, in regards to Ortona and Osceola. Um, and so this tentative budget reflects our last conversation and what you had directed us to do. Um, we do have next Tuesday on August 4th, we have another uh, presentation on Osceola Ortona. And after that, then we will finalize based on your direction at that okay. time. Because I have, oh gosh, five or six concerns about it should i just talk to mr aiken about it and wait till next week uh no no go ahead because uh, i was going to talk about capital right now i was looking at okay. our uh, operating but go ahead and start talk about capital okay um because the osceola ortona i just want to let everybody know i still prefer a k5 and we said we would revisit that and looking at all the loss of money that we've had, especially um, with our half cent sales tax revenue, I think it'd be more prudent for us to go to the K-5. There's a career center over the next year or two that would be almost 15 million. Um, with all the moving of our Title I ESE and ESOL departments into portables, I think it would be a nice idea to have an office building built for them instead. Um, there are some schools that are getting security cameras, and I'm still advocating for the last five, six years for security cameras at New Smyrna Beach High School. New Smyrna still hasn't had their, their front plastic, um, I guess, barriers that all the other schools have. New Smyrna is still not finished with theirs. It's almost done, but not. I noticed Reed Batillo had their security fence done this year, but there's no mention of any painting, duct repair. They've been waiting years for new duct work at Reed Batillo. And Spruce Creek High School was supposed to get some allocation for a new auditorium, but that was put on the back burner because their roof started leaking they still have almost the original auditorium their auditorium is a not has them just meetings high school so they're being done and i just have to advocate again it seem to be some so um i think we can redirect and save some money here and use it to to fix like the osceola ortona we can take half of that and rebuild or add Terry T. Small. So it's, uh, or McGinnis or Westside, whatever you guys want to do. But I, I just think it's not prudent at this time. If we want to take, we're, we're going to have both properties. If we want to keep one property and make it a K-5, and a couple years from now we, we're over this, and we can have more money, maybe we can build a middle school on the other property. So that's the suggestion. So I just wanted to put in my two cents for my school district to pay attention to, to some of that. I do appreciate one good thing. I'm, I'm very appreciative that Creekside Middle School has some new gutters because they're like sieves. And um, we've got too many kids who are melting up there. So thank you very much for that. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Ms. Cuthbert. Ms. Mueller, so all of us received some emails from our oversight committee. And so the last time that we met with them was what we're looking at, was this not presented to them? Yes, this was, well, this tentative budget was not presented to them. Um, we presented the Ortona Osceola that we had brought to you and we did discuss um, this. Uh, we discussed the technology, the one-to-one. -one. Of course, I know you were, you were there at the one, at the beginning of the meeting 
talking about the one-to-one. -one. So um, this specific presentation has not been presented to them, um, but we do have a meeting uh, coming up and we're working on our final, uh, our last year's report. So we have talked about these various pieces, but not specifically the tentative budget to them. W will you be able to meet with them before we meet on the 4th? Um, uh, we could try to meet, but I, I don't, we don't have anything scheduled to meet with them. Okay, can you do that? Because it's, it's really important, and I'm gonna only speak for me, that uh, that committee is aware as we talk about some of these projects. Um, and I believe all of my colleagues received emails from multiple members of that, of that committee. And so one of the reasons we put that committee in place for such a time as this. And so we really want them to have opportunity to review this before it comes to us next Tuesday mm -hmm. to get feedback and so they, that they are aware because I was a little put back when they said, well, this is not what we reviewed. And so can you please make sure you all will do, uh, actually meet with them before we meet on Tuesday? Well, we did, we did review um, the presentation with them and I think that you know Mr. I don't know if Mr. Groob is on tonight okay. um, but we talked about Ortona and Osceola and the last direction that you had given us and um, presented some other information that they had asked for so um, Deb, I, I, I am on yes yes and uh, we did present uh, to that uh, committee these the same uh, options that we presented to you individually as board members the facilities condition index uh, and, uh, and the uh, the other options that we are uh, presenting to you on the fourth so that they have seen that and had a chance to respond uh, uh, to that as well okay so again um, we did receive emails from multiple members of that committee so uh, if you want to reach out to them individually, I I'll let you handle that, Deb, but um, okay. they, they do have some questions about what we'll be reviewing tonight. Okay. Okay. Any other questions as it relates to the capital, uh, colleagues? Any, any questions? Questions? Yeah. Questions? Go uh, ahead, Mr. Madam Persis. Chair. Oh, go ahead, Ms. I'm Cuthbert. sorry. I, sp I spoke too soon. I apologize, Mr. Persis. A lot of that building um, renovations, uh, it a lot of it is being used by half cents. We don't know what you're saying, Ms. Cuthbert. You're frozen. We have to remember that. Okay, still. We can hear you now. Okay, good. I'm so sorry. I because okay. I'm not frozen here. Um, Contrary to what my husband says most of the time, <laughs> I, what, what, it's getting late. Um, what I have the the sales tax um, committee, our oversight committee, is a promise to our taxpayer. They are not a group just to be informed of what we're doing. We, it's a collaborative group. They advise us. They give us suggestions. Sometimes we follow it. Sometimes we haven't. Uh, we go to them to ask about bonding. They have supported us our last two. It's it's a good com camaraderie. It's a teamwork we have with them. And we should never, ever just say, here it is, look at it, this is what we're doing. We cannot do that. Um, we value their input entirely way too much. Yes. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I do think we should meet with them. Uh, as a group before. I want, I would like their input to, for example, the Career Center, when we have um, ATC sitting there that we didn't use and then sold at a huge um, loss of revenue to Daytona State. And it's, uh, we, we have too many other, I think, necessary um, demands for our, our half cent sales tax at this time. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. Persis, anything you want to add before we? Uh, no, ma'am. Uh, I agree with you. I, would, I wouldn't I would want to make any decisions about anything anytime soon. Uh, we got to get, we got to get some input. I, I'd like to 
make sure that the oversight committee is uh, is uh, getting the same information that we are getting and just understand the other unique issues re regarding um, all of these schools. So uh, yeah, I just assume I just assume wait. I wasn't pre prepared to tonight to make any uh, comments about Osceola or okay. Tony. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation, Ms. Mueller. And what we'll do now, uh, we'll take any calls. And after the, our calls, we'll take a break before we go into the resolutions. Uh, Ms. Schultz, do we have any calls as relates to the tentative budget? No callers at this time. No callers at this time? Okay. It is 814. We will break until 830. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> Your pass. Sorry, we took a little longer than eight, six minutes past time, so uh, we do apologize. So we're moving forward with our agenda. So we're moving to agenda item number 16.01, um, resolution number 2020-24, Superintendent Vagabin. Yes, Madam Chair, board members. I recommend approval of resolution number 2020-2024, of the School Board of Volusia County, Florida, levying the tentative ad valorem property tax mileage rate for discretionary operating, operational operating for the general fund discretion, district discretionary local capital improvement for the capital funds and debt service for the district debt service funds on all taxable property within Volusia County, Florida for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2020 and ending June 1st, 2020. And I think Deb has to read that yes, resolution. Thank you. School Board of Volusia County, Florida, resolution number 2020-24, a resolution of the School Board of Volusia County, Florida, levying the tentative ad valorem property tax millage rate for 2020-2021, required local effort, required local effort prior period adjustment, discretionary operating, additional operating for the general fund and district discretionary local capital improvement for the capital funds and debt service for the district debt service funds on all taxable property within Volusia County, Florida for the fiscal year beginning July 1st, 2020 and ending June 30th, 2021. Stating the percentage by which the millage to be levied is higher than the rolled back rate repealing all resolutions in conflict therewith, providing for severabil severability, pro providing for an effective date. Whereas the School Board of Volusia County, Florida is authorized under the Constitution and laws of Florida to levy a tax upon non-exempt real property lying and situated in Volusia County, Florida for public school purposes. And <clears throat> whereas the required public notice has been given and the public has been given an opportunity to be heard and to ask questions concerning <clears throat> the tentative millage rate for the 2021 fiscal year. And whereas all matters required by law pursuant to the adoption of the tentative millage rate for 2020-2021 have been accomplished. Now therefore, be it resolved be it resolved <clears throat> excuse me, by the school board of Volusia County, Florida in official session duly assembled in Deland, Florida this 28th day of July, 2020 as follows. One, that the following millage rates be tentatively adopted for potential levy, levy upon all taxable real property lying and situation, situated in Volusia County, Florida for the 2020-2021 fiscal year a, for the required local effort, 3.651. B, for the required local effort, prior period adjustment, 0.008. C, for the discretionary operating effort, 0.748. D, for discretionary local capital improvement, 1.500. <clears throat> B, for the debt service, zero. Total millage rate, 5.907. The total millage rate for fiscal year 2020-2021 of 5.907 mills as calculated excluding debt service rate of zero is 3.33% higher than the rolled back rate of 5.7169 mills computed pursuant to section 200.0651 uh, <clears throat> Florida statute. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've heard uh, the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. The motion was made by 
Mr. Colon, second by Mr. Persis. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I will call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes. And Ida Wright, yes. Thank you, colleagues. Moving down to item 16.03, I mean 16.02. Resolution number 2020-25, Superintendent Bagelman. Yes, Madam Chair. I recommend approval of the resolution number 2020-2025 of the School Board of Volusia County, Florida, adopting the tentative budget for fiscal year 2020-2021 for the general fund, capital funds, special revenue funds, other funds, and internal service funds. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mueller? Yes, School Board of Volusia County, Florida, resolution number 2020-25, a resolution of the School Board of Volusia County, Florida, adopting the tentative budget for the fiscal year 2020-2021 for the General Fund, Capital Projects Fund, Debt Service Fund, Special Revenue Food Service Fund, Special Revenue Other Fund, and Internal Service Fund of the School Board of Volusia County, Florida repealing all resolutions in conflict therewith, providing for severability, providing for an effective date. Whereas the School Board of Volusia County, Florida is authorized under the Constitution and laws of Florida to levy a tax upon non-exempt real property lying and situated in Volusia County, Florida for public school purposes and adoption of a tentative budget. And whereas the required public notice has been given and the public has been given an opportunity to be heard and to ask questions regarding the tentative budget for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. And whereas all matters required by law pursuant to the adoption of the tentative budget for 2020-2021 have been satisfied. Now, be it, now therefore be it resolved that the School Board of Volusia County, Florida hereby adopts the tentative budget which contains the following funds and appropriations for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. <clears throat> General Operating Fund Appropriation $538,806,459. Capital Projects $261,612,447. That service $47,842,753. Special Revenue Food, $37,615,237. Special Revenue Other, $44,648,777. And Internal Service, $13,265,391 for a total of $943,791,064. Thank you, Ms. Mueller. You've heard the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion? So moved. Carl, Carl can have Second. It. Motion was made by Mr. Percy, seconded by Ms. Haynes. Any discussion? Just want to make a statement. Mm -hmm. Uh, so everyone understands that the items as it relates to this resolution, if we need to update or change where the funds are allocated, we would do that uh, between now and September's meeting. Okay. But we have to get this submitted. So I just want everybody to understand that, yeah. you know, give our chance for our um, half cent sale tax committee to review that budget as well. Any other comments, concerns? Hearing none, I'll call for the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yes. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? A lot of money to spend, but yes. <laughs> and Ida Wright, yes. Thank you. And the vote uh, passed unanimously. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you. Moving down to item 16.03, uh, policy 2.08E and OAS student code of conduct. Superintendent Bagelman. Yes, yes, Madam Chair, board members, I would like to call Ms. Rose Rowland who work on these amendments with her team. And there are five amendments that she will present to us tonight for a code of conduct as it relates to these two, to the policy 208E and policy 208S. Ms. Rowland. 
And good evening, Chairwoman Wright, school board members, and interim superintendent, Dr. Balgobin. Tonight, I'm gonna to present revisions to our school board policy 208E and 208S, the student code of conduct. The first one is jurisdictional control in the event the conduct of students is deemed to have a detrimental effect on the health, safety, and welfare of any member of the school community. This deals with students that are not necessarily under our control at a school, but if they um, put speech Detrimental speech on social media. If they're at home, the school can um, administer discipline to that child when they return if it has a substantial disruption on the campus once they return or while they're off the campus. We do have where we can actually discipline that child once they return to our campus. If it disrupts school's activity or if it causes a safety hazard for anyone at the school. The second one is, um, it comes on the right to free speech. Um, where we're adding the addition of Confederate flags as a violation on campus. Um, it falls under whether it's being worn on clothing or on the premises of a school. So we've added that as a violation as well. They are, Confederate flags are not allowed on our campuses. Um, the next one is disorderly conduct as a possible one year calendar year expulsion. Recommendation may not happen, we're gonna recommend that because police involvement is usually involved when a child is charged with disorderly conduct. Um, expulsion can be recommended at that point for that offense. Um, we also recommended that um, expulsion of firearms uh, um, shall be conducted for, for no less than one calendar year. So if a child gets in trouble, has a weapon on campus, a gun, we'll recommend that that child is not on a regular school campus for one full year, unless a re superintendent recommends other, something other than that. And we also moved hitting and striking from level two to level three. And also we moved assault and battery on the student from level three to level four. And as a result, um, we're gonna add a tobacco online course for any student that is caught with tobacco um, because of the vaping that is happening more rapidly on our campuses. So we added a tobacco course to educate the students how dangerous tobacco products are for them. And that's all I have for tonight. Any questions? Thank you, Ms. Rowland. Colleagues, yeah. do you have any questions? Yes, I do. Go, um, go right ahead. Good evening, Ms. Rowland. Um, you said about Confederate flags. Um, is that the flag itself, or is it maybe the image that might be on a belt buckle or on a shirt or on a hat? Yeah, it includes um, hats and clothing, anything at all. Um, it is not allowed in our camps. It's already in the code of conduct for the clothing. Mm -hmm. We just add in the Confederate flag. Okay, the flag itself. All right. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, go ahead, Mr. Colon. So when we talk about out of campus <clears throat> discipline, so if a child, uh, well, give me an example of what that would be, and and I'm curious to see how that would run into the free speech side of it. Um, what's an example of that? Well, Ted Doran actually helped with this research and it talks about um, if Volusia County Schools could, could discipline a student for speech on social media. And it says, yes, um, the student must, speech must materially and substantially disrupt a uh, reasonably forecast disruption to school activities. For instance, some of the postings that were uh, placed when this, these events start happening, these protests start happening, um, New Smyrna had a child that posted, made a post and it got like 12,000 retweets. And the schools had to put automatic messages on their voicemail because they were getting so many phone calls. It's just fortunate that we weren't in school at the time because otherwise when the kids had been on campus, it would have created a, a huge disruption on that campus. So if a student, um, is, if it's verbal, written or gesture, um, we do have jurisdiction to punish that kid once it comes back on campus or discipline that child. Okay, um, that's the only question I have for now. Okay. Um, any other questions? Mr. Persis, Ms. Haynes? I, Madam Chair? Yes. I, I, was, uh, I was curious, do we, uh, do we ban the uh, Nazi flag, the SWAT sticker? Flag. I haven't experienced that, Mr. Person, but I'm sure it will fall under the, um, 
the same uh, the, uh, the, under the statute we got in for the Confederate flag as well. Anything that's offensive, um, we can ban from the campus. So uh, if it, uh, what is it? If it's deemed to cause uh, incitement or something that causes a uh, disorderly event at the school? Yes, on page nine of our code of conduct, it's um, item number 51, it says profane, obscene, or verbal language, in expression, any language, either verbal, written, or by gesture, which is disruptive and or offends individuals or groups and violates the norms of the school and community. So it's kind of covered in that uh, number 51 on page nine. Yeah, I see that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Haynes, go right ahead. Thank you, Ms. Rowland. I was happy to hear that you've added the tobacco course because we do have a large number of students that are vaping. So I appreciate that they're going to have to do a course with that. And um, Mr. Persis, I believe why um, we have the Confederate flag there, it goes back to the incident that happened many years ago at Pine Ridge High over a Confederate flag. And I think that's how the Confederate flag piece got um, you know, spelled out in the policy, but Ms. Roland, I also appreciate that some of the activities you have increased the level of severity if um, you know they do those items, and so I support that and thank you for doing that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments, colleagues? So, Ms. Roland, I do have a question. So, when you say striking or hitting. Um, and, and we're, we're asked this question all the time. If a child is defending him or herself, then the penalty appears to be the same for both children. Is that the case? In most cases it is because, you know, when you get two children that get into an incident, each person is gonna say the other person started. So if you don't have any concrete witnesses that you can, you know, determine who started and who did not start it, both parties do get the same consequence. And most times we tell the kids, when I was at school, we told the kids, there's no self-defense policy. You, you, you need to find an adult. Okay. Okay. Thank you, ma'am. You answered my questions. Any other questions, colleagues? Hearing none, um, is there a recommendation? Superintendent Bagelman? Yes, yes, Madam Chair. I recommend approval. I recommend approval of the emergency adoption of the proposed amendments to the school board policy 208E and 208S on the student code of student conduct. Thank you. You've heard the superintendent's recommendation. Is there a motion? Yeah. Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Okay. Madam Chair, I move that we adopt a new policy, emergency policy for uh, to add to our um, discipline code. Uh, 208E and 208S. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. The motion was made by Mrs. Cuthbert, second by Mr. Persis. Any other discussion? Hearing none, I'll call the vote. Mr. Ruben Colon? Yay. Ms. Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes. And Ida Wright? Yes. Thank you. And, and I do have to apologize. Kelly, did we have any calls for that action item? No, we did not. Okay, thank you. Moving down to item 16.04, uh, mandatory face covering. Superintendent Bagelman. Yes, Madam Chair. I would like to ask Mr. Kevin Pendley, our general counsel. He already uh, presented on this last week, and there, the board has asked Mr. Pendley to go back and do some minimal revisions, and he's ready to present those revisions to the board tonight. Mr. Pendley. Thank you, Dr. Balgobin, Madam Chair, members of the board. Um, we are bringing back tonight the emergency uh, policy for mandatory face coverings in schools pursuant to the emergency order of the Department of Education as it relates to the COVID-19 emergency. Uh, pursuant to the board's concerns expressed at the last meeting uh, as it relates to the 
uh, supply of the face mask and shields as it relates to the uh, disciplinary consequences for students under section E of the policy. Uh, we made revisions according to the consensus of the board at that time to section D by adding to the extent possible to the uh, provisions for supplying students with mask and shield. Uh, you'll see that reflected on page two. In section E, as to discipline, we added the sentence, a student's willful refusal to comply with the terms of this policy will be addressed consistent with the student code of conduct. If we go to page two, you'll see both of those revisions there in uh, sections D and E. And then uh, we would also call to the board's attention the uh, emergency policy effective date that's required for paragraph F. Uh, if it's the board's pleasure to move forward with this policy, it would be necessary to establish an effective date. So <clears throat> are there any questions that I can address? Thank you, colleagues. Do you have any questions for Mr. Penley? Yes, I do. Go right ahead, Ms. Cuthbert. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> in, in D, when it says the, um, it's going to the uh, willful, the student willful disobedience or noncompliance of wearing it will refer to the code of conduct. However, what, what level of severity will that be? So when you have a, an AP in charge of discipline or a principal, I think it should be countywide equitable so that uh, if this occurs, especially to a student, I think they need to know what's coming up. In other words, is that a level three? To me, that's, you know, that's a defiance of authority, um, a disorderly conduct. Um, that's on page five of 23. It could be uh, insubordination, defiance of authority, and that's a level three um, uh, discipline code. And that has a certain level of a variety of, um, I guess, of consequences. You know, there's the level of what level it is. And then it, what's nice in the code of conduct, it tells you uh, what could happen and then the various different ways you could resolve the situation. So that's where you've got the choice to do it. But I think we need to establish the level. It doesn't necessarily mean, I guess, it has to be in this policy. But as long as our administrators know exactly what it is, this has to be very clear since this is such a controversial topic. Um, it, it, they need to know what part of the student conduct this misbehavior attributes itself to. Ms. Cuthbert, what I may do, oh, see, this is Rose Rowland. Um, Hi, Rose. What we can do is have further discussion um, with another, get a team together and kind of discuss what the consequences kind of may need to be for those kids that um, are not compliant. Um, because, and like he said, it's a health issue, but it does become insubordination once they continue to do it on a daily basis. So I would like to get with some principals and some of the other school-based administrators to see what they're thinking because they have to deal with it. So I think they need to have some input as to what we um, do decide to do with this one. So if you can give us that chance, I'd like to do that if possible. Oh, certainly, and have Chief Newman involved in that as well. Okay. Um, I'd like to, to know from her point of view as well. But whatever you guys decide, all I'm asking is that there's a clear avenue of if this happens, therefore we do this. I would hate for one school do one thing and something for another. And it also should be different by, by elementary, middle school, and high school. I would think there should be a, a different interpretation of it. You know, that's up to all of them, but I would hate for a kindergartner to be under the same penalty as a junior in high school. But that's that's all up to you. But um, but as long as there's a clear avenue of of what to do. Okay. Now the are you okay with that? I am perfectly fine with that, Ms. Rowland. I was thinking along the same lines with right. Chief Newman and our uh, We'll get that together. I am sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. And let us know, too, what you decide. 
because we I'm sure we'll, we'll hear about it. We will. <laughs> Ms. Kupfer, <laughs> I was speaking while I was on mute. I apologize. Ms. It's Roland, okay. I am in full agreement. I'm echoing again. Um, I, I do believe that we need to include uh, Chief Newman, have her involved and, and representative from each um, level okay. as we come yeah. up with very concrete a very concrete description of what that would look like because you're absolutely right we will need to provide clarity and train right. our administrators and teachers accordingly. Okay. Yeah, uniformity so everybody right. knows what to do and that way um, if, a, if a teacher or administrator is not doing it then there's something specific to address yes it's that One ambiguity that we get into trouble I agree once we have it cl uh, clarity to the infractions, then we will train our administrators accordingly. And Thank teachers. you very much. You're Thank welcome. you, Madam Chair. You're welcome, Mrs. Cuthbert. Uh, you have, go ahead, Mr. Colon. All right, and so in the first section up here, it says, um, where social distancing guidelines from the center of, of CDC cannot be maintained. What exactly does that mean? Is that six feet? Is that four feet? Is that three feet? And so um, I think that we default to six, um, but I did have some parents reach out and say, well, why are they saying four? And so I think that it really needs to be spelled out when six feet because that's the current guideline. This is only good for 90 days. That's number one. And then the second part of, I'm still having a hard time with the discipline portion because if we don't have a policy that requires them to wear the mask, then what are they being insubordinate about? I, I just don't see, and what I'm afraid of is sort of what Ms. Cuthbert said, everybody's going to interpret that different. You walk up to one child and you say, you know, where, you know, son, you gotta have your mask on. And that student may say, oh, I forgot it, let me go get it. Where another student may say, I don't wanna wear the mask. And so there is no actual, I don't, I don't understand what there, it becomes insubordination, although if they are very proper and not defiant about it, then what policy are they breaking? I don't see that. And so in the same fashion, I think, you know, it would be one thing to say, hey, you know, the first time uh, that this is addressed with you, you get a warning the second time, but to open up the whole code of conduct to interpretation, I think it's gonna allow for, um, very, oh, hello, that's loud, uh, unequal uh, discipline for our students. And so I think, again, I go back to that. I think that there's enough outs here that a student can say, I have asthma, um, especially, you know, if we want to avoid having all these 504s to do, um, which would take forever. Um, or a child can say, you know what, I'm socially distant from everybody. I'm six feet away. What do you want me to put a mask on? Or they could, you know, we've heard from teachers that said, I am diabetic and my kids in my class are going to wear a mask all the time. Even if they could social distance. And so I think part of our issue, again, is that we have a policy for adults and children all written to one. Uh, we can't speak to elementary the same way we speak to middle school, high school visitors, vendors, et cetera. Um, and so I think this is, um, and I'll say it again, I don't think this is going to help the situation. Um, but that's just me. I mean, I, I just, I think that there is not, I, I just don't see what the student is going to get in trouble for not doing if they say, I don't want to wear a mask. And they say it politely and they're not rude and they say, I have asthma. And so that teacher who feels that her life is being put in danger because the child is not wearing a mask, I, I don't see the defiance. Maybe somebody can explain that to me. So Mr. Colon, you, you made some very good points and a couple of things I'd like to clarify. Once we get the numbers of students that will be enrolling for each option, one of the first things that we will be doing, like say, let's say it's a traditional setting that we're talking about here. 
And as we look at the roster of those students for a particular school, XYZ school, we are going to be looking at all those students that may miss, need accommodations, right? And once we look at those students that may need accommodation, it will be on a case-by-case -case scenario. We will look up what their needs are and make sure that those adjustments are made. Administrators will be involved in the process. Teachers will be involved in the process. So we're going to be looking for those students that have extenuating circumstances and ensuring that those accommodations are in place. I believe what we're talking about here, if you have a student that willfully disregards the safety of other children and gets involved into a altercation that may impact another student or his, you know, other students or a student um, becoming possibly injured or really willfully putting that other student at risk. That's where Ms. Rowland on her team would look at what, what that disciplinary uh, procedure would look like and then we will obviously train our administrators and teachers on that process. But in, in terms of ensuring that our students that have exceptionalities or that have extenuating circumstances, ensuring that we're meeting those accommodations, that's one of the first things that will take place once we have numbers identified by schools. So that will um, solve that issue that you were talking about, right? Somewhat with the students with extenuating circumstances. So, so if I may, so I walk into class, the teacher says, Mr. Rubin, you need to put on a mask. And I say, good morning, Madam Teacher. I would, like no, I would not like to wear a mask today. And I'm not being disruptive. I'm not being disrespectful. I'm not being defiant because there's really no policy that says I have to wear a mask. It's really a health policy. It's not a disciplinary policy and so what I'm afraid of is that it's going to escalate and now I'm going to be suspended for creating an alter for, for defiance which if you look at where that falls into the code of conduct it does it can carry suspension and so for our teachers who are frightened because they are okay I just don't see how we're going to differentiate what somebody's respectfully saying. I don't want to wear a mask. And, and, and what you're saying there, if a student comes in and say, I don't want to wear a mask, that's not something that's at that point in time, if the student has not had contact with other students, right? They're just walking into the classroom. That would be a situation where the teacher, if I was a teacher, and this would be part of all that training that would be taking place for the two, four, four weeks that we will have. Um, they will call an administrator or someone to go and assist, get that student, have a conversation. So as Ms. Rowland and the team, they get together for each division, elementary, middle, and high, and obtain the input, we will be thinking of all these possible scenarios that could occur. And this is not, will not be put into place just to uh, penalize a student just for the sake of. It will have to be really where there's something warranted right where it's jeopardizing that student's safety or the safety of others maybe physically or from a health standpoint and so that's subjective and i think that we get in trouble when it's subjective i think that um you know you may have a teacher who is diabetic who is scared for her life and a child that in one classroom something may be acceptable it's not acceptable in the other and so what I am, and, and I'll go back to this, is if if we would consider separating the two, then we could say, you know, first time it's a warning, second time it's this, third time it's that. Now, that takes care of the mask part. If we go into the discipline part, now there being a disruption, that's a whole different set of but we will have children. I mean, this is a movement in our state right now. We've got state representatives that are going through suing every county for their mask ordinances. And so we are going to have families that fundamentally believe that we are impeding on their constitutional right, that we are um, making them wear masks. There's lots of misinformation on masks out there, whether it's accurate or not and so we are going to have students who are going to come to school and they're going to be very respectful um, and they're going to say sorry ma'am i would not like to wear a mask 
and I don't see where they're being defiant. I mean, there's quite frankly, they're just saying, I don't want to wear it. And so I think that's going to put our teachers in a really bad place. And I don't see how this is going to be effective other than the folks who want to keep their fellow man safe and believe, you know, the rule followers are going to follow the rules. This is not, we don't create policies for rule followers. Yeah. And so if we don't define what the consequence will be in a more clear fashion, I can tell you there are kids that you're going to say, put on your mask and they're going to say something you don't want them to say. There's going to be other kids who say, yes, ma'am. And that's what I'm afraid of because they both did the same exact thing, mm -hmm. but the consequence will be subjective. So that I'm, that's... Thank you for making that point. And I know that Ms. Rowland is making notes of that because they will be discussing all those scenarios as they come up with procedures. We'll consider it. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Hello, Dr. Balgobin. Yes, ma'am. Go, go ahead, uh, Mr. Penley. Thank you, Madam Chair. I was just going to add, keep, please keep in mind we're talking about this policy, that the way that it's drafted, it's a health, safety, and welfare policy that applies not just to students. It applies to staff. It applies to vendors. It applies to visitors coming on campus, just like we have visitor policies that relate to health, safety, and welfare across the board. So this is not just a student policy. Um, and it is, it, going back to what, the way that it was drafted and what we talked about last week, this is a mandatory policy requiring a face covering where students, staff, visitors cannot maintain safe social distancing guidelines. The reason that it references the CDC guideline as you brought up originally, Mr. Colon, is because the CDC, as we know, continues to change that. It's a to use Dr. Balgobin's term, fluid situation, right? So as, as it changes, and it may have changed today or, or might change tomorrow, in terms of what that four, three, six foot range is, we didn't want to lock into your policy what that was uh, because it's subject to change. And also keep in mind that your policies are not your procedures. You don't include procedures with your policies. So these have to cover a broad range of you know, what might happen. The board is simply authorizing the superintendent and the administration, the teachers and the district to implement health, safety and welfare guidelines on the campuses so that we can keep everyone as safe as possible. So I, I understand and I, I, I your comments are, are absolutely spot on and Dr. Rowland can address those uh, with, with the procedures as to how these are implemented and as to Ms. Cuthbert's comments concerning consistency and application, that's why we have the, the built-in time to train staff as to how we're gonna do this. This is part of the rollout for a safe reopening of schools. So we wanna have the flexibility, again, the fluidity in the plan to go about making this part and parcel of the entire uh, safety component as we bring students back to brick and mortar. So those things will be addressed in training and it will be a broader uh, application than just to students. Thank so, you, Madam Chair. Madam Chair, if I may. So, okay, so this is for teachers. So I am a teacher who believes that this is impeding on my constitutional rights uh, to have to wear a mask. What will the consequences be on the HR front? Is that defined? Well, so far as to constitutional challenges, in uh, Broward and in Leon counties, the Second Circuit and I believe the Eleventh Circuit have both said that this is not uh, mask policies uh, as brought by counties have specifically been defined as not being a constitutional impediment. Co correct. So, but if I'm a teacher and I say I don't want to wear a mask, now I'm going to go to professional standards because one teacher is going to say this teacher is endangering the health and safety of all of us that walk into the front office, okay, what do those consequences look like? Again, through your practices and your policies, you're, you're going to be implementing through your procedures how those are addressed, and that would have to be done through your HR department. Okay, so I'd like to, um, again, I, I, 
I'm trying to make I'm trying to make this less subjective and more objective so that we can have that continuity because you know I'll give you an example today I went to the gas station and you know I've got a masks to wear I made it to the door and realized oh man I don't have my mask on okay arguably I went from my car to the front door I'm praying that nobody saw me or took a picture of me not wearing a mask because that'll make it on the front page of the news journal. That's just the way that it goes, okay? And so, you know, it was inadvertent. However, if Jamie sees me without a mask, she can tell my principal, look, Ruben wasn't wearing a mask. And now I'm going to professional standards for I don't know what. And again, I don't think we've defined that, but I'm, I'm Good. Thank you. I, I... Madam Chair? Go ahead, Mr. Penley. Oh, no, I was just going to say, keep in mind that there is the social distancing requirement. So it's mandatory only where you're within six feet, if you will, three to six feet, if you follow CDC current guidelines of another person. So by going into the gas station, if you were within a crowded situation, that might be different. So is it okay. three or is it six? The CDC would say four to six. So it went up just now. This is, this is the point I'm getting at is, unless we are clear that six feet is six feet, we just we just went from three to six to four to six to unless we are clear we're going to set our teachers up to fail because the student can say i was four feet away not six feet away and now you've got no basis because we don't know what six feet looks like thank you miss cuthbert um I, I, I might have oh thank you i might have a, a just a small uh, solution all secondary students wear um, a lanyard. You can, when you when they get their pictures taken for their IDs, if they have an excuse from a doctor because of asthma, for example, that can be on their lanyard. That can be added to their ID. So it can be checked immediately. Any teacher, any administrator can check their health on their ID. Also, isn't it on focus? that when you look at, when you do attendance, isn't there a, a red cross? You can put it in there as well so teachers can check when they do their attendance. So that will cover uh, a couple of things. But um, when it's gonna be difficult to keep measuring feet. Um, I just think ma masks should be worn all the time uh, because it has been proven that our droplets do travel 15 feet. At the, at the max so there, there there could be additional trouble but that should help with the lanyards and with that red cross that would help teachers so thank you very much madam chair thank you miss haynes i've read the policy um mr penley listened and made some of the changes that we asked for I'm fine at this time. Thank you. Mr. Persis? Well, I, I think that uh, a lot of what uh, Mr. Cologne said is, uh, is, uh, is spot on. And, um, you know, as a former principal, uh, what you learn is that uh, from that first day of school, from that first minutes of the day, of the first day of school, uh, ev everybody uh, has to be on the same page at that school and the whole staff, uh, they have to know what the school rules are and uh, that we are gonna enforce these rules and they have to all be on the same, the same page uh, and so this training that the district is going to go through with the principals and the, and the assistant principals, uh, that certainly will need to be discussed with all of the teachers too, because uh, uh, 
you just can't have teachers, uh, one doing one thing and one doing another thing, because um, uh, that word will get uh, spread around uh, very, very quickly. Uh, and uh, th this goes back to, you can have a school rule uh, where students aren't allowed to chew gum and you have teachers A, B, and C, well, they can chew it in my class, but they can't chew it in te teachers D and E. See, that just goes to just be, uh, to just dethrone everything and to make uh, chaos. And so before you know it, everyone's chewing, chewing gum. Um, and so this is gonna be uh, uh, really important to get that school Whatever each each school started out right. Conversations with the faculty go through a lot of what ifs, what ifs, what what, what ifs. You know, sometimes <laughs> you 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 just can't print common sense. I mean, the 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 punishment has has to fit the crime. It has to fit the age of the of the student. It has to fit the consequence. You know, this is when you're relying on adults to use proper proper judgment, and 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 sometimes you know some adults have better judgment on things than than others, and you can't teach that sometimes. So that's why you have got to have uh, conversations about this, because as as Mr. Cologne said. Uh, you're going to have teachers that don't feel like they should wear a mask. And you'll have some, some teachers who will probably wear seven. I mean, you know, that's the way it, it is out there right now. I do have a feeling, though, that um, um, the vast majority, uh, way more than that, uh, of, of the parents who will be sending their kids to brick and mortar uh, will be supportive of their children wearing masks. Uh, I, I think that's going to be the case. I don't think this is going to be as as hard as uh, as enforcing the dress code. I mean, I, I think this will be a, a, a little bit easier, but we have to start out right, and we got to be can consistent in doing that. And it, it may be, Dr. Balgobin, that you've got to go through with the principals, you know, first time, second time, third time, you know, these are the logical co uh, consequences, contacting the parent and making sure it's not in any kind of economic issue uh, because the situation is, is that these masks are supposed to be uh, washed uh, every night, uh, these masks are not as effective as, as we all know, when they get wet. And so those, it's, it's not just wearing the mask, but it's how to wear the mask. I think teachers need to take time showing them, okay, let's all get out our mask, you know, first day. Let's make, let me show you how I put it on. Let me show you how I take it off. Let me show you how we keep it clean. You know, you have to go through it as if it was their first time seeing a mask and, and start like everyone is in kindergarten. That's always the best, the best way. Never assume anything and just teach them and, and the teacher models it for them. And, and I think that a wise teacher, and I think all my teachers are pretty wise, uh, would, would have breaks within the day uh, when you don't have to wear your mask and have that social distancing built in to say, okay, you over here, you, you can take your mask off now. You people over here, keep your mask on because we're gonna go over here. You know what I'm saying? There are, teachers will, will know how to do it in their rooms if we as district staff train our principals and assistant principals to help train, uh, to help uh, give the teachers the guidance that they need. I'm just hoping, and this will be much easier for us if when, when school starts, uh, uh, that in, in each classroom, you know, if we just have half as many students in the room, 
that would probably normally be there. Uh, it, it'll be it, it'll be easier for the uh, for the uh, teacher uh, to give those breaks and, and so on. But I I I I do think it's. I do think it's something that we should do. I, I absolutely agree. I wear my mask, Ruben. You'd be proud of me. I wear that mask almost to bed, almost to bed, but um, not there. But I, I, uh, I do wear it, and I think it is the right thing to uh, the right thing to do. And um, I think we cannot expect the community at large to all start wearing their mask and then when when school starts uh, you know not being able to have that kind of a policy so uh, I'm in favor of the policy whether it'll need to be tweaked after you meet with the principals and so forth and have some um, you know really thorough talks about the practicality of doing this, uh, what issues may may come up, um, uh, you know, that's fine. But uh, I think what what I wanted to get through was uh, I'm I'm glad we have we do have some some teeth to it, and I like how we're not just singling out students. I think that that uh, bears bears well uh, for for us that. Uh, Look, I'm not asking you to do something that I'm not doing. You know, the middle school students are always big on that. You know, you don't have to do that. How come I? Have? Well, I'm wearing a mask. You're wearing a mask. The secretary's wearing a mask. The principal's wearing a mask. Any visitor on our campus wears a mask. You know, we're not being unfair. We're trying to be. We're trying to be fair to everyone, so everyone can stay healthy. I think we just have so much going for us on this, but again, got to be able to do it correctly and uh, be con consistent in the way we respond when a student uh, chooses perhaps not to wear one or doesn't have one to Ruben's point. So yeah, I, I think we can make this work. but it's it's gonna take it's gonna take some real due diligence and consistency on everyone's part. Finish, Mr. Person? Yes, ma'am. OK, all right. Um, thank you, colleagues. Uh, any other conversation? So uh, go ahead, Ms. Uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Penley was asking for a date. Is it all right if Dr. Balgovin um, arranges that since you know, teachers come on the 17th, but yet there's going to be activities the 1st of August, I'm sure, or August 3rd. So is it all right if we leave it up to her to decide when that date should be, or is that our decision? Um, and teachers come back on the 11th, not the, the 17th. 11th? Okay, yes. the 11th, okay. The 11th. But see, mm -hmm. yeah, and a lot of times kids come up and pick up their schedules beforehand. Parents want a tour. So um, is August third? That's Monday. So I, you know, I like her that's a, that's, input. That is open for discussion. Um, okay. What What do you all? What would, What is your preference? So, I, Madam Chair, I've heard from uh, folks that are at the school level right now that uh, there are folks that are walking around aren't necessarily always wearing a mask, and that's made them uncomfortable. So. Um, I, I'm okay with as soon as possible, uh, realizing that we may have to, because of the 90 days, we may have to address it at an earlier meeting before the 90 days come up to expire. Um, I think this is important. I think this is something that, again, I've gotten calls from schools saying, you know, nobody's wearing a mask. Some people wear it sometimes. Sometimes they don't wear it, you know. Um, so I think as soon as possible would be a plus providing the, the supplies are there. If they're not, then we can shoot for Monday and to make sure everybody has enough supplies. But uh, as soon as possible, I would say. And then there's Ted's hand up. Uh, just just a minute, Mr. Doran. Um, any thought on that? A date? Don't care? I... I was just thinking, I mean, if, 
it's covering adults and students. I was thinking August 11th. I wasn't thinking about the group that's already back. And but it includes vendors too. So yeah. So we gotta be mindful. Go ahead, Mr. Dorian. Then I'll come back to uh, Mr. Persis or Ms. Cuthbert if they have something. Uh, thank you, Chairman. I I, I just uh, would like for Mr. Penley, uh, or I can do it, to talk a little bit about what it means to be passing an emergency rule and the 90-day component of that and what it means going forward past the 90 days because what would I'll, I'll let him address that if, if it's okay with you uh, chairman right because there's yeah there's, that's fine it's, it's pretty obvious there's confusion about what we're going to be doing moving forward we can't wait till 90 days pass and then decide what we're going to do next this is a stopgap on a basis to set us up to actually go through the rulemaking process to put this in place on a more permanent basis. So you're going to be seeing this, Mr. Penley, what, in 30 days or less? I mean, we're going to start advertising. You're going to have, to have a vote on, you know, like we do any rulemaking. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Penley. No. Again. Mr. Doran doesn't need my, my assistance with this. I concur in everything he said. That's exactly right. The purpose under Chapter 120 of having an emergency exception to the rulemaking process, which is what this is uh, bringing forth an emergency rule allows you to do, is to then use those 90 days to go through the rulemaking procedures that you normally would for any other policy. And we can certainly, if it's again, if it's the board's pleasure to invoke a policy on an emergency basis, we would then take uh, the necessary steps to bring uh, the workshopping and, and getting uh, public input into uh, the specifics of a, a further permanent policy that you would then incorporate in your uh, policies and procedures manual. Okay, thank you. Anything else, Mr. Doran, you wanted to add? No, other than the fact that I just understand if you put this policy in place, it obviously can be repealed at some point in the future. Uh, I don't think anybody expects to be wearing masks two years from now, God forbid, but, you know, we will have to start that process. Okay, thank you. That That's a, a good information. Uh, Mr. Persis or Ms. Cuthbert, uh, do you have a date in mind that you would like to see this emergency policy go into effect? Uh, Madam Chair, I think Monday, August 3rd. Okay. Mr. Persis, do you concur? I do. Okay. Um, so based on the policy, and, and I, I want to go back because I always want to make sure I understand my colleagues. So I'm, I'm, Mr. Cologne, I'm trying to understand what is your concern because in A, it says anyone everybody must wear a, a face covering, student employees, visitors, vendors, and any other person while on school board property, uh, where social distancing guidelines, the CDC, cannot be maintained. Should we put this, uh, uh, where is it that you want teeth? That's what I, I'm, I'm missing. So this is a health and well, what did uh, Mr. Penley call it? A health and wellness policy. This is not a disciplinary policy. Okay. And so we define that it's not a disciplinary policy. However, the encounter with the teacher who is, you know, and, and I'll say this, some of our teachers are scared for their life. So they're not going to be rational in that very moment when they're saying to that student, you need to put your mask on. And so then we're taking it and we're saying, okay, this is not a disciplinary policy, but the minute the student says, respectfully ma'am I don't want to wear a mask I don't think it's good for me okay we're gonna take that kid for insubordination which takes it to a level of discipline that may not be I hear an echo that may not be um, what it was at the time and so I don't want to see this become this incredibly punitive thing but I can tell you you know, if I was in seventh grade and, and I didn't want to wear a mask and a teacher came to me and said that, I probably would have been not very nice. And now I'm getting in trouble. So the kid that says very nicely, I would not like to wear a mask, I have six feet distance, is going to, you know, both kids are going to get treated differently. 
because one's going to get written up for insubordination. And I think there is, I think he mentioned several things that could happen that could take it to a level of discipline. And I don't think that's going to be equitably um, put out there. It's going to, you know, you're, some kids are going to be very respectful. And I don't even know what policy they're breaking, the health and wellness one, which we're saying is not a disciplinary policy. So that that's where I'm having a hard time. And, and I, I just, you know, is it four feet? Is it six feet? That's subjective. Your concern is more so with item E, the discipline. Item E and the first line where we're not defining what social distancing is. I think that's gonna be subjective. For a teacher, three feet may be way too close in their comfort zone. However, that wouldn't be an infraction. Okay. So, so let's a answer some questions. So if I'm not mistaken, we are going to have markings, hallway, classroom, that kind of identify, and they're all going to be for six feet. Am I correct? Correct. We're going to... Physically, um, part of this whole uh, getting ready for reopening will be that administer as they're in their workshops right now, what they're doing, they're looking at their plans. That's right. Can you show that, Ms. Haynes? These were ordered for our schools. We will start in the classrooms by taking out excessive furniture the, from the classroom and uh, redesigning the classroom to ensure that there is social distancing taking place. In the hallways, we will put signs up in the hallways. At the multiple entry points in the morning as students are coming in, there will be multiple entry points with supervision in place as these students are, are walked to class. We will have videos um, that will be part of our training for administrators, for teachers, for students. We will have uh, visuals up in the classrooms. We will have, as you know, the face, the, the, the shield or mask. And we really, Mr. Colon, we don't want this to become a disciplinary issue. And that is why Mr. Pendley indicated that this is more of a policy regarding health and safety and wellness of our staff and students. So for example, if we do have that student that were to show up one day in the classroom, and, and these are the discussions that we will have with principals to ensure, like as Ms. Cutberg said, consistency across, right? And the student said, well, you know, ma'am, I don't feel like wearing a mask today. That, you know, if, you, if you're looking, that might be a warning to the point where, you know what, okay, let's, let's come to the office, someone come and get that student. Let's have a conversation. Why, why, would you, why you don't want to wear a mask today? Have a conversation with that student. It may need where, depending on what that com comes out from that conversation, the parent would be contacted. But it's, this is not meant to be punitive to our students or staff but we really want to educate about their safety and the safety of others and, and, and implement these measures and safe guide, safeguards in place to ensure the safety of our students and our staff. And, and that's what we're going to do, have, why we're going to have these workshops and these conversations. But I hear you loud and clear, we don't want this to become a disciplinary issue. But I think, as I stated before, retraining and retooling our students and staff so that we can all be successful, right, as we possibly can, given the current circumstances in which we're dealing with. Okay. All right, so then my next question, going back, I'm gonna go back to that, looking at this. So if we say where current social distancing guidelines for the CDC cannot be maintained, because right now we know it's about six feet. Um, so maybe we want to use the word current. Uh, I kind of like Ms. Cuthbert's suggestion. So Ms. Uh, Rowland, um, you know, maybe we'll look at the first offense, something, second offense, something, third offense, and then maybe then go to something a little, if it's fourth, fifth time, then we got to look at um, maybe some more, maybe a level two or three, but I'm sure they work that out and come up exactly what it will be. So it'll be consistent for everyone but we, we, we keep talking about students and teachers, but we gotta make sure that our guests and visitors uh, do the same thing because I could see some of them uh, not following rules. So we gotta make sure that everyone is wearing the face mask. And a PSA, so 
it may benefit us to get some young students to go ahead and make commercials now about how to put on a mask. And, you know, I think if, if we do something creative and maybe get it out soon, we may get students who will come up with something that we can start displaying or advertising to show, you know, to really hit and drive this home. Because I've looked at several policies, even the city of Daytona's, and none of them are that uh, prescriptive. They, they're vague in nature, but you get the point that wherever you go, you have to social distance and you have to wear a mask. Any more discussion, colleagues? And so, just, yeah, I do have. So, and to your point, Dr. Balgobin, so now you've got the student in the class. This is not a disciplinary policy, yet you mentioned someone needs to come get this kid. That's disciplinary. And so, you know, again, the teacher is scared. So, so are we going to say then the teacher is going to allow the student to sit down and then write up a referral and we'll deal with it later? So let me clarify, Mr. Colon. Yeah. If the teacher were to call someone to, to take that student and have a conversation, that's not disciplinary. But if the teacher continues to engage with this student in a conversation where the rest of the students become disengaged in their learning, that could become more of an issue. So if that, actually that's protocol, and you can ask Mr. Persis, who's been a principal. If the student is becoming, argue, I don't want to use the word argumentative, but going back and forth with the teacher, that's not a good perception for the rest of the students, and it's going to provide time for the rest of the class to become disengaged. So protocol is that you call and you get assistance, so someone who can walk the student out, have a conversation, try to have an understanding why the student is refusing to wear the mask, and then going from there, whether they need to contact the parent, talk to the student, or just provide a warning if it's warranted. So that is not disciplinary. I just want to clarify. Okay, so thank you for that. Um, any, anyone else? Okay, so with that being the case. Uh, yes, Madam Chair. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, because we do have public comments, and I really want to get our public in on this. Yeah. Way in. Go ahead, Ms. Cuthbert. Ms. Cuthbert, you're frozen. <laughs> Ms. Cuthbert? Ms. Cuthbert? It's doing it again. It's, yeah, we, we can't hear you. Is not working again? No, we can't hear you. Oh, man. Okay, okay now we can. Okay. Um, uh, are you still there? We, we, we're, <laughs> here. Now. we can't hear we're here. We're here. We're here. No. Sure not. <laughs> so, so what... I hear myself, but what do you guys? It, what, we, what's going on? We hear on? you now. Go right ahead. Keep talking. We okay. hear you now. Okay, this is a very serious issue, and it's not new. Kids have known about this mask debate. It's been going on in our communities in the country for several months now. It should be expected for them to come on campus with a mask, and if it if they don't come in the door then they shouldn't come in the door if they don't have one on. If, if there is an issue with the teacher, all the teacher has to do is say, are, are you not going to wear a mask? It's a yes or no answer. If it's a no, it can be as polite as it is. It's still defiant. It's still the defying authority. Then that person should be called and should be exited out of the classroom because you, you have a teacher trying to change classes and there are kids probably online. This teacher could be Volusia Live, and everybody's watching this, this issue. So that's what kids have to kind of realize as well, the seriousness of the issue. And the first day, the second day, the third day, those are the most important days. And I trust Ms. Rowland and her committee to put something together to put teeth in it. Because if we relax it, it's not a good idea. If anything we can rally around is are these health, safety, secure issues for ourselves, for those around us, and for our children. And they have to realize why we are doing this. 
It's to protect the health of everyone. And, and all has to do and then that's justifying. Yes, so she kind of broke up. Okay, did I freeze again? Okay, yeah. I'm finished. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm finished. Okay. Thank I, you. I don't know how much you heard or didn't hear. Maybe you're black. <laughs> Don't don't worry about Miss Cuthbert. We'll come back. Send us a text message. <laughs> Send us a message in the chat room. Thank you, Mrs. Schultz. How many callers do we have? Okay, it looks like we have four of the five that signed up for this topic. Okay, can you let that first caller in, please? All right, here we go. The first caller is Miss Alicia Severson or Severson. Ms. Severson, okay. Good evening, Ms. Severson. Good evening, Ms. Severson. Good evening. Star six, Ms. Severson. Good evening, Ms. Severson. Ms. Severson? Yes. Okay, can you, oh, not a problem. Can you state your full name and you have three minutes to address the board? My name is Alicia Severson. I live in Ormond Beach, Florida. I want to say good evening and thank you for your hard work tonight of managing our schools. First, I want to say that the only safe way to go forward is with a virtual opening, like Orange County and others are doing. There is no mandate to open brick and mortar schools until it is safe and it is not safe. I'm calling tonight to advocate for a mandatory mask. Face shields do not provide protection. A policy in all of our indoor spaces at our schools with clear consequences for violations. Just as any large scale employer has done, we should require cloth masks to keep both employees and customers safe. Without a solid testing program, and I haven't heard much about that, I feel we don't know who is infected and one of the few ways we can limit spread of the airborne virus while indoors is with a mask. There is a 70% chance of exposure to the virus in a crowd of 25. That's seven groups a day for our secondary students and up to 150 students a day for secondary teachers. We need masks. This is a public health policy and not a private choice policy. A private choice or recommendation policy is really no policy at all. Much like seatbelts are mandatory, masks should be too, and evidence bears this out. Again, I want to note tonight that the current plan we have exposes our at-risk students and students of color to harm the most. Ms. Wright, in your response to me about this, you stated that you are not only concerned about low-income students, but you are also concerned with homes with more than one child. These are usually the same families. I don't know many parents who have more money as they have more children. Under the current plan, brothers and sisters are going to be crammed onto buses 60 at a time. Two kids plus two buses equals 20 super spreader events in their lives every week. Add in the cafeteria, and that's 40 super spreader events in their lives for multiple children's families. Even with masks, these kids are being left behind. Option two would be wonderful to sort out, but right now it is only open to those with the privilege to do it. And you all have made it clear tonight that internet is a privilege. Someone said laptops will be available to those who meet criteria, but nobody said what that criteria is. Will they be for homes with multiple children? Safety should be an option for all of our families. As a side note, when I hear people disparage teachers who speak out against unethical and unscientific policies saying they should quit their profession, it boggles my mind. I question the logic of any person who thinks that people who do not wear masks or follow recommended guidelines should be responsible for the safety in our schools. They are the people most responsible for the spread of the virus. It is unethical for school districts to set policies that endanger our communities, and it is immoral to ignore it. The rates of infection in Volusia are not improving. Thank you, Ms. Severson. Ms. Severson, you have reached your three minutes, so you could finish your last sentence. Have a good night. 
Thank you so much. Mrs. Schultz, our next caller. Next up is Miss Amy Simonian. Okay. Good evening, Mrs. Simonian. Please push star six. Hello? Yes, I can barely hear you. Can you speak a little louder, Mrs. Simonian? Okay. Yes, is that is this better? Yes, that, that is better. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, my name is Amy Simonian, and I have three children in Volusia County Schools, and I'm also a substitute teacher with an early childhood education background. I know you have been hearing a lot from some teachers and parents who are against going back. As a parent and a sub in Volusia County, I have a different opinion, as do many other teachers and parents who are not being heard. There is a Facebook group called Open Volusia Schools Fall 2020, and I implore the board members to check it out. These parents are not being heard over the teachers shouting not to reopen and along with uh, some parents. We want our children to return to a normal classroom and atmosphere. Masks should be parental choice and not mandatory. Um, I believe masks just sit on your face and collect germs all day and then our children will be breathing them in. The restrictions will be very detrimental to our children's mental health. You want them to remain isolated from other students all day, even in the cafeteria, the most social time of their day. I read the reopening plans of one of my children's schools, and it stated that recess will be heavily monitored for social distancing. So this means they can't even play with friends during recess, and now you are discussing what kind of punishment they will receive if they get too close or don't wear a mask. You need to have teachers who are high risk or afraid to go back to students be the ones teaching Volusia Live. We already ask our teachers to do too much, and now they're expected to concentrate on their students in the classroom, students online, and be mask police and social distance police. Their attention will be split, and then no one is getting the education they deserve from their teachers. I think we need to take a lesson from daycares who have been open this entire time. They have not distanced their students, the kids, or make them wear masks, and they have not had these crazy outbreaks. That's because I believe this is all ridiculous, and I don't think parents, such as my opinion, is being heard over all of the shouting from the teachers' union saying it's unsafe to go back. I bet all of these teachers and parents yelling that it's too dangerous to open are also going to Walmart and out to eat with no problem. I'm a sub and I'm not afraid to go back to a normal classroom. And I think we just need to get back to a normal atmosphere because it sounds very isolated and alone kind of atmosphere that we want to send our children back to. And I don't agree with that at all. If we start privately homeschooling our children, then district will lose funding for not having children in attendance and then maybe our voices will be heard. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Schultz, next caller. Yeah, we have Mr. Scott Cleary. Mr. Cleary? Mr. Cleary? Push star six. Madam, Madam Chair, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Go right ahead, uh, Mr. Cleary. Excellent. Uh, this is a first note, Madam Chair. Scott Cleary. Um, I hope tonight is not a advertisement for Volusia Live, um, but you are going to be voting this evening on a mass policy that, regardless of Mr. when Clearing. the order opens, Mr. Mr. Clear, can you turn down your background noise? Mr. Clearing, order open. Mr. Clear, can you turn down your background noise? Is that better? Yes. Is that okay? Yes. I'm, I'm terribly sorry about that. Um, so you're going to be voting on a mass policy that, regardless of when brick and mortar opens or closes and then reopens, is very much needed. However, as written, it is critically flawed. Um, without clear and delineated effects that will result from the refusal to comply, you leave teachers and administrators open to attack and vitriol. This is especially important, Madam Chair, as one of your number has been at least passively contributing to the myth that teachers do not want to work and specific members of reopened committees appointed by members of this board have engaged in attacks of teachers who are advocating for the safety of their school communities. Their actions for men are rift between home and school that necessitate this additional work on your part now. As a side note, Madam Chair, it would be nice to see these, these individuals uh, never to serve on these district committees again. Um, I do not agree that mass or the refusal to wear masks should result in a disciplinary record, except for where a student decides to make a colorful suggestion to a teacher for noncompliance. 
but there must be clear procedures in place that outline responses and choices available both for uniformity and for equity. This is particularly important while our new cases and positivity rates are nowhere near where it should be. Madam Chair, I encourage you tonight to entertain a motion to fix this policy and provide the clarity needed going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Cleary. Ms. Schultz, our next caller. Our next caller is Mr. Kenneth Ashby. Good evening, Mr. Ashby. Can you hear me Mr. now? I can hear you now, Mr. Ashby. Go right ahead. State your full Hello. name, please. Uh, my name is Kenneth Ashby. Um, I am a teacher outside the district and a parent of two children in the district. I wanted to share some thoughts of one of my students that one of my students provided to me regarding the subject of masks today. During a quiz covering the externalities of an environmental issue, my student told me she had chosen the subject of the coronavirus pandemic. During this project, she had to discuss what effect the pandemic had on a variety of stakeholders. She mentioned some of the same problems the board is working through now. Then I asked the next question, what solutions would you recommend for this problem? This is a question I've asked, asked students time and time again regarding this particular project. But it is the first time I have heard a student become so emotional that they cried. She said, she said she knew that people in her school and her community needed to be wearing masks and social distancing. I reassured her that the adults in her community were going to do their best to ensure that her solutions came true. I hope this is true for her, just as I, I hope it is true for the children of Volusia County. We need to be able to reassure our students that we are following the best scientific and health knowledge to ensure that we do, uh, we do not ha harm them irrecoverably. This can be best done by not opening school doors until case numbers and positivity numbers have fallen to make it, uh, to make it safe to do so. Sheriff Chitwood most recently posted a positivity percentage of 10%, twice the recommended number to reopen schools. But on the subject of masks, we need more than what Mr. Cologne called, quote, a feel-good policy. The current policy does little to ensure students do not deliberately take off masks, does not always protect the parents and students who have chosen to follow CDC best practices, and leaves open the option to provide only a face shield. This is something the CDC explicitly warns against, and anecdotally, during some outbreaks, only those with a face shield alone have been found to have contracted the virus. However, face shields do have a place as a second line of defense when coupled with a mask. As a parent with a child who will be wearing a mask at all times following the CDC best practices, I implore, implore you to strengthen this man, mask mandate and use the best scientific knowledge currently available. Parents like me will also want teachers to be able to separate the many unmasked students expected from the holes in the current policy. Also, currently, because the district does not offer Volusia teachers the option to teach Volusia Live from their own homes, as many from our group wish to, the children of teachers will be forced to attend brick and mortar schools. Please make this a true route that teachers can take as they don't currently enjoy that option. We have seen today that Mr. Ashby, that would be more fiscally sen sensitive anyway. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Ms. Schultz, do we have an, another caller? We have no other callers that have signed up to talk about the mask topic. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Uh, colleagues, are there any more comments now that we've heard input from the public? Okay. If not, uh, Superintendent Bagelman, what is your recommendation? Madam yeah. Chair, Board, I recommend approval of the emergency adoption. Okay. 
Can you all give us about three minutes? We, we got to get Mr. Ms. Cuthbert back online. So we need about three minutes. So we'll, let's take a three minute break. Let's get her back online. here if you can hear me okay i'm back it, everything froze up and i had to restart okay give us thank two you. seconds sure thank you who is it Okay, Ms. Cuthbert, we, we had two callers that had trouble. Uh, and so I'm sent Ms., uh, I just sent Ms. Schultz a message and we're gonna try to bring them in. Maybe the rain did something tonight. Very possible. Mm -hmm. Ms. Schultz, can you get those two um, ladies on a call, please? Yes, let me see. I think someone's in the lobby now. Um, I don't have the number on my list, but who I, I believe Miss um, Padova is five six nine five. I remember her from the last meeting. I, I don't have her on my list, but I'm going to let her in. To this. Here we okay. go. Okay, and I sent you another name and number. Can you get her on okay. the line, please? Thank you. Will do. Good evening. Good evening. Star six, please. Okay, Cuthbert, we, we had two callers that had trouble. Uh, and so sent Ms. Uh, Hello. Ms. Good Hi, evening. This is Mary. Right yes, can you turn your yes. background no noise down, please? Sorry. Okay. Uh, is, Thank is this uh, Madam Chair? Yes, so just state your name and you have three minutes. Yes, ma'am. Mary DiPadova, good evening. Thank you, members of the board, for the points you brought up and for some of the clarification. 
Being in a classroom for six plus hours with the same group of students sort of makes the three, four, or six feet rule obsolete and makes the mandated mask rule that much more important. If everyone is not wearing masks in the classroom, the droplets will be all over the room no matter how far away we're sitting or standing. Mandating the wearing of masks in the classroom is what is necessary. And if I heard correctly, it sounds like most of you agree. Madam Chair, the place I believe the teeth need to be is that the masks need to be mandated while in the classroom, no matter the distance, no matter the distance while in the classroom. Take out the part where it says where social distancing can't take place. Take out the shields or and leave only mask. If a student in my classroom with a health issue had a health issue and I was asked to alter my classroom behavior to best protect my student, I would not only be expected to do so, I would want to do whatever I could. Many teachers have underlying health issues. Many want to teach face to face. If a teacher needs students to wear a mask for the health of the teacher, would it be wrong to mandate that their students wear a mask? Or do you maintain that they have a choice if the distance is appropriate? And if the teacher's health is put at a higher risk because of the student's choice, is that fair to the teacher? It sounds to me like you agree that we're all in this together, that teachers are part of the equation along with students and families and all school employees. I think you've heard us shouting that we need for you to mandate masks in the classroom. I hope you have read the multiple scientific articles that we've shared stating that face shields are not a replacement for masks but to be worn along with a mask to be effective. When the American Academy of Pediatrics gave their reasons for students needing to go back to the classroom, those reasons were mostly concerns due to social inequities. While this is a huge social and economic issue, once again, teachers and schools are being called to solve the problems of society, just as we were asked to consider keeping a weapon to protect students from intruders. While we feel obligated to help our students and we want to be there for the families, we need to be assured that you are doing whatever you can to ensure our safety. Mandating masks in the classroom when they're already mandated on the bus and in transition seems like a small ask. The CDC does not recommend the use of face shields as a substitute for the cloth face coverings, but as part of full protective gear in clinical settings. The main downside to, fa to face shields is that the droplets released when someone coughs, sneezes, or speaks can be dispersed throughout the sides and bottom of the shield. Research has found that this virus likes to live on plastic a lot better than it lives on porous materials like cloth. According to an article by the Mayo Clinic, the CDC has not recommended the use of face shields in lieu of face coverings. To keep us all safe, please mandate the masks while in the classroom. Please make your decision with the health of all of us in mind. We're counting on you to protect all of us. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Mrs. Schultz? And the Do next person is Kathy Callahan. Miss Kathy Callahan, she's in the meeting. Thank you. Good evening, Miss Callahan. Please push star six. Hi, this is Katie Callahan. Go right ahead, Miss Kate Miss Callahan. You have three minutes. Thank you for your time and school board. I thank you so much for the hard work and the dedication that you guys are providing for parents and teachers and students. It really does not go unnoticed and thank you, thank you. I just wanted to point out some other science because it seems like the only science that people want to listen to is the science that supports their opinion. So I'd like to give you guys some science. The CDC has said that asymptomatic asymptomatic carriers don't pass on the virus and my daughter has been in preschool since June with no issue and I also want to point out that the Daily Mail has published articles by Professor Mark Woolhouse he is an epi epidemiologist from the University of Edinburgh he said there has been no reported cases in the entire world of a teacher getting COVID-19 from a student that's the entire world and some more research, if you want to do it, James Meehan, he's a, um, a surgeon, and you can go to MeehanMD.com. He just published an article, and it talked about how masks really are for the surgical setting only. And he said that one of the biggest um, issues with wearing masks for an extended period of time is diminished oxygen capacity and rebreathing in germs. 
I'm fine if my student goes to school with a mask. You want to take his temperature. You want to make sure he wears a mask in the hallways where you can't be apart from someone. But I think someone on the board suggested that they wear a mask all day, and that is crazy. You have students who are enrolling in the extended day program, and you're talking about putting a five-year-old and a seven-year-old in a mask from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. And there are serious health consequences to that. So once again, I really thank you for the opportunity to speak and for hearing me. And I really pray that you all will just do more research outside of what makes you feel comfortable and outside of what supports your narrative. Thank you, Ms. Callahan. Thank you for your time. Have a great evening. You too. Any other callers, Ms. Schultz? Was that it? That's all I have for the mask topic. Okay, thank you. Uh, Superintendent Vagabin? Yes, Madam Chair, Board. I recommend the approval of the emergency adoption of Policy 503 concerning uh, mandatory face coverings on school property. Thank you, colleagues. You've heard the recommendation from our superintendent. Is there a motion? Madam Chair, I have, I have a question, if I, if I may. Sure. Uh, is Mr. Penley still with us? Uh, yes, he is. Hey, Mr. Penley, I, I'm just wondering, uh, as you know, we have uh, laws, actually, uh, which prevent students from entering school that do not have uh, vaccinations up to date. Um, unless they have some religious e e exemption or some kind of health e ex exemption that they provide from a doctor. Uh, I'm, I'm just wondering if, if something like this could, could be considered in that category as it relates to health. Um, could you comment on that? I would have to research more carefully our policies book, and I, I must confess that I haven't done that. But uh, it, it is in the same vein as as the uh, vaccination policies. It's in the same vein as our other safety uh, measures that prevent certain people from coming on campus without showing IDs, that sort of thing. So it's it's that is again as my earlier point. That's why you have health, safety, and welfare policies that apply globally as opposed to just student conduct policies in your student code of conduct. So this is a health, safety, and welfare policy that addresses the campus-wide uh, grounds of the school and what uh, safety measures we're taking to ensure the safety as best we can of that campus. Yeah, so I'm, I'm getting, my point is on this is that if it is uh, deemed to be in the best interest of the health and safety of all of, of, all of the students, um, sort of like a vaccination is, and I think that's why we have those uh, rules and laws, then it seems like why wouldn't we be able to say uh, that uh, no one is allowed uh, to enter school uh, and until such time as they have a mask and they wear their mask um, along the same line as we would prohibit students from entering school until they were vaccinated uh, unless there were uh, just just cause that uh, these causes were documented on paper um, uh, I'm just trying to give get a, a little more teeth into it, and because uh, I'm thinking, you know, if a student comes once, um, sure, uh, you know, we they notify the uh, parent and, and so forth and so on. But it seemed like to me after after three times um, at that point with the same student 
that uh, that that would be cause to say I'm I'm I'm, I'm sorry, you know that uh, you cannot come you cannot come back to school un until such time as you wear a mask, um, and then and then that it, it doesn't expel the student or anything, but um, student could still pick up on uh, Volusia Live, uh, or the student could wear a wear a mask in the same way a parent could either get their child vaccinated or have some reason um, that falls within our guidelines as to why they can't get the vaccination and are exempt from that. And in the same way, a uh, child could be exempt from wearing a, a mask. Um, just want to throw that out there just to get your your thinking on it. Um, if I'm if I'm not in the right vein here, then just tell me. No, no, I don't think that it's a matter of not being in the right vein. It's a matter of we have to strike balances as a matter of policy. The analogy to the vaccine policy really doesn't uh, exactly correlate here because you can't tell as you sit in a classroom or as as uh, visitors come in the door whether someone has or has not been vaccinated. You can obviously, there's a perception, uh, perceptible difference uh, with someone who is or is not wearing a face covering. Uh, so that's, you know, you have to make allowances there. And then going back to the original uh, reasoning behind the, the policy that we brought forward was to the board's initial comments about wanting something that was uh, a simple policy that could be readily interpreted throughout the district. If we got into all of these exceptions in the policy, as opposed to your protocols and procedures, where these distinctions will have to be uh, played out, your exceptions essentially would then swallow the rule. And if we got into that, you're, you're incorporating a lot into policy that is really procedural and will have to be addressed. So we made the, the bright line kinds of issues for students who have medical exemptions, for students who have an intolerance or a sensitivity, those sorts of things that you're going to have to accommodate anyway under 504 or an, an IEP. Uh, so there are exceptions to the rule. It's not 100%. It's not 100% mandatory. The other component of that is you have instructional barriers. You don't want uh, to mandate 100% mask if a student is trying to read lips, for example, or uh, has, uh, for an instructional purpose, the teacher needs to see facial expressions, that sort of thing, or the student needs to see the facial expression of the teacher. And again, if we go down all of these rabbit holes in the policy, your your policy gets subsumed by all of the exceptions. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, perhaps I wasn't, I didn't say that as uh, clearly as I could have. I, I'm just talking about the student who doesn't bring a mask to school and re repeatedly does not bring a mask to to school um, that that's that's the issue um, that I think we haven't fully addressed uh, unless the principals are going to talk about how they would wish to deal with that with Ms. Rowland, and then they're coming back to the board uh, to add something to it or to put something in the code of conduct or or something along that nature. But I I do agree. In these, there aren't going to be very many of them, but. Uh, um, and there'll be far fewer of them if uh, if we have some real, um, real a real strong disciplinary action uh, for those uh, few few students who uh, may just choose to be defiant. Um, I, I, I think we're I think we're going to have to get there before we start school. Maybe not tonight, but um, I think before we start school, we're going to need. We're going to need more than what we have right right now. Uh, but uh, those are my comments, Matt, Madam Chair. I have, uh, uh, I, I'd be happy to make the, the motion. Um, 
And th that's fine. Yes, you can. But I, I think that was what Mr. Doran alluded to, that eventually we would have to come back and actually create a policy. This was just to get us to that part where we didn't have to advertise for the 30 days. Yeah. But sh sure. But um, sure, Mr. Persis, go go right ahead. Yeah, um, I, I I move that that, that we um, that we uh, adopt policy. Is it 1604? Um, item 16. Yes. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I, I move we adopt item 1604. Thank you. The motion was made by Mr. Persis. Is there a second? I second it. The motion was made by Mr. Persis, second by Mrs. Hain. Colleagues, is there any more discussion? Uh, yes. I have a question for Ted. And so let's, you know, I, I think that it's pretty evident that there's still work to be done on this. Um, yeah by the by the hesitation is what I'm, I'm not saying I'm going to assume I think and so under an so let's say you know I, I I can support this because we need something right now because we have nothing however I think it we really if we needed to look at this before the start of school because we decide that um, that there is a code of conduct something or another that needs to be added can we revisit this Yes, you can revisit it, but I don't know how it would get back on the agenda unless you decide now or at some future meeting you ask for it to be brought back. In other words, is, is the thought process to pass this now and then ask the district to bring the issue back before you with additional revisions just so you have something in place? I think you can do that. Um, but if if we're if we're going to revise it, then maybe the answer is just to bring it back on August fourth or at another point prior to the beginning of school and and get it right the first time. But either way, yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Any other questions or comments? Madam, okay. Madam Chair. Yes. Can I just ask you a calendar um, issue? Uh, what are our what are our meeting dates in August? The fourth and the twenty twenty fifth, I believe. We have a meeting next Tuesday, the fourth. That okay. was a, we we put that on the just in case, and our next meeting is actually not to the twenty fifth because initially we. The 18th was election day. That, that was the reason why we didn't have it on the 18th. And the 11th, uh, that was the first day of teachers returning. So we normally don't have school on or a meeting on that day either. So currently, we have a meeting scheduled for the 4th and the 25th. OK, thank you. Uh, so then to, just to get back to it, I, I think by passing the policy tonight, we're sending the message out loud and clear to uh, the parents and the teachers and everyone that uh, it, it will be mandatory for you to wear a mask in uh, Volusia County Schools. I think the part we haven't, uh, at least I haven't, uh, come to grips with is the, uh, the actual discipline part, because I think there will need to be some Dis disciplinary action uh, for those ex extreme uh, cases, and uh, is it possible? Uh, and I'll say this to uh, to Mr. Uh, Doran or 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 to uh, Kevin uh, uh, that we could uh, have that side of it, that code of conduct uh, uh, part of it, on our August. Twenty uh, second or meeting, wh whichever date is that last one in August, the twenty fifth, and I'm sure we we probably get Ms. Rowland if we want to put that on the agenda. That that's really up to us. It's our agenda, and yeah. if you're asking them to well, bring back some uh, po policies and procedures, uh, is that what you're asking? Yes, and I think that would give Ms. Rowland a little more time to 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 get input uh, from the uh, principals and systems schools teachers too uh, so that's what I'm I'm, I'm thinking and uh, so 
what we what we would be doing on the 25th we, we really wouldn't be uh, uh, I don't think uh, changing the the mandate that's before us tonight but it it may be adding uh, just a, a few things regarding how it uh, is uh, at how it is at addressed in the code of conduct. Mr. Penley, Mr. Doran, either one of you can answer. Well, I believe I'll, I'll be had. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I just wanted to point out that we did raise these issues, and and there were uh, policy committees consisting of administrators, teachers, principals, certainly, uh, who looked at this policy and did not raise those. We can make it a point. Uh, through the board's direction to the superintendent to go back and address uh, our practice and procedures as part of the student code of conduct and I'm, I'm happy to participate in that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know, I know you have a vote on the floor there. Yes. Go ahead, Mr. Colon. And so I think there's work to be done on this. And as long as we can keep that, you know, the, the devil's in the details and um, and the implementation, as our wonderful superintendent often says, uh, the implementation matters most. And so again, I think for the sake of an emergency, because this is an emergency policy and, and how it's being handled, I think it's better than nothing. However, I, I do have those concerns. And, and I'm not quite sure that we could add them. Ted, I don't know that we can add this to the code of conduct because you you would then have to open that up for rulemaking, advertise, and do all of that. So I don't think that having a meeting at the end of August will give enough time to be able to have those policies or, or that be in place by the start of school. So I, I think, I mean, I'm willing to, may, maybe I just don't understand it. And so if given the chance to speak to my principals and see what they're feeling, and of course you all will do so as well. Um, but I do think we need a policy in the book to cover that office person who is very concerned that folks aren't wearing masks in, in the school. And then the other part of it is we've talked about students, but I also have a concern. We're gonna have an employee who's gonna say, I'm not gonna wear a mask. And so then how are we going to deal with that? And I think that also needs to be defined as well. So I can support this today because it is an emergency policy, but I still think there's lots of questions uh, that we may have to look at before the start of school. Ted's got his hand up again. So go ahead, Mr. Doran. Well, I, I just want to mention, so let's recall how we go through this rulemaking procedure. Maybe you will recall, for instance, when we were looking at the dress code and the board would have a meeting and you give the district direction on what you want it to look like, then it's brought before you in draft form and if you approve it as it has been drafted, then it's a, you're going to vote to advertise it. Once you've advertised it, if you want to make a substantial change to it then you have to re-advertise it and you may remember we talked about this a little bit because I don't remember what the issue was but whether it was black jeans versus blue jeans or something like that and so then the question became well is that a substantially different policy than was originally advertised do we need to re-advertise my point here is that if everybody wants to move quickly on this you're going to be on a dual track if you consider revising this emergency order or I'm sorry policy that you're, you're creating you're going to be discussing the same issues in the context of a more permanent policy and the obvious problem is the confusion uh, that it creates as school opens because there isn't any clear direction but the reality is that is because of the time line between now and school opening, it's impossible to reach the final policy uh, within that time frame. So um, 
you know, I guess what I'm pointing out here is that it's really what how quickly you get to a point where you have a policy that is your your is your final product is going to be driven by your willingness as a board to meet, discuss, review, reach consensus, and then not change your opinions or your the direction so that it's advertised once and then voted as a final policy. And that, you know, may, I'm just tossing this out as a possibility, that may require a special meeting between now and then if that's what you decide is necessary. Or we can work with the existing meetings and, and you know, just go through that process. Well, uh, Madam Chair, if I may. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I just would uh, not want to rush into anything uh, right now as far as uh, any sort of discipline or how to uh, tweak this in any way with, without hearing from the, the teachers and the principals. Um, we need to get a little more input on this and uh, I would rather wait. And if in fact it's, it, it is that that we start school and we don't really have the other the other part of this in place. I, I think that's 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 fine. Um, the the fact of the matter is is that uh, uh, we need to pass this tonight, and um, then as we as we've been saying, uh, let's try to work it out and figure out what what would be the the best course of action to deal in those situations that may uh, occur, whether it's a staff member or a student. Okay, any more discussion? Would the district, so if we did this on the 4th, would that be enough time to get some of this ironed out so we could get it done right the first time as Mr. Doran maybe we can have meetings with all of us individually to sit down and understand because the reality is that we haven't had those individual meetings and so you know uh, we're sharing our thoughts here but that doesn't necessarily and so if we have a meeting on the books for tuesday we're talking about you know five more days six more days seven more days arguably six more because you don't uh -huh. count the weekend I know, and we already have our, our agenda pretty tight for the 4th, so we will either have to have a special meeting or move it to the 25th. Well, there's a motion on the floor, so. But still time to discuss. I mean, if you want a, a meeting, we'd either have to do a special meeting or the 25th. I'm okay with a special meeting. I'd like to see us get this right with the input of our principals and everybody. I mean, again, you know, they're the ones that are going to have to do it. And I think we've heard from a lot of folks on both sides. So we've heard from parents who say, I don't want my child to wear a mask. We've heard that tonight. And we've heard folks saying, please have them wear a mask all the time. Right. And so. Mrs. Wright. Yeah, yes, go ahead, Mr. Doran. Okay, so just from a timing standpoint, so let's just kind of walk this thing through. It's clear to me, and I think to everybody, that the rule that you're now passing on an emergency basis is, is, is not what you want to advertise as the rule that you would plan to ultimately make into the final policy. That means that we have to have a meeting to give Mr. Penley, for you all to give Mr. Penley direction on what you want that to look like so that you can look at it and approve it to be advertised. So if we wait till the 25th, that's going to be the first time you're telling him what you want to change about this one. And then he's got to draft it, then he's got to bring it back to you, then you've got to approve it, then you have to advertise it for 30 days, then you have to have a rulemaking hearing on it, take all the citizen input at a subsequent meeting and, and finalize it. 
you're talking way into the school year. On top of that, you run the risk that you're going to go over 90 days and have no policy at all. Because if you don't have something permanent in place, this emergency uh, policy that you're creating is going to expire. And I have never looked at this, but my guess is you can't extend it because the whole purpose behind the law allowing you to do this on an emergency basis is to get something in an emergency environment into place while you work through that final analysis to reach the final policy that you're going to put in uh, ultimately on a permanent uh, basis. So, uh, you know, I'm just kind of suggesting we do have time restrictions here, 90 days is clearly a timeline after which we'll have no policy and it's not something that's going to happen overnight if we start doing regular meetings and you know month from now two weeks after that a month after that it's going to you know we're going to be well into the school year before we get a final policy thank you mr doran mr cologne I'm good. Anyone else have any comments? I yeah, Matt, Madam Chair. So I just want to make sure I understand. And, and can I? Do I have the floor? I, yes. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, so, Mr. Doran, are you saying that we couldn't pass this tonight? And we and we couldn't come back and and advertise a change in our code of conduct. Well, I don't. I, Mr. Penley is uh, probably the better one to speak to this, but I think he's making it pretty clear. It's not a code of conduct issues. It's it's a health, safety, and welfare. Right. 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 It's applying to everybody. So, yes, there is, I understand that everybody is trying to grapple with how, how do we deal with students, but, you know, you're going to have the same rule apply to vendors and teachers alike, and that's not a negotiated bargaining item because it is a health, safety, and welfare issue, and so, you know, whatever rules you put into place on that are going to apply. So, you know, can, can you come back? Yes, you know, you, you're, you're gonna come back. You, you, one of two things is gonna happen. You're gonna pass this tonight and 90 days from today, it's gonna expire and you're gonna have no policy at all. Or between now and the next 90 days, you're gonna go through the process of, of advertising a final proposed policy, taking the public input on that and making a final decision and approving a policy that will then be permanent until it is repealed at some point in the future, if ever. Does that help to explain? Uh, yeah, so I, 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 I guess what, what you're saying is if it's a health and safety uh, uh, policy, then it 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 should not be in the code of conduct is that what you're saying or are you just saying it it it'll, I, it'll take time it'll take more time to put it well, in there if that's what we want to do again mr penley needs to speak up here if i'm if i'm misspeaking but my understanding is the approach that we're taking is by creating a health safety and welfare uh, approach to this the the student disciplinary policy that's already in place can could be used um, as as a, a tool uh, for enforcement uh, because you you know it's given let's say a teacher directs a student you know you have to wear your mask the student says right. Right. I, you know screw you whatever right and then that that those those disciplinary 
provisions are already in place for dealing with those kinds of situations, it doesn't necessarily have to apply to a mask at all, you know, insubordination and the sure. like. Sure. sure. And so that's that's your enforcement. Um, you know, what I don't know is I'm sitting here because, uh, and Mr. Penley maybe has the answer to this, uh, but I, I'm not sure if if there's not a process under which, similarly to what you described, uh, where if the student refuses to wear the mask, it's not even a matter of discipline. It's just a matter of not being allowed to be on campus without it. And, you know, just simply saying, okay, until you're ready to wear it, you're not, you're not allowed on campus or on the school property, just like you would say to a vendor or a teacher or anyone else. Uh, and then their options are to pursue, as you suggested, uh, you know, Volusia Live or, you know, some other approach that doesn't require them to be on campus and therefore then they don't have to comply with the, uh, the health concern that, you know, we're trying to address. Um, Mr. Penley, any thought on that? I mean, no, you're absolutely right. That was the original thought behind the policy was this is a, a choice. If someone chooses not to wear a mask, we have two other options for uh, alternative uh, not coming onto campus uh, educational models that they can choose from. Uh, that's that's perfectly fine. Uh, as to the uh, issue of, of an emergency rule, Mr. Doran is, is correct. Under the uh, Administrative Procedures Act, your emergency rule will expire in 90 days, that period of time is there to give you an opportunity to go through rulemaking procedures and put forward a rule that on a permanent basis that is uh, at the board's pleasure. Um, we can do that. The 90 days, I've done it before, 90 days goes by very fast when you're in, in rulemaking, but it's not impossible. Um, I'm not sure that it requires a special meeting. We have other opportunities to craft things that uh, could be brought back as a permanent policy change, uh, but it is not designed, this policy is not designed as solely a student code of conduct issue. So, so it is the case that it's not a disciplinary issue at all. It's just a function of, you know, little Johnny refuses to wear the mask, little Johnny's parents are called and told to you know, come pick him up, uh, and you know, not allowed back on campus until he wears the mask. And that's right, not, right? And, yeah, and it's not a disciplinary, necessarily a disciplinary issue at that point. It's just you, you, you like you have to wear a shirt, or pants, or mm -hmm. shoes. Um, you have to wear a mask um, in order to remain in school. And if you don't, then you don't get to come to school. And, you know, at, in a bricks and mortar setting, uh, you have other options. You're not denied the, app, the, the education, you're not expelled, you're not suspended, you're not any of those things. You're just not physically allowed to be on campus because the board has deemed it to be a health, safety, and welfare consideration that a mask at this point in time, in this environment, has to be worn in order to protect the, the health, safety, and welfare of the students, teachers, and any other person uh, that's, you know, in that proximity on, on campus. Yeah, that, that works for me. That's, that's fine. And uh, however, that would, uh, obviously, that message would have to get out and I think it clearly will <laughs> uh, there's uh, more than 30 days and uh, they'll get out to parents they'll get out to teachers and that'll get out to our uh, principals and assistant principals and so again so that they so that we all know how to do it that, you know how to still handle it and, uh, the right ways to go uh, about that but I can live with that and we wouldn't have to get into the discipline thing. Okay. Thank 
Thank okay. you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, colleagues, you heard that discussion. Do you all have any input? Mr. Clone, Ms. Haynes, Ms. Uh, Cuthbert? We call the vote. The only thing I would say is, can you hear me? Okay. The yeah. only thing I would say is let Mrs. Rowland do her part. She can talk amongst, and then if there's any feedback from the campuses, I mean, we don't know exactly how people will react or how behave on campus. If, if people know who to tell what's happening at the campus level, if Mrs. Rowland or someone she designates would be the receiver of that information, then they can come back to the board or Dr. Balgobin and say, there's a problem here, the policy has a hole here, this is what we're seeing on campus, this is what needs to be changed. So I suggest for the future. But let Mrs. Rowland um, take care of her, her committee. Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Chair. You're welcome. Okay. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Uh, are you ready for me to call the vote? I'm All right. ready. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cologne? In an emergency basis, this is better than nothing, so yay. Uh, <laughs> Ms. Uh, Jamie Haynes? Yay. Mr. Carl Persis? Yay. Ms. Linda Cuthbert? Yes. And Ida Wright, yes. Thank you, colleagues. Mrs. Schultz. Okay, we're gonna yeah. move down to item 17.01, public participation. I sent you a number. Can you give that gentleman a call? He, he too was on, I believe, and he was dropped. Please, ma'am. Yeah, he's on, he's, he's, he was on there for too long and then got dropped, but he's back on and I'm, I'm sending him in now. Thank you. And that is um, Mr. Andrew Chapman. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chapman. Hello. Hi, Mr. Chapman. Yes. Yes, can you please state your name? You have three minutes. My name is Andrew Chapman. The fact that we are having a conversation about masks with less than a month to go before the majority of teachers, faculty, and staff are welcomed back into the buildings is a prime example of why we are woefully unprepared to have physical buildings opened. August 31st, this date means nothing. An annual budget, these numbers mean nothing. Every hypothetical that this board has mentioned this evening means nothing while a viral pandemic is still raging in the state of Florida. The board has spoken to many what ifs and maybes as if today thousands of positive cases of coronavirus have not hit the state. The board has spoken to many what ifs and maybes as if today the state did not reach a record number of virus related deaths. I can't believe that with the virus still surging, we're even making hypothetical decisions about reopening physical buildings. I can't believe that board member Haynes effectively warned families to make their decisions based on the monetary value placed on each student, as opposed to making their decisions based on the health and well-being of their children. I can't believe we are putting hypothetical revenue before health and safety. Now to the options. These options only work for families that can afford them. These options do not work for underserved communities, communities that are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. These options especially do not work for teachers, faculty, and staff. Teachers will in no way be equipped to teach to the learning standards expected of them under these options while maintaining all health and safety protocols. You are asking them to teach in person and online simultaneously while knowing for a fact that on a good day, they are stretched thin given the resources available to them. On a good day, they are asked to be food providers, clothing providers, social workers, sometimes bulletproof vests. And now, on bad days, they are asked to be medical personnel. All to say, any physical reopening without considering first and foremost the viral pandemic is negligent, immoral, and potentially lethal. The district is not ready. The school buildings themselves are not ready, as evidenced by their lack of proper ventilation and physical space. How can socially distanced learning, given the square footage of classrooms, be effective, masks or none? Teachers and students are not ready to be faced with a highly unknown and unorganized plan of learning and in-person attendance. This board has one obligation, to stand up against any order coming from Tallahassee and stand up for the health and safety of students, teachers, faculty, and staff by abandoning any reopening plan that doesn't consider a drastic drop 
and virus prevalence in the state of Florida. Thank you so much. Do we have anyone else in the waiting room, Mrs. Schultz? Uh, yes, we have, let me, Miss Mary Kaminsky. Okay. Good evening, Ms. Kaminsky. Ms. Kaminsky. Ms. Kaminsky. Can you hear me? Yes. Please state your full name. You have three minutes. Um, Mary Kaminsky. Hello? Yeah. Um, you can hear me. Okay. In the interest, I'm Mary Kaminsky Edgewater. Um, in the interest of requested problem solving input, I thought I'd offer an idea. Before I do, I'd like to ask each of you to think back to your own K-12 career. Think of a time when you were home for an extended period of time due to an illness or a natural disaster here in Florida. That's not hard to remember with hurricanes. Now remember all those lessons on your one-to-one -one device. No? Your school system didn't provide you with a computer or tablet? Hmm. Do you feel under or uneducated? Remember, it is possible to learn using old-fashioned technology which doesn't consume batteries or electricity. It is also possible to work with educators remotely over a telephone, even a hard line. Ask any homebound teacher. When I taught for homebound, we were able to keep ill and injured students up to speed, not catch them up, keep them up to speed with independent assignments and two hours a week of teacher contact which can be done on the phone. It can be done. Have you guys talked, this is my suggestion, with Cassie Chandler, who is an expert in remote teaching of students stuck at home. My suggestion is talk to experts like her who have done this. Fortunately, despite the great cleansing of ESE, I believe you still have her, a valuable resource. We here in New Smyrna lost an absolute legend yesterday, a pillar of the surfing community whose wife had been a teacher. Yes, he had a pre-existing condition, and yes, she was taking care of him, but that doesn't lessen the loss to hundreds of Volusia County School students and graduates. They'll never surf with him again. I have to say the way Mr. West talked about teachers who responded to the survey She'd, if she were still teaching, she'd just have been coldly somebody with the opportunity to resign to take care of her dying husband. That's disgusting. How about a bit of heart, people? This thing kills teachers, children, and friends. I have one last question. With three board members speaking of not opening with certain numbers and the very real possibility that if you do open brick and mortar, you may have to shut down again due to the virus, don't you think you need a solid plan B, a plan your stakeholders have the right to? Do you even have such a plan for a full shutdown? If you do, you need to start talking about it and talking about it in board meetings because your stakeholders need to know what you would do in a full shutdown. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Schultz, do we have any other callers? We do. Up next is Kelly Chakalti. Okay. Um, yes, hi, this is Kelly Shahitley. Are you able to hear me? Yes, this is Mr. Shahitley. We can okay. hear you. You have three uh, minutes. Go yes, right ahead. thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to thank the entire board again this week, because as you may recall, I called last week too. My, my name kind of sticks right out there. But um, regardless, I am a parent. Um, I, I'm a teacher, but I am calling this evening as a parent with concerns about uh, pushing back our start date yet again. 
I am the parent of an upcoming senior in the IB program. I intend to listen to the meeting for parent information tomorrow morning. There's been a the special session scheduled for the 11th and 12th grade parents of IB students, but my concern is just that they will not have enough time if we don't get things going. They would not have enough time to meet their requirements to also earn their IB diploma that they have been working so hard for for the past few years. This also applies to our students over in ACE as well. So just in addition to my daughter, it's a blanket for all of these uh, special programs that are happening that have other requirements. If the board can please consider this, because what, what really concerned me tonight was I heard a proposed date of the 22nd. I understand the concerns with, with the virus. I myself am concerned about sending my daughter back to school. I hope the face mask uh, passes. I think we need these face mask policies in place. Um, and I also think we need to visit air quality. Um, our school buildings tend to be on the older side in our county, and I think we need to make sure that we have our air quality under control um, as we send the students back, meaning that if the ventilation systems need to be cleaned or we need some type of you know, new air filters, what have you, I'm, I hope we're looking into that as well as part of um, just keeping everybody safe uh, during this time. So that's really all I have for this evening. I just appreciate the board keeping mindful of these dates and getting some type of plan up and running so these students can get started. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Good night. Uh -huh. Have a good evening. Ms. Schultz, do we have another caller? We do. We have Mr. Michael Winnevegi. Good evening, Mr. Winnevegi. Good Hello. evening, Mr. Winnevegi. Yes, please state your full name. You have three minutes. Sure. My name is Michael Winnevegi. I'm in Ormond Beach. Um, I was just calling to offer a little bit of feedback. I, I know that I, I could not possibly imagine the amount of stress that everyone is under and trying to make decisions and hit a moving target, and I truly appreciate the amount of time that you folks have all put in to coming up with the, the solutions and the plans that are in place. But one point of feedback that I'd like to convey, and I'd like to not really wade into the the politics and the contentiousness of whether or how the school is opened, but on, in, in whichever model moves forward, one thing that I learned from the spring was that there was a lot of effort to react to make sure that there was a one-size-fits-most or close to a one-size-fits-all solution that included everyone of every performance level, socioeconomic level, and what have you. And I, and I think that that is obviously a necessity, but I think once there is the framework for a model of how to educate the children remotely or via some type of social distancing measures. There also needs to be equal emphasis still placed on the students that are excelling, that are performing well, and that are advancing without some of those other difficulties. And I think that the spring served as a reminder that there was a, a ton of effort to teach towards the middle or placate the, the not, not necessarily the lowest con common denominator, but, but those that struggled the most, and I think that that was absolutely necessary in an emergency time, but this, if this becomes a new normal of any sort, the, the, the children that were excelling just fine are going to either lose interest or be completely unengaged. I, I have elementary school children, and I can only imagine if they were at the high school level, then I've heard some other parents speak to that effect. But there needs to be some level of engagement and emphasis placed on the kids that are doing well too to maintain their level of engagement with the same veracity that we make sure that every single child has the same opportunity and, and regardless of their background. So I appreciate your time and just want to make sure that there's still an emphasis on all of the children, not just a specific subset. Thank you for your time. Have a good evening. Thanks, you too. Any more calls, Ms. Schultz? That was our last caller. Okay, thank you. So we'll move down to item 18.01, um, board comments. Um, any of you have any comments you would like to share? Go, go ahead, Mr. Colon. And so, you know, as we have learned through this process, um, the decision on whether to open up brick and mortar is going to be up to this board. 
Uh, we are still quite a bit of ways from that date. I can tell you the numbers that we that we received from Ms. Boswell this morning um, indicated that we were at a 14-day positivity rate of 11.08. And so arguably that is good news because we were slightly higher than that the last time, but not a significant amount higher, and so as I as as I said uh, earlier, I think that um, we while we're preparing for the opening of school, we really, uh, as the gentleman alluded to, really need to start thinking about what will it look like if we have to shut down again, um, and so. Um, you know, for, for me personally, I think we are, you know, still a month away and, and actually the numbers seem to be going down, which is a good thing. However, uh, our positivity rate, so last week the positivity rate was 12.43 and so this is all from uh, Ms. Boswell, Department of Health. And week two's positivity rate was 9.76. And so, um, again, I think, you know, you know, are, are we advocating for school to be open brick and mortar at this point? The answer is no. We're just making the plans as if it were going to be, knowing that COVID can really take this and turn this around uh, very quickly. And, and we pray and that you know, society continues to change their habits, and who knows, we may be nine percent next week. And so, from eleven, you know, from twelve to to eleven to ten to nine, and so as long as that trend is going, but you know, I don't want anybody to think that we are oblivious to the fact that the numbers are still high. Uh, just the the business of the district has to go on. The budget has to be discussed. And we cannot not discuss it because that would also not be responsible. So that's all I wanted to say on that. And again, thank you all so much for listening. Have a good night. I just want to say thank you to everyone that once again tuned in tonight. Um, I also want to thank those of you that have sent us emails and, you know, reached out even by calling to talk to us about this. This is, um, there's a lot in play here and there's a lot of different moving pieces and parts, but ultimately um, our primary responsibility every day, and it has been for the 34 years um, that I have been in education, is to always put our children first. But I wanna thank each of you for joining us again this evening and um, thanks for, being a part of this. Mr. Persis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, another great school board meeting. Uh, I, I tell you, uh, just hearing from everybody, uh, so many things going on, uh, just the it's, it's really uh, an honor to uh, serve on this board. We got some great, great, great people here. I, I wanted to just share some some e emails, uh, some questions that I had, Madam Chair, if I could, and maybe can get a get a quick answer. Or uh, 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 Deb Muller had said something earlier tonight about uh, the federal government might may come in with money to replace air filters at our schools. Was that correct? Did I hear, hear that or was I dreaming? <laughs> am, am I dreaming that she said that? <laughs> oh, Mr. Uh, Persis, no, you weren't yeah. dreaming that, but I have heard recently reported as uh, Congress gets ready to uh, discuss the next round of COVID uh, funding that they have uh, said that for those schools that are going back to brick and mortar that they feel there may be some additional funding and that those are some of the things that they are discussing is regarding um, improving air quality um, and other other types of um, you know measures but they that was that was the only thing that I specifically heard oh okay and and, and if that were the case I mean does uh, I guess 
and Mr. Aiken or, or somebody out, out there, do they are, have they already like analyzed if in fact we had X amount of dollars, which, which schools would be the, would be the schools on the top of the list to, to have their air filtration systems. Uh, that's Del every, that's Deltona. Every school. <laughs> every school. school. Yes, sir. We have a MERV sevens and eights currently right now, but every school, they want MERV threes. So we would look at every school. Wow. Oh my gosh. That's something. That is something. Uh, well then, then let me just ask you this, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Deb, um, as it relates to the uh, half cent sales tax, if in fact this board said, you know, emergencies are emergencies and yes, I'd like to build a an, an elementary school, but you know what? Maybe it's more important right now that every student has a laptop every student's connected to broadband and every student's in the school with a superior air filtration system. Uh, are, 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 are those things that we could use the half cent sales tax money for? I, I believe that's what we just voted on to purchase the laptops. Um, and uh, yes, we can. That, that part, technology was part of our, um, part of lap, well not laptops, but technology, sure. um, athletics, all of that was part of the half cent sale uh, tax referendum that um, okay. we received. So yes, the technology definitely. Would the, the, would the air filter part be, be, be possible from that I'm, money or, or not? I'm sure it could be Mr. Aikens or Deb, but I, I believe because we are talking about renovations or retrofitting schools, could we not use that from yeah, our half from sales? Uh, this is Greg. Yeah, uh, we would have to look into that because we have HVAC systems and others that are uh, on the facility um, part of that to have some sales tax. We'll have to look into that and I get you an answer though, but possibly yes. Great, great, great. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, Madam Chair, I had a question about, uh, you're going to love this, Madam Chair. Uh, uh, is this the time, uh, the question goes something to the effect, uh, with all the stress and everything going on with parents and all the parents who have not had the income that they uh, have uh, would normally have had because of COVID, um, can we uh, hold in abeyance the uniform uh, policy uh, because they, the, the court in this call, my child has grown quite a bit uh, over the last year and I, he, will, he will not fit into the same uniform. I will have to buy all new uh, uniforms and uh, I, you know, I haven't, responded uh, to that particular email. I, I just don't know whether, you know, that's something that this board wants to talk about sometime between now and the end, in, in the start of the school year. I, I, I can understand the point and I just don't want to add any more stress to principals or teachers or to parents. Um, I, I I'm fine with I made my statement last meeting, how I felt about that. So it's really up to you all. Um, again, I said last meeting, and especially because I'm the person who's very uh, uniform oriented, I just felt this time that I wasn't willing to do that. Um, it sounds like she's gonna have to buy clothes regardless, but you know, you got parents who think uniforms are gonna be great because they're inexpensive, they can afford that, versus trying to yeah. purchase clothes. Yeah. I, I, as far as uniforms, I just think that's the least of our issues. So I, I stick with what I said last time. I don't have, yes, I am very pro uniforms, right. but I'm willing to put that off to next year um, and just let, we just want students who want to come to brick and mortar come to school, period. Yeah. That's my opinion. Yeah, uh, that's how I feel too. I, I I guess I have a little different approach. My, my feeling of it is, uh, you know, those of you that want to wear a uniform, wear the uniform, but right. you know, if you don't, um, I'm, I want you to wear your mask. <laughs> that's the uniform. <laughs> that's, that's the uniform that I, I want them to wear. 
Uh, that's uh, all I had, Madam Chair. Uh, thanks again for another great meeting. Thank you, Mr. Persis. Go ahead, Ms. Cuthbert. I'm having some um, technical challenges here. Go ahead, Madam Chair. Um, Florida is still one of the hot spots in the world. Um, we do not have good turnaround testing. The labs are pretty much packed. We've had a lot of our, our colleagues uh, test positive. Um, we're seeing more and more. I think all of us know somebody who has tested positive now. Um, we are not at the point where the Department of Health, I don't think, can handle if, if, a, if an outbreak occurs. I don't think the Department of Health could handle it. Um, I'm concerned about contact tracing, to be able to trace it back. Uh, I'm concerned about uh, people reporting that they've tested positive, been with somebody so they can quarantine. We still have to let uh, it be a little more clear to our uh, instructors, our employees, uh, what do they do, especially when there are couples who both teach, the husband and wife both teach, and who quarantines? If one tests positive, does everybody into all their students? That needs to be a little more clear. And then last but not least, I think of the Miami Marlins who just started their baseball one week, baseball career one week. Now they are in quarantine in Philadelphia because two have been quarantined. They get tested every other day. They're great specimens of the physical physique right now. They're young and healthy. Um, a lot of them are wearing masks, but yet there's an outbreak now with baseball. So I'm still concerned about a potential outbreak the minute we open. Um, so it's very important that as we put all of this into place, that it's secure and everybody knows the right steps to take. Um, and everybody is serious about this issue. Um, and if they're not serious, then they are liable to endanger other people's lives. Um, we, we have to look at the science. Um, if people want to come to school, I, I, you know, our governor says so. But I still think we should keep in the back of our minds, if this doesn't go bad, if this doesn't go down, because our positivity rate has spiked, it goes down, it spikes again. We still have to keep an eye on what's really causing all of this change in our normal behavior. So. Again, let's relook at the positivity rates. Let's have the Department of Health again in, in August 4th, if it's all possible. We still need to know the latest information because the last couple of board meetings I did ask, are we meeting on the 4th? Can we meet a four, on the 4th to revisit our situation um, to see what it's like going on in, in our county? Uh, other than that, thank you, Madam Chair. It's been a long evening again. I thank for all of those faithful who have stuck around. So thank you. Have a good evening. Thank you. And colleagues, I hear you. We may want to consider uh, having a meeting on the 11th, maybe a, a special meeting to look at that. I just think the 4th, again, I'm not, I'm not willing to put anything else on the agenda for the 4th. We, our agenda is really compact. And so if we want to have a meeting on the 11th so we can revisit the plan, see where we are. I'm fine with that. I, I just... I, we cannot add anything to the board. I am good with that, Madam Chair. As the superintendent was wondering, uh, we're having weekly meetings, but that's okay. We're doing the work. So uh, I am okay with the 11th. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm fine with the 11th. Um, Ms. Cuthbert, Mr. Persis? Uh, I'm unable to. Um, the city of New Smyrna is having a tribute to Matt Krajewski. Um, now, it may be tentative. I don't know if the city council is allowing anybody to come in, but I was supposed to go with Mr. Merrick and Mrs. Krajewski for um, recognition on the 11th. What time is that meeting, Ms. Cuthbert? It starts at 6.30. So we, we could have an early meeting again. This is a call meeting. We may, we may have to have it in the morning. Yeah, we can have an earlier one. Mr. Persis? Yeah, that'd be fine with me. Uh, Madam Chair, I was going to ask you about the meeting uh, coming up next. What what time is that one supposed to start? 10 a.m. 10 a.m., okay. Yeah. And, and that's a workshop and then school board meeting just like the old days? or No, nope, or... it's just a meeting. It's just a meeting. We call that a, earlier in the fall. Okay. Um, in the event, because we were, we were not certain about um, 
about the tax information. Yeah. So we put that on the books. We just never removed it. So we left yeah. that one there for 10. Because uh, that's yeah. not, normally that wouldn't be our meeting. Actually, the 11th would have been our normal uh, school board meeting. Okay. So be there at 10. And Miss Miss Cuthbert and I are, are both to uh, um, be there, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. I haven't been there in a long time. So uh, <laughs> looking forward to going. Well, I just have, yeah, I just have to have yeah. enough time to get back. From hey, the land back to New Smyrna. I have to put it in my GPS. I, I, I don't know if I can find it. On the 11th, uh, well, right now, we, we can limit to, again, if we're going to do a call meeting, we got to be very specific of what we're addressing, and that would that's the only thing we can address. Okay. So if we want to do that, we can go ahead and put that on the agenda, um, Dr. Bagabin, for the 11th. Do And we want it early morning again. Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Would that work, Mr. Colon, Ms. Haynes? 10 o'clock, and we'll do it for now, 10 o'clock. That, that is the first day of pre-planning. Is that going to interrupt any breakfasts or get-togethers or anything? Everything should be virtual. Okay. If, 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 based on everything I'm hearing, I, I would assume it would be virtual. Our one on the 11th, the virtual? OK. Well, right now, either, either we want to meet or, I mean, we okay. just won't be able to attend. If we, if we know we got to conduct business, I think we just got to you got to just do it. Okay, sounds okay. fine. Okay. That, okay. That sounds, like, right. that sounds like that could be a short meeting, though. It looks like yes. just a call, like 10 to 12. Let's kind of plan it. For... <laughs> I, I, right. did I, yes, did I hear you, Mr. Uh, Doran? Yes, ma'am. Uh, would that be an appropriate meeting to talk about uh, putting into place something that we could advertise for the policy for the mask or no? That, that, that would be fine because I think that would give them enough time to really look at that. Yeah, and that way, right, Mr. Penley and I can talk about that and he, he I mean, it's his thing, he'll, he'll do it, but, and then if that's okay, we if we can add that to the agenda as well because you're right, we do have to say what we're going to be doing. So right. I, that's the only reason I and so the the two things we we will uh, actually entertain on that day, number one is just revisiting our numbers um, where we are as relates to health and see and look at the CDC new guidelines. We we won't really be voting on anything. We just will be actually reviewing where we are, and then to have the presentation on from Mr. Henley and Miss um, Rowland as it relates to the mass policy. At what time? 10 a.m. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, colleagues, um, I, I hate to do this to you, so I am going to make this quick. But I do have a couple of items I really need to discuss with you on this evening. The first one is dealing with the waiver from Duval. I did email all of you um, that waiver to review and for us to consider uh, having as an action item next next Tuesday, um, we do have it on the agenda as a placeholder. Did you get a chance to read over it as it relates to the fire drills um, and what they are asking was for uh, a regarding waivers for emergency, emergency drills during the pandemic for the upcoming year? Mm -hmm. um, and so what I wanted to do, number one, are we interested in filing something very similar? If, if so, because we need to get that to Mr. Penley and um, I've emailed, I did include both our the school board's um, attorney, Mr. Doran, as well as the district's attorney, Mr. Penley. But is this something we are interested in pursuing? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So okay. Uh, with that said, we, we're not taking a vote. We will have, we'll have them drafted for Volusia County and we will vote on that next week. Yeah, mm -hmm. Madam Chair, if I could just say one thing about yes. the, uh, Excuse me. Uh, uh, as it relates to uh, fire, fire drill, uh, um, I'm all for uh, not having the students go outside. However, I do think it would be wise for us to test the fire alarm and just have it go off and the teachers report in if they did not hear it. Uh, that's just like a standard practice and that's how we usually learn where we have some kind of an issue. Uh, okay. Not that the students are having any kind of drill. It's really a, a, a drill to see if the system works, not so much the, 
evacuation process. Okay. Maybe I think uh, do... Mr. Aiken, you may know what I'm talking about there. And maybe we can do that the first, they, since teachers are about we, almost three weeks, we can yeah, have that we, done while they're we, there. We we usually do um, uh, twice, uh, yeah, uh, two of them in the first, I don't know, the 30 days. Uh, and then we usually do some even after school, uh, you know, just to test it too. But uh, I just think um, to make sure that the fire alarm systems are working and can be heard everywhere, that's all. Any way that you can accomplish that, yeah. Okay, Ms. Yeah. Haynes? I was just gonna say we're required to do them once a month. Okay. Except when the start first, of school, we have to get first two, two weeks of school, you have yeah. to do two within two. the first two weeks of yeah. school and then one month per month thereafter. One per yeah. month after, yes. That's it. Okay. All right. So, um, well, they will work on that for us and bring that to us while we're discussing waivers. Uh, so there's a lot of discussion about brick and mortar, um, and it, it is it is something that we cannot just ignore um, because we've had parents indicate they want their children to come to brick and mortar, uh, regardless of how we feel. Parents have stated that. You have teachers who stated that. So to try to make this work, um, during our, one of my calls, we've talked about a class size waiver. And so as we look at the numbers and, and parents are, uh, we got over 7,000 students that have registered for Volusia Online. We have close to 4,000 parents that have asked for option two and about 10 to 12,000 parents that have indicated they wanna come back to brick and mortar. So with that in, in mind, following the CDC guidelines, one of, uh, one of the statements or one of what's well, in writing is to limit the si class sizes to 12 to 13 students uh, to, so that we can accomplish the six feet distance. With that being said, currently, because of funding and the way we are set up in Florida, we would have to request a waiver. Most larger districts uh, right now don't have to worry about that as much because some of them are allowed, uh, like Orange County, they will be allowed to start the first two weeks virtually, but they do have to have a brick and mortar. And, and I want everybody to understand that those that are starting virtually after a certain amount of time will have to offer a brick and mortar start. So with that being said, I'd like for us to be a little proactive and maybe be the district that requests a waiver to allow us, since we've been told in our emergency order to, um, follow that of our, of our county and that of the CDC guidelines to ask for a waiver that for parents who choose to send their children to brick and mortar, that we limit those class sizes to 12 so that we can um, actually social distance without a financial impact on the, the, classroom, the classroom or the district. So is that something we're interested in, number one? If so, again, we probably need to while we're doing sending our waivers, send all of them at one time um, in hopes that we can um, get both of them passed. So I want to bring that to the table as well. Yeah. To me, that makes sense, Madam Chair. Okay. Agreed, and, and I'll add, Madam Chair, I reached out to our counterparts in Orange County and they have heard absolutely nothing from the state on their waiver request, nor are they anticipating to hear back. Okay, okay. And so with that, I just go ahead, Ms. Uh, Haynes. So while we're talking about waivers, are you willing to put forth at least one more waiver? Okay, wait a minute, let's, let's stay there because I got three more, two more items to come to as it relates to waivers. Okay. Okay. So are we comfortable um, asking for the class size? Again, we're gonna connect it directly with the CDC guidelines and based on those guidelines, as well as the, um, the letter that we see, received from the Pediatric Association um, of what a class should look like, we're gonna, again, because we, we don't have the technology and some of the other luxuries that our surrounding counties will, we wanna make sure that that is our selling point. Um, our next item is testing. And I know you were, that's where you were going. We've had that conversation, I would like for you to hopefully we can all address that on Friday during our conversation with FSBA, because they are asking um, for us to submit. 
But the class size, I, I wanted Volusia to kind of take the lead on that because I, I know Duvall did the one on drills. Most of the larger districts that I want to one um, probably have a better handle on class size. And so I think those of us who, who did not, and I think we are the second largest that may not be a one-to-one -one for us to go ahead and get ahead of this. Testing, I, that would be great. And um, since you're a little more knowledgeable, uh, do you want to speak to that, um, Ms. Haynes? Yes, what I'd like to do is, since we did not give the FSA this past spring, we don't have any test scores to compare our students to. I'd like, to, um, I'd like for us to ask for a waiver for this spring to not take the FSA this spring because the following year the new standards are coming out and they're going to have a new baseline test data. So I just don't understand the need if we don't have data from this past spring, this spring to take a test that then the following year it will be a new test and it won't compare to the data. And also with the fact that we know we have um, a significant number of our students that the fourth nine weeks, there was no learning or very limited learning. So we already know that when we start this school year off, whether we start it on August 31st or another date, they're already behind and we've got to start them where they're at. So I would like for teachers to have the opportunity to start their students where they're at, you know, not trying to start them, you know, six months ahead of where they are but start them where they're at and have the time to focus and bring them up to where they need to be without having the additional stress of having to worry about test taking skills and prepping for tests and things like that and actually just have authentic learning because I feel if we do that then as we move into the following year and the new standards are released then we can address those standards and hopefully we'll, we will have our students that have fallen behind back up to where they need to be. And so I'd like a waiver that we re request and whether we do it statewide with the school board association or take the lead on it here in Volusia, I'd like a waiver that we ask that we not give the FSA test this spring. With that being said, there's one more thing and this is actually, um, Dr. Valgovan, my request for inside the district because um, I don't think the state, you know, I don't think we need a waiver for this we did not do evaluations last spring. Um, we put off evaluations because the governor said, you know, we could put off evaluations. But when we look at our evaluation system for teachers, um, teachers are required in Volusia County to look at doing four DPPs. And with the fact that we have already set up to do 14 days of pre-planning and provide the instruction and support that teachers need at that time to get them ready on safety protocols, using the technology, how to live stream, you know, whatever it's going to look like, I'd like to make the request on behalf of all of our teachers that we consider waiving the DPPs for this year because we're already setting up the training and if we're going to take other training days away where we won't be having training because of our pushback for a later start date, I'd like to request that teachers not have to complete four separate DPPs this year as part of their evaluation. Thank you. That, that, that was a lot, Ms. Haynes. <laughs> well, no, that's okay. We, we have it recorded, so we, 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 we have it. Um, so I, I know, uh, Ms. Cuthbert, will you be on the call Friday? And Ms. Haynes, will both of you be on the call Friday? So can one of you make sure, and I'm sure Andrea will talk about the testing waiver, yeah. uh, but one of you chime in, please? Yeah. Both of you. Okay. Sure. So just to recap, we're looking at uh, three waivers. One, um, just to mirror that of Duval as, rela as it relates to drills, emergency drills. Number two, class size waiver um, for brick and mortar classes only because that is where the, we're having the pushback. And three, uh, testing waiver. And we will we'll get, we can create, create one, but if uh, FSBA actually creates a comprehensive one, Maybe we just want to join in with them. If not, having one for our district, I don't think will provide, um, will be a good thing. Any comments, recommendations, concerns? Go ahead, Mr. Persis. 
Yeah, Madam Chair, I, first of all, I, wanna, uh, I think that's great uh, that we're doing all this. And Ms. Haynes, I think uh, your I idea is uh, excellent about the uh, the uh, teacher e evaluation criteria, whatever. I, I, I just think that whole teacher criteria this year needs to be, uh, I, I don't know, it, it needs to be modified to say that the very least. I mean, it's gonna be so difficult for the teachers and for the principals to be evaluating these people who are doing it in so many different ways uh, for the first time for many of them and all the challenges that come with that. Uh, I, I, I just hope that we can uh, sit sit down perhaps and with the teacher union, uh, the principals and, and figure out, you know, what would be really fair uh, to uh, to everyone. We got to have some kind of an of an e e evaluation, but I, I don't think it needs to look like the ones we have done for the last three or four years. I think we need something different because it's definitely going to be a different year. Thank you, Madam Chair. Welcome, Mr. Persis, uh, Ms. Cuthbert, or Mr. Colon. Anything to de-stress, okay. anything, okay. just to keep right. the concentration on the curriculum and the delivery and the learning. I mean, okay. it's that's yeah. all that's necessary. Okay. Thank you. So Dr. Bagelman, um, Dr. Bagelman, you and can work on the internal, we'll work on the external, uh, Mr. Doran and Mr. Penley. I'll leave that up to you all as we talk about the three waivers. Um, and the last thing, I, I, well, is two other things. Um, so I did have a conversation this morning with ABM. <laughs> and um, well, you, you know, it, it was not a long conversation. We, we were really just to the point. Um, I, I asked simple questions. Do you want our business? Have we ever been late paying you? And just talked about the contract. Uh, seriously, and, and Mr. Akins can attest, and, and Mr. Pendley, we may have been on the call 15 minutes. Um, and I and so with them saying yes, I was I was very clear. I used some terminology from my grandmother, spit clean, spit shine clean. Uh, I was asked that we have the Navy uh, Navy Seal stamp of approval, but we I heard we had level two clean versus not level one. Okay, so I'm very clear. We want to spit shine clean. They will be here next Tuesday. They'll be part of it. Um, Opening up is important, but if our schools are not clean, that, that is very concerning. It is no reason why our schools are not spotless. Um, I didn't give people a lot of time to give me any excuses of why. So where we are either, and, and so I, I did have to say, we will not be visiting this anymore. If, if we can't get what we need, it's time for us to have some serious conversations about our cleaning service. But um, they will be here next week. Um, we will listen to what they will tell us that they are capable of doing. Uh, we seem to be all on the same page, but we will find out next Tuesday because they will be here. And it is not the district's presentation. This is ABM. This is our time to have a conversation with ABM. Um, I did say to Mr. Akins, um, I know that, you know, during the, the closure uh, that some of our staff were, you know, worked from home. And I think we really do need to have a conversation about who's considered essential workers in the event something like this should happen again. Um, I, it is my belief, and, and I'm only speaking for Ida Wright, and so the rest of us, we need to think about this. Who do we consider essential? So if ABM is working, should our, 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 our folks also be working? Um, do we want our maintenance to work? Uh, we had our schoolway cafe. We had our, our uh, um, bus drivers. We, had, we considered them as essential workers. So I think we need to have a conversation about who is essential workers. And I really would like for that to happen at your level, Dr. Bagelman, with you and your um, cabinet, so that in the event anything should happen, even a hurricane, who are we going to consider essential workers? I'm sure there will be some pay and compensation tied to that, but what would that look like and who are they? Because 
I, I just was honest, there's no reason why we're having this conversation in July about the cleanliness of our schools. So they will be here next Tuesday. Um, and that is it for me. And thank you all Madam for Chair, bearing with me for 20. Yes, go right I just, ahead. I just want to be very, very clear with something that I said. And, and as of right now, school is set to open on August 31st. What I said was I'd like to revisit it as a board. You know, you, we can't make a decision in June for what what COVID is going to do in, as we start school. So as of right now, there is no change, and we are pre preparing for contingency, and we'll have that discussion a little bit further on. But as of right now, there is no change to the school year, correct? As far as, what you know, August starting yes, August 31st, yes, August 31st correct? Yes, August 31st, right. Okay, so just wanted to put that out there. I think it's worth having the discussion a little bit closer to the date. Uh, should you know the numbers trend higher, we don't know. So uh, that's just a, just wanted to make that as a point of clearance. So are you saying rather than the eleventh? No, maybe. The, I like the eleventh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Because the eleventh, you, you know, COVID works in fourteen days, and okay. so by the eleventh, we will know whether or not. We have trended which way and uh, can revisit the decision. However, school will, as of right now, school is beginning on August 31st, whichever way you choose to go to school. Right. If that changes, That's it can change. Heck, we can have a hurricane in a couple of weeks. <laughs> Just yeah, saying. Yeah. So. That, 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 that's a whole nother issue and you're absolutely correct. Uh, we see one that's actually kind of heading our way already. So, um, Go ahead, Ms. Haynes. Thank you, Mrs. Wright. So I want, you don't know how much I appreciate the fact that you now went and also had a meeting with ABM. So thank you for meeting with them today and asking them those tough questions. I am glad that they're going to come and we're going to have a frank and honest discussion with them because I will say this, my schools are still not clean because um, I am keeping track of that. And so I appreciate that. I also appreciate the fact that you have asked Dr. Balgobin to look at who is essential. I was one of the voices in the spring that I was not pleased with how we had a lot of people sitting at home. And so I'm going on record with this. I felt in the spring it was perfectly safe for facilities and maintenance because they didn't have to be together to go out and do work on our campuses, but the decision was made that that would not happen. I also think that our inspectors that are in-house should have been out at that time following up and inspecting what ABM was doing and maybe we would be further along and we would have cleaner schools and that's been my frustration all, all along and I did share that with Dr. Fritz prior to him um, going out and Mr. Aiken has heard from me regularly about that so I appreciate you stepping up also and meeting with them. And I look forward to having a conversation about this because our school should be clean by now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other comments, colleagues? We're all good. Um, Dr. Bagabin, anything you would like to add? I just want to say. <laughs> she has to do star six, everybody. Thank you, Mark, for another. <laughs> We don't hear you. We don't hear you. <laughs> can, can you all hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members, for another great meeting tonight. It is, it is, it's not 1.30, I will say that, so we've done better than last week. Um, I do want to share quickly, Mr. Colon, uh, with you that I re received a text from Ms. Ro Rose Rowland, who already has committee set up to discuss just processes um, for that that will be uniform and utilized in our schools and I will be sharing that with each of you before we bring to the board so that you you're aware okay but those meetings have already been set up thank you thank you okay mr. Doran um, any comments from you no but thank you for asking thank you for everything you're welcome Mr. Hen Mr. Henley, anything uh, based on what we discussed or anything you'd like to add? Mr. Penley? I am here. I'm trying to operate my camera. I've taken my jacket <laughs> off. Oh, that's okay. You don't have to put back on your camera. 
No, nothing further from me. Good night. Be careful going home. Yeah. All righty. Thank you. Good night, colleagues. Have a good one. We'll see each other on next Thursday. I mean, next Tuesday, the 4th. Bye. Bye. Bye.